The Grand Army of the Republic had the actual all-terrain armored transport. What's up, meta-nerds? This video is all about the HAVW A6 Juggernaut, aka the Clone Turbo Tank. We will do a complete breakdown using things like the cross-sections and a tour of this vehicle via Battlefront 2, as well as get into its history going from its time with the Republic, up through the Empire, and see how rebels and primitive tribes found ways to overcome this thing. And we'll close out with some behind-the-scenes facts, but let's start with the history. It was produced by Kuat Drive Yards, the same company that would create the Venators and Imperial Star Destroyers, as well as all the walkers we know, being produced either directly at the KDY Orbital Shipyards, or through their subsidiary, Rathana Heavy Engineering. What the Republic paid for these was never declassified, but it is estimated to have cost around 350,000 credits. The cost of most other walkers is unknown, but that would be about four and a half times the cost of the AAT, which is just a really great deal. Though we don't see them in the very beginning of the Clone Wars, they were definitely deployed by 21 BBY. Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Ahsoka were leading an assault on Felucia when their forces were overwhelmed. Ahsoka, perhaps drunk off the awesomeness of riding atop a juggernaut into battle, refuses to retreat and almost has to be physically pulled off the battlefront. As they escape via LAAT gunship, she looks down and watches her HAV-6 explode. There's some debate as to what exactly caused this vehicle to blow, since it wasn't hit by any explosives, no tanks, or even wrist rockets. It's stated that the plates that cover this vehicle are, quote, thermally superconducting armor that absorbs energy beams and spreads heat harmlessly over a wide area. With hundreds, if not thousands of droids firing on the Juggernaut at the same time, no matter how you spread it, it'll no longer be just a harmless amount of heat. The interior may have been cooking, and may have set off some of the Tabana gas and or rocket stores that are located in this section, causing the cockpit to pop right off. Or the simple solution is that it was just scuttled, intentionally destroyed by the crew so that it wouldn't fall into the enemy's hands. But this whole evacuation happens very fast, so I don't know if there would have been enough time to set charges. Maybe it would have been as simple as throwing a grenade into the rocket pack on the way out, or that the Juggernauts all have a pre-programmed self-destruct command that could have been easily issued as they fled. I really feel like the way it was shot was supposed to demonstrate an overwhelming amount of small arms fire, but definitely let me know what you think down in the comments below. For me, the idea that on some battlefront there could have been hundreds of clones inside being cooked to death, if there was enough droids blasting it, is both interesting and terrifying. The following year would see another use of Juggernauts on Felucia, again being accompanied by ATTEs and Ahsoka. Then in the final year of the Clone Wars, they would be seen at the Republic Center for Military Operations. It's unclear if they are moving to a location for deployment, or to be serviced, or just on patrol so that the crew can get some hours behind the controls. And it is important to note that throughout the war, it is claimed that the CIS was stealing shipments of Juggernauts that left the KDY orbital facility but we can find no visual confirmation of a CIS juggernaut in use, so whether they were just kept to study weaknesses, or just a rumor, is unknown. But the most notable use would be during the Battle of Kashyyyk. Here there would be at least nine juggernauts deployed, and seemingly from just a single Venator. Their offensive abilities proved quite impressive, though really they could have just literally rolled over the invading CIS forces. So since this is the perfect place to take a closer look, let's head down to the sandy beaches of Kachiro with our cross-section in hand to see where everything was and how it all worked. We gotta start off with a relatively mundane aspect, cargo and fuel. You see, the Juggernaut was capable of hauling tons of supplies, or munitions, food, water, and Bacta for other clones and allies. It is unclear if this behemoth runs in a form of liquid gas, electricity, or just the same Tabana gas used for its laser cannons, but whatever it needs, it is pumped in through these hoses that draw from the Venator. Venators have one of the most versatile hangar sections in all of galactic history, so it could carry fuel for both starfighters and land vehicles, depending on the mission. The overall size was part of how it got its name, at a height of 30.4 meters or 100 feet, if you measure to the top of the observation post. That would be nearly one and a half times the height of the AT-AT, but just the main body was about a Wookiee shorter. At 49.4 meters or 162 feet long, it was two and a half times the length of the AT-AT, or about five and a half AATs. The width is 19.6 meters or 64 feet, which is about three Wookiees wider than the ATT. And just to show you how ridiculous this vehicle is, let's do a comparison for just the wheels. Each was about 7.6 meters or 25 feet tall, making it taller than a snail tank and nearly twice the height of the AAT. It was also about half as wide as the AAT, so it could easily run those things over. Now if the Juggernaut ever landed here on Earth, the lookout would be about as tall as a 10-story building, it would be wider than 5 lanes of traffic, and longer than 3.5 school buses. 
but still nothing on the Bagger 923, which was more than three times as tall, and more than four times the length of the Juggernaut. This of course is an awesome size, but even better, it serves some very practical functions. It could carry up to 300 troops, while having enough provisions on board for 20 days, along with fuel for 30,000 kilometers. For reference, the diameter of Earth and Kashyyyk is only around 12,000 kilometers. It could also carry 30 tons of cargo, which is some of the crates that we see all around, and which is a weight equal to 37 dubaks. Now as we look around this interior, we can see that there are way less than 300 seats, meaning those were most likely reserved for higher ranking clones, and there would have been a lot of clones stuffed into these open areas. There are 8 gunners for the multiple weapons which we'll look at in a minute, and 12 pilots. That's a lot, but it's because there are two separate pilot crews, each located in a separate cockpit. You see, there is no true front of the clone turbo tank. Each cockpit has full control over the vehicle, and the drive and gears are built such that it is just as fast and maneuverable no matter which direction you're going in. That being said, let's be real folks, this is the main cockpit. It has the lights, forward-facing weaponry, and both lookout points view in this direction. Sorry clones in the back, nice trying to make up for your smaller cockpit. Now this one that we have to tour had its cockpit blown apart, but we can see how it would have looked, with the pilot up front here, followed by the navigator, and then a gunner. Commanding officers and Jedi could climb up into this opening to get a better view of the battlefront, while this spotter would be way up here. This was of course the most exposed position, leaving you vulnerable to all sorts of droid sniper fire, but it was considered worth the extra intel gained. He would get into position via these hatches on the roof, and these rungs would retract, allowing the telescopic pole to retract as well. This is a heavy laser cannon turret, followed by a rapid repeating heavy laser cannon over here. Each can rotate 360 degrees and be fired from inside of the Juggernaut, with a cool detail being that the gunner station displays a 3D holographic representation of the battlefront to each gunner. Up here is the communication dish and scanner, important for both acquiring hostiles nearby, but even picking up various encoded transmissions that might indicate an ambush being set up, or even a nearby previously undetected CIS base. I do want to point out that perhaps these openings work like weapon hardpoints, allowing different things to be fitted into these slots, because with different juggernauts we do see different weaponry on the roof. Like with Ahsoka's escapades on Felucia, there was this heavy blaster turret with a clone trooper dangerously exposed instead of the gun that we see on Kashyyyk and in this cross section. But there is even more firepower. A medium anti-personnel laser cannon extends out of the side here, with this tube in the center being its targeting sensor. And then there's this retractable munitions box on each side that can fire rockets or grenades. These boxes are not rockets, but instead headlights, which not only project visible light, but also wavelengths like infrared in order to provide additional data to the navigator. But this sort of jaw would open up to reveal twin anti-personnel blaster cannons. Now what most likely destroyed the cockpit of these juggernauts was either the ridiculously powerful cannons of the MTT, one of which we can see right here, concentrated fire from AATs, or some precision bombing from hyenas. Why I don't think this is snails or spiders is because this scarring on the sides is said to be the worst that they can do to a juggernaut. Now the guns, armor, and tech is usually the most badass part, but we gotta show some love for the amazing engineering that gets this thing moving. First off, let's actually appreciate how high off the ground this thing is, allowing troops to easily walk underneath, acting as protection from enemy air support and mortars. The drive shaft is said to run almost the full length of the undercarriage, with these enormous cylinders housing the steering pinions. Remember, it can drive the same forward or backwards, with steering taken over at either end. And each of the wheels is connected via its own independent suspension. Shock absorbers and the fact that it is 10 independent wheels rolling over the surface allows for the smoothest ride possible. And the wheels being so wide helps for a couple reasons. One is just that the incredible weight of the Juggernaut is now spread over the width of 10 points, instead of something like the ATST or ATAT, which have all of their weight bearing down on a few small points. This made it less prone to sinking into soft or muddy terrain, though it should be noted that it was often paired up with ATTEs that could use its wench to free a stuck turbo tank. Sometimes it would get high centered by rolling over a rock that lifted the wheels off the ground, but the ATTE was strong enough to pull it free with its wench. That being said, it was a beast on nearly all terrain, due to the fact that each wheel was actually comprised of three independent spinning segments. Then look at all the grooves on these sections, and you can see that really they were controlling 30 independently spinning wheels, with the same power forward and reverse, allowing them to tear up any terrain they wanted. And it also must be one of the most difficult vehicles to learn to pilot. 
On top of that, the clone turbo tank was no misnomer, as its top speed was 160 km per hour, or 99 miles per hour, meaning this enormous machine tore across the battlefront at nearly three times the speed of the AAT and ATTE. Both its speed and power were on great display during the Battle of Kashyyyk, where it helped the Republic and Wookiees secure a victory over the CIS invaders. And unlike many Republic creations, it was not decommissioned or destroyed by the Empire. In fact, there was even a successor made, called the HCVW A9 Turbo Tank, that was used to transport prisoners around the Wobani labor camp, where we saw Jen Erso get rescued. Many of the A6s left over went to Outer Rim Worlds, where they encountered opposition by rebels and primitive native populations. Ahakista had a segment of the population that was set on keeping Imperials off their world, and to stop the Juggernauts, they came up with the idea of Zone Runners. This was an incredibly dangerous role, where they would run right up to the tank and throw a high explosive satchel right onto the pinion. This wasn't enough to destroy the whole beast, but it would prevent or greatly hinder the Juggernauts' ability to steer. Then on the planet Meridun, we see how the primitive Amani species were able to best the HAV-6. The Imperials had backed up against a cliffside to set up a base, knowing that the Amani can launch attacks from the dense jungles and tall grass. But the natives scaled the mountain and rained down on top of the lookout tower, killing the trooper and presumably throwing explosives inside of the tank via the hatches on the roof. With the press of a button, they detonated the charges, causing a chain reaction that blew apart the juggernaut from the inside. Overwhelmed and forced into the grass, Amani swarmed up the sides of the beast and fired into the cockpit with stolen Imperial blasters. A true display of how tactics and creativity can beat any machinery. Later, they would be used during the Imperial attack on Hoth, and even after the Empire fell, they would be used as late as 13 ABY by Imperial remnant forces like the Restored Empire. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. There was a predecessor called the A5, which was based on concept art for Episode 5. The expanded universe used this in some books and comics, but it was only about half the size of the Juggernaut that we eventually saw in Episode 3 so that one got called the A6. Apparently, the A5 had some terrible maintenance issues, combined with even worse service by the Republic and Empire. An excerpt from the log of an Imperial machinist on Dathomir reads, Day 17. Forward drive shaft on Juggernaut 11 has snapped. Requesting replacement drive shaft. Day 22. Resubmitting request for replacement drive shaft. Day 38. Drive shaft still has not arrived. Please advise. Day 50. Awaiting drive shaft. Day 123, awaiting drive shaft. And then Imperial turned rebel Crix Madine said that this was true for the A6 Juggernaut as well. Now there's a really funny reason for the name Clone Turbo Tank. This is so Hasbro could produce toys of this thing, but the problem was that Toy Biz owned the rights to make a toy called a Juggernaut, secured for making the Marvel character. This is so silly because it's not even a rival character, just a vehicle, and Juggernaut is a word, not just an X-Men character's name. But alas, that's why we got Clone Turbo Tank. Hasbro would later get this Marvel character's name's rights, but they kept their new name for the toy, and you see it on different stuff like the LEGO iterations as well. Now there are a ton of references and appearances of this thing, with that cross-section coming from the Episode 3 cross-sections, and it's also in the complete cross-sections. So here are the sources split into canon and legends, but most important of all, Remember, the Juggernaut and ATTE are the only true all-terrain armored transports, and the Force will be with you, always. Open fire. <laughs>What's up, Meta Nerds? This will be a complete breakdown of the Armored Assault Tank, looking under the armor to see how it all worked, seeing how it evolved over the course of the Clone Wars, as both droids and clone forces learn the strengths and weaknesses of it, how it outlived the CIS, and end on some behind-the-scenes facts, pulling from all these different resources. The story of this tank starts with the Nymoidians and Trade Federation. If you want a full detailed history stretching back to the Old Republic and seeing how all the political machinations worked, check out the Nymoidian Species video. But to summarize, the Republic wanted to expand and incorporate the entire galaxy, but the ones that actually ventured into these dangerous areas were the merchants and traders. They needed to defend themselves, and the arm race between traders and pirates resulted in the Trade Federation having the largest standing army in the galaxy by the late Republic era. Factoid Armor Workshops, led by Watt Tambor and under the parent company of the Techno Union, which itself was a member of the Trade Federation, would produce most of the military equipment for what would later become the CIS. Everything from the E5 blasters produced by the hundreds of millions to the B1 and B2 droids themselves, as well as their vehicles from the STAP to MTT and AAT, as well as the larger droids that look like vehicles and ships like the OG-9 and Vulture. 
The most dangerous areas of the galaxy were in the Maiden Outer Rim, and secretly Newt Gunray knew that his mysterious Lord Darth Sidious was planning to drag the galaxy into war, and they would use the legitimate threat of pirates and marauders to legally build this military. To defend their on-world factories and worker cities, the AAT, MTT, PAC, and STAP all quickly went from design to rolling out of the factories in a matter of months. At a length of 9.75 meters, a width of 8.1 meters, and a height of 4.32 meters, it was about a Jawa longer than the TX-130 Sabre tank, and more than twice as wide and tall. Its most obvious weak stat is how slow it is. This is a tank intended to be supported by swarms of CIS units in the form of clankers on the ground and hive mind droid fighters and bombers overhead. But at 55 km per hour, it is anywhere from 4 to 6 times slower than the Sabre tank. And even the ATTE has a whole 5 km per hour on its top speed. But this was nearly twice the speed of the MTT, which it was designed to escort into battle and the several inches thick Durasteel armor meant it could take direct hits by high energy laser cannons and explosive rounds, while being immune to small arms fire. If you look close, it is reinforced in key areas. It looks to be about a foot thick right near the cannon on the turret, while the front works like a plow to smash through any obstacles it might come across. From labor striking protesters on some outer rim world, to the thick forest foliage of Kashyyyk, being several feet thick and curving to form what they call the nose ram. While well, this entire section is rated to take direct rocket launcher strikes. Starting at the very top are the control command receiver antennas, which keep the tank commander in touch with the Nymoidians up in the Lucre Hulk, or later with their battlefield general, be they organic or T-series droid. The top hatch splits open in two halves, and the tank commander would sit in this low and rather comfy looking seat, using a viewfinder packed full of ballistic and environmental data, displayed in this red coloring with a red colored reticle. This digital camera targeting system is the only way they could see around them, so a rather simple solution is that the commander would simply stand up and calculate targeting data with their droid eyes. And it's the same idea behind this front hatch. So the actual AAT pilot, distinguished by the blue coloring, could stick their head out to navigate the battlefront. Obviously this is less than ideal, but it's good planning ahead to take both advantage of the digital displays so that they are not exposed, but still having this easy to use emergency backup. The other two droids are the left and right gunners, with this crew entering via this main hatchway that would drop down. And just in case the main gunner was sniped while raw viewing, one of these gunners could climb up from inside this space without having to exit and expose themselves to fire. And hopefully close that hatch before some clones sunk a three-pointer with a thermal detonator. The primary laser cannon pivots on this elevator, and the distance to the target is calculated with these rangefinders that are on each of the secondary laser arm cannons while general battlefront sensors surround the turret in the form of these rounded bulbs that stick out, right above the dedicated motor for rotating the turret itself. This tube section houses a pair of power generators that connect to the four-chambered multi-reactor power plant below, which is towards the bottom of the tank, which did make it susceptible to mines, but really there was no way around it, a mine was going to ruin their day no matter what system they put down there. And that generator energizes everything in the ship, running incredibly hot, so they added this air cooling intake system up front, but with this much heavier solid plate armor, they needed incredibly powerful repulsor systems, both in the form of this forward disc, and about a hundred of these smaller repulsor coils. By shifting the amount of energy to these coil arrays across the rear of this shovel, the AAT can steer left and right, or just blast it forward and back. This section also contains the most unique feature, the six variable launcher tubes. The standard loadout contained 10 of these bunker buster high explosive shells for taking down buildings or natural fortifications. 18 armor-piercing shells for taking on enemy vehicles, and 50 general-purpose high-energy shells, for use from everything from lighter armored targets to enemy infantry, with all three of these munitions passing through this energy cocooning chamber, an advanced tech of this era that we also see in the ATTE, which encases the shell with a layer of high-energy plasma, which both reduced the friction while flying through the air, and acted as a sort of shield-piercing technology, with the idea being that the plasma would be absorbed and burn out an enemy plasma shield, allowing the shell to continue on. If this all wasn't impressive enough, the Separatists had a streamlined logistics system built so that when they fired all their shots, automated systems would quickly remove the entire foot section and attach a fresh, fully loaded bottom half of the AAT, a process that can be done inside of a C9979 landing craft or up in a Lucre Hulk. And for blasting through pirates and later clone troopers, usually the smaller short-range blasters were enough. It also worked as a transport with these handles on the side accommodating six B1s that could hop on and hold on for their 55 km per hour drive into the battlefront. For all this tech, the price tag of 75k is incredible, 10k less than the Sabre tank, and three-fourths the cost of an ATTE. 
And with their first showings in test war games on remote planets, then to fighting off local resistance and pirate groups, the Trade Federation knew these things were ready for war. Remember, this army was completely legal. It's just using it as an invasion force that was a problem. Begin landing your troops. My lord, is that legal? I will make it legal. The column of overwhelming force with hundreds of vehicles and thousands of B-1 battle droids took over Theed and stormed the royal palace in a few hours. Once the Battle of Naboo began, we see the command structure of these larger tank battalions, with a commander overall signaling to the commanders of each individual tank. While this force is impressive, even shooting down the small and quick N-1 Starfighter, there was a major weak spot that seems to be right around the front opening hatch where the armor is at its thinnest, still around 6 inches, but less than what we get up top or on that shovel plow. And since it is connected to smaller blasters, perhaps that opening hatch was a weak point, and if so, it's a pretty big design flaw. As these hits are catastrophic, maybe setting off a chain reaction with the payload, when it takes fire from the flash beater's oversized cannon, and Gungan Boombas. On the plains of Naboo, we see another problem as an overzealous tank commander wants to kill Jar Jar, and he opens the top to expose the crew being perhaps the first of what would become countless exploits of this open-top practice. And a problem specific to these first-generation B1s, since they were slaved to the central computer system, the B1s went out, and the tanks became paperweights. You can actually see them slowly descending as the repulsors disengage. On Christophsis, the AV-7s prove powerful enough to take out the AATs at a great distance, their artillery shells hitting their mark and forcing the tank line to retreat. While later we see that their slow speed was paired with the expanding shield generation, a tactic which nearly won them the day, and surely was used successfully on other battlefronts. Later we see that many commanders were too confident in their ramming ability, Watch this. You were right. Next time listen to orders. From the lack of discipline in the commanders, not understanding the terrain, panicking at the sight of a Jedi and being tricked into firing on each other, one of the first scenes of them being used in the Clone Wars mirrors what Crosshair would say in the months after the war was over. These tanks all have the same weakness. The droids operating them. By the way, what he must have hit to set it all ablaze are the main bolt generator, and then chain reaction into these series of laser charged batteries. These look like shells, but are actually packed full of energy to make a circuit that generates the main laser cannon bolt. In the jungles of Onderon, Ahsoka shares some of the tricks that the Republic had learned over these years, explaining why they need to disable both sections. You have to take out both chambers, otherwise the tank will remain operational. While Rex makes it look easy, showing how to use a simple grenade to remove the threat, or if they use an ion grenade, they could add it to their rebel ranks, which is exactly what they tried doing some nights after this training, and luckily Steela knew how to jumpstart it to get everything back online. When they put it to use, we see how it easily overruns bipedal targets, and it is unclear why there is a charging issue. Fire the gun! The gun is recharging! But it could be due to that complete ion attack shutdown. Maybe the battery array had only built up two shots worth of charge, and was just close to that third. Steela takes advantage of the open top system, sniping out commanders, and since so many of them prefer to view the battlefront with their own optic sensors, it makes me think that the camera screens inside were too limited, and their droid AI found that even with this risk, it must have been better overall to not rely on those screens. Over the course of the war, the AAT would inspire the HAGM, the heavy artillery version that was supposed to combine the power of an AV-7 and AAT. And then there was the defoliator deployment tank variant, which was made to support the defoliator weapon. This was much wider and with more support at the rear in order to accommodate that greater top-heavy weight. This weapon proved excellent against fleshy organics and their terrain filled with all sorts of dense plant life. Great thing about droids for troops is that they could operate in a blazing heat, didn't have to worry about breathing in smoke, and of course the weapon itself deprived the locals of a place to hide and set up ambushes, and was used to destroy the population's food supply if they were resistant to separatist control. Over the course of the war, both sides realized that the ATTE was more powerful and able to adapt to nearly any environment, even capable of vertical ascents of fortress walls and plateaus, and its main gun packed a greater punch than the AAT. Even with the plasma cocooning feature, it is said to be incapable of penetrating deflector shield projectors, while the Republic Walker tank could. And with that weak spot being exploited so often, it ended up being seen much like the droid army. Nothing impressive in of itself, but often effective by the sheer volume of them. Legendary stories of the AAT did not live on long after the war, while there were stories of ATTEs leveling entire mountains, and their insanely creative uses by the clone army. Though during the liberation of Ryloth, they would be used to expertly cut off an ATTE advance, taking out the lead tanks on a narrow mountain pass. 
It was only for the elite training of the ARF troopers and Master Windu's combat brilliance that used the nimble ATRTs to evade tank fire, get in close, and ruthlessly exploit weaknesses they had learned, putting a detonator right on top of that laser charge battery and barraging the power generators on the side. This tank would take part in the near extinction of the Night Sisters, though the locals would overtake one and turn it into a mobile energy bow platform. And AATs were present right up to the final moments of the war, even touching down on Coruscant via the C9979 landing crafts. Even if Yoda did his part in taking out hundreds of them, perhaps even thousands that we just don't see, since each of these landing craft carries 114 of these tanks, tilted back to stack better, moving into position via these conveyor belts, and then descending down the main ramp. Even after the Separatist defeat, they weren't all destroyed, many of them were up-armored by the Empire to take the form of the Imperial Assault Tank. While it isn't confirmed that there's an AAT under there, it just makes sense that the Imps would put this thing to use instead of scrapping thousands of them that were still in perfect condition. And if you look close, everything is in the right spot, even the guns, so I think it's safe to say that they simply built up on the AAT. And the scenario we saw in Desix must have played out on hundreds of worlds across the galaxy, as countless local warlords would have popped up in the uneasy peace following the abrupt ending to the Clone Wars. Some would fight for stability, while others were just thugs and pirates that were eager to get their hands on military-grade tech. These months, and even some years into the Empire, AATs were still slugging it out on every terrain you could imagine, which is a testament to their reliability and or ease at repairing, as even up to 20 years after the droid shutdown and slaughter of the CIS leadership, there were many AATs painted in rebel colors floating across the battlefront. So that's it for the breakdown. As for behind the scenes facts, this function isn't mentioned in any of the source books, but there's this great recoil reduction feature with the barrel, something like a reciprocating recoil system. The AAT was actually thought up for the original rough draft of The Star Wars, and was going to show the Imp's presence on World. And while it was scrapped, when they were finally planning the invasion of Thede for the Phantom Menace, it morphed into the AAC, or Armored Attack Craft, and was going to look like an assault helicopter. In Battlefront, there were going to be AATs in the Imperial Faction as well, and some modders have found this original source code that was abandoned. If you want to read up more on this tank yourself, pick up the Cross Sections book and Essential Guide to Warfare. But most important of all, Remember, it doesn't matter how thick your armor is, if your enemy has plot-based weaponry. And the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video will pull from all material from Canon and Legends to do a complete breakdown of one of the greatest vehicles ever produced in the galaxy far, far away. This is one of the first vehicles to enter production with the purchase of a clone army by its mysterious benefactors, with the Kaminoans using the prestigious and ancient shipwright Kuat Drive Yards to provide all the ships and vehicles. Kuat had been a staple of the Old Republic thousands of years earlier, and with the roughly 10 centuries between the destruction of the Sith, and dissolving of the Republic military via the Rusan Reformations, the shipwright was eager to earn the kind of credits you only see during a galaxy-spanning war. Kuat had many subsidiary companies that each had their own specializations, and Rathana Heavy Engineering would be charged with crafting most of the land vehicles, like the ATTE, SPHA, but also the LAAT and Acclimator, which is the first look at what we'll see were countless brilliant decisions that start all the way at the top with good leadership and project management, not as exciting as weapon engineering, but crucial to making sure that this army would work at such a large scale. By having Rathana build the Acclimator, LAAT, and ATTE, all these designers could work with each other, planning around each other's needs, and had shared supply lines. With the Acclimator having its power systems and crew right down the middle, this main area on the sides are dedicated to the racks and conveyor belt systems full of gunships, and had the tanks packing the nose and lining the perimeter, produced as units to make sure that each Acclimator that left Rathana was fully loaded. And there was a seamless transition, having that insanely fast 0.5 hyperdrive, scrambling across the galaxy, rapidly deploying LAAT infantry and LAAT carrier variants, with the spacefaring and decently fast gunship having enough power to be a flying tank on its own, escorting the LAATC with its ATTE, dropping it off in a matter of seconds with a quick release of the rounded mount on the middle legs, and it hit the ground running. Also keep in mind this holy vehicle trinity were each the main troop transports, with the Acclimator carrying 1600 troops, more than twice the Venator, and the LAAT and ATTE being the respective air and ground ways to move clones around the battlefront. And to go one step further, they could even pack in two ATRTs for scouting ahead or setting up ambushes. 
The official mission directive for this Republic Walker was to act as a multi-purpose assault vehicle, capable of carrying out everything from the movement of clone platoons across any terrain, even when under heavy enemy fire, and also have the firepower to destroy the enemy's position once it arrived. The shape of the walker is based on the Arctic Horny Whelmer, a hardy animal native to the planet Rothana. Like a six-legged armadillo with two separate armored sections and a tough cartilage part in the middle, they had based other vehicles on this in the past, like a very successful old patrol vehicle they made for a mining company, and so the ATTE's design is able to navigate terrain so well because its proportions and body were shaped on a creature that could scale the icy and rocky mountainous terrain, which is why there is this flexible concertina section at the middle of the walker. At a height of 5.7 meters, a length of 13.2 meters, and 5.32 meters across, it was about one-fourth the height of the AT-AT, three Jawas longer than an AAT, and wider than the fattest huts. With its top speed of 60 kilometers per hour, or 37 miles per hour, it was stomping along just faster than its hovering Sepi rival, but the TX-130 was five times as fast. Though the whole point of not using repulsor generators like most craft, and being a mechanically powered walker, it could walk through enemy shields, something impossible for craft utilizing electrogravitic fields to float. The ATTE was also impervious to normal ion attacks due to a robust electromagnetic shielding layered into the armor, and that it was grounded through the feet. Some other important stats before we head under the armor plating is that it had a 40-ton cargo capacity, fuel for 500 kilometers or 310 miles, rations and air supply for three weeks, which meant that it could act as a mobile space fort dropped out on asteroids, moons, or harsh planets. But let's start by looking at the feet, or foot pads. They were packed full of terrain sensors and tractor field generators, a tech usually seen in Star Destroyers in the form of a tractor beam projector used to capture smaller ships. But they scaled this tech down to fit into the foot pad so that each step had the effect of bonding to the surface. This is why it can scale 90 degree sheer cliff walls. And this ability was designed to be able to walk up fortress walls and it's crazy that we don't have an example of this, but it's said it was designed to also provide a unique angle of attack, climbing into massive cave systems or underworlds of ecumenopolises like Coruscant, so that they could hang upside down from the ceiling like a spider and rain down fire from above. Or as Skywalker showed, it could easily climb over enemy capital ships just using a magnetic feature, which was also put into these feet. So you see, Rathana took that directive literally. This thing could go anywhere, being completely sealed off with a pressurized interior, that three week supply of oxygen, which even if you were in a Type 1 atmosphere, it would still help with everything from dust, smoke, fire, and of course be necessary in outer space, when underwater, or in toxic atmospheres. And later in the war against bioweapon attacks, which the CIS did deploy a few times. It required seven specially trained crew members, like pilots and CCs or clone commanders. These specialized tanker clones were trained for this role since birth. The pilot worked the six legs, while the spotter sat above him and worked the sensor suite station to scan through different data displays providing intel on friendly and enemy activity, atmospheric conditions, and different wavelengths of light. The spotter would then relay the info to the four gunners tucked in each corner, with the front two working the pair of anti-personnel laser cannons, while the ones towards the rear worked a single cannon, making for six in total. The final crew member had the best job, but the lowest lifespan, sitting exposed behind the controls of the mass driver cannon up top. He got here via this simple ladder, opening this hatch and slipping in. While there was an effort to provide some armor protection, being enveloped on the sides, back, and even this headrest wrapping around to try and save his head, he would still be exposed to shrapnel and explosives that might not punch through the armor plating, but would easily blow through his plastoid body armor. Each of these sections would hold 10 troops for 20 total, with their blasters standing up on these racks located here. Under the floor is where you find the ammo storage for the main cannon, which the troops had to manually reload onto this ammunition belt to be fed into the cannon. These could be any combination of munitions, from burrowing bunker busters, heat-seeking projectiles, sonic charges, or your standard high-explosive shells. And what would become very common was a sort of plasma bolt generating round that made it work like a standard laser cannon. A shell that helps to think of it more like a magazine, being packed full of a certain number of shots that are activated with each trigger pull, and then ejected when you went through all these shots. This combo allowed it to work like a mobile artillery vehicle, and the targeting system was accurate enough to calculate for these different rounds, and even shoot down slow-moving aircraft or intercept incoming rocket fire. A really unique design feature are the acceleration compensators packed into each of the troop sections. Usually only seen in starfighters, this tech was another form of gravity manipulation like seen in the feet, but in this case it's for reducing the g-forces felt by the troops. This is required in starfighters and capital ships, which could kill a person with their acceleration, the person normally surviving about 5 Gs, while the executor class had a top acceleration of 1000 Gs. The compensators in the walker were likely far less powerful than on a capital ship, but worked as a way of reducing recoil when hit by a massive round, 
or when falling off a surface and smashing into the ground. It's not the role this tech was invented for, but it had the effect of preventing a deadly whipping of the neck or flying out of your seat and being crushed to death by the reduction of that felt acceleration. The canopy cockpit up front opens via this hinge, and the way you get up is that this bar would pivot down to act like a stepladder. These notches are for holding clamps inside of the capital ship hangar. You can see the actuator pistons here. There are four exits, two at the front and two at the rear, for the troops to spill out and not just have one ramp for the enemy to focus all their fire on. And if we look close, we can see the life support air reprocessor here. We also get the comment that clones complained that they did not have specialized armor that was more streamlined and smaller for operating in these tight positions. You'd imagine they were taking that helmet off as soon as they were away from a stuck-up clone commander, but the whole suit was said to be cumbersome and just felt silly to wear your little blaster-proof armor while within one of the best armored vehicles in the galaxy. There were variants with a main loading ramp that could move supplies, ATRTs, or speeders, and some were built out to act as a mobile command center establishing a network with that synergistic trio. The Acclimator being the HQ for the Republic forces, talking to the Forward Command dropped off via LAATC, which in turn coordinated with the mobile command centers inside of various walkers during a large-scale offensive. This trio of Rathana craft were some of the first ships and vehicles ready for use, and they made sure that every iteration from prototypes to the final product were being shipped to Kamino to use in their sprawling training centers which utilized everything from adjustable terrain features, holographic projectors, droid enemies, and weather simulators to prep the clones for any planet in the galaxy. These were large enough to accommodate battalions and multiple armored units, working in conjunction with the UTAT, SPHA, Juggernaut, and various speeders. When the clones say, Just like the simulation. Sometimes they mean the video game style, but also these massive multi-day war games. In 22 BBY, Grandmaster Yoda arrived on Kamino, and ordered the immediate scrambling of a sizable portion of the army that he had only learned about a few days earlier. And though it was their first time seeing real combat, all the pieces were moving with deadly efficiency. Most of the droid units seen during the Battle of Geonosis were completely legal. In fact, they had been used to enforce trade deals, protect Trade Federation assets, or by the moon bankers in seizing property from someone that fell back on their payments, or just taxes. And with all that experience killing poor people and pirates, the banking clan's Hailfire droid was a seasoned vet, and knew how to exploit a weak spot. One of the simplest and effective vehicles in the galaxy, it just connected 30 powerful rockets to a droid brain solely dedicated to seek and destroy, drop it on fast all-terrain wheels, and we see that the first ATTE tank commanders were meeting a shockingly fast and fiery end, with rockets blowing through the legs with so much power that the tanker's underside slammed into the rocky ground, igniting the fuel reserves that line this bottom layer. Everything from the fuel for the engines and all that fancy gravitation tech, not to mention the Tabana gas used to power those six anti-personnel cannons, was all stored in this belly, and then chain reaction explosions would set off the mass driver shells, which were packed under the floorboards. Others showed off that droid brain by having the rockets rain down and hit it on the tweakest part, the flexible connecting middle, or punching right through the ball turret to successfully exploit the line of Tabana gas and energizers that would be in this weapon. Of course, every walker that landed a hit on them was an instant kill, but the slower rate of fire had it looking like the tank battalion would be overwhelmed, until the gunship swooped in and took advantage of the droid's lack of shielding or armor, easily slicing through to cut off the advance. Once the walkers were in position, that terrain was solidly in Republic hands. Coordinating with the Acclimator and those forward stations, they were able to count the first Battle of the Clone Wars as a decisive Republic victory. A celebration of the saviors of the Republic was held in the form of a military parade on Coruscant, a show of strength for both Republic citizens and a threat to shakily allied senators, while only the most attuned masters could sense that this could also be a threat to democracy and the Jedi Order. When Palpatine first laid eyes on this army, of the ATTE walkers specifically, he said, quote, These weapons of war would be awe-inspiring if they were not so terrifying. Almost immediately after this, these walkers would be crucial in the defense of Christophsis. Though again, we see that many were lost. As this battle drew on, the clone Slick would reveal that he had joined forces against his brothers, convinced by Asajj Ventress that the clones were nothing more than slaves fighting for corrupt Coruscanti elites. When he was cornered by Rex and Cody, he fled through the ammo depot and was able to detonate explosives set on several walkers and gunships. On a battlefront where even the slightest advantage could decide the victor, the next days would see even more walkers lost, though clever thinking by the Jedi would force a Separatist surrender, and they were quickly reinforced by more troops and armored units. The assault on Teth would be one of the most stunning uses of these walkers, with the monastery being in a perfect defensive position, anti-aircraft batteries crowning the top of an enormous plateau, so the Republic had to rely on the gravity-locking footpads to make the long 90-degree ascent. 
with Ahsoka Tano using her saber to keep the pilots safe from incoming fire, and making it to the top just in time to save her brazen master. But they needed to immediately switch to defense. After just destroying all the anti-aircraft weaponry to take the monastery, now the Seppis were descending with multiple C-9979 landing craft, intent on making this ancient holy site their grave. As the B-1s and spiders start to make it into the main courtyard, we see the mass driver cannon firing rapidly like a laser cannon. Not as powerful as shells, but this higher rate was why that variable munition option was so great. And we see that while the front canopy windows are immune to small arms fire, the heavy blaster cannon of the dwarf spider explodes through and kills these two clones. After faking a surrender to buy them some time and drop the droid's defenses, Rex and his boys are able to hold them off by hiding beneath this down behemoth, until Cody's forces are able to come to their rescue. Sometime after this, droid units starting calling these six legs and sixes. It might not be eight-legged, but instead of dreaming of electric sheep, these B1s were having nightmares of six-leggers as horror stories were shared between battalions. Which is a really interesting insight into the droids' minds, in that even though they weren't organics, there was still some element of psychological warfare. The next major use was during the Battle of Ryloth, where we again see some very smart tactics from the Separatists. Mace Windu and the 91st Mobile Recon Corps were leading an armored division through a narrow canyon pass on their way to liberate the capital city of Lesu. AATs waited to open fire until all the walkers were far along the path, and then took down the lead walker, bringing them to a halt, and then worked to close the rear. Now order our cannon to target their rear units. We'll box them in and blast them to pieces. Mace ordered his recon troops to deploy the ATRTs, then used his powers in the force to break the canopy glass and free the unconscious pilot. He was probably very glad he was wearing his full armor that day, before calling deep on the force to push the massive walker out of the path and free up the rest of his units. Expert use of frog walkers outmaneuvered the AATs and cleared the way for the tanks to push towards the capital city, where Watt Tambor and his tactical droid were examining the weaknesses of this infamous Sixer that would soon be shelling their defenses. With the help of local resistance fighter Cham Syndulla, the 91st boys approached the city to make sure it was free of droids and provide rations for the Twi'leks, only to witness the latest of CIS war crimes, as hyenas slaughtered the civilians before they could even think of joining Syndulla's resistance. By now, stories had spread of ATTE battalions leveling whole mountains to get to the target, so the T-Series calculated that their best option was to use the captive Twi'leks as living shields, putting their encampments all around the walls. The combined 91st and local forces launched their attacks as MTTs were returning to the capital, hoping to cross the energy bridge in time, only for the droids to show how willing they were to sacrifice each other. Oh well, too bad for them. But the two troops and Mace were able to reactivate the bridge, and the RTs and Blurgs storm over and fight their way into the city, with Mace taking Wat Tambor hostage. And when the walkers were finally within the walls, all could celebrate this hard-fought win, with the ATTEs playing a part in the victory parade. Though we do not see this, there are several reports of how this walker was susceptible to mines. He got six legs to step on a mine, each walking pretty close to the other, and it wasn't that far off the ground. So worse than losing the foot, the mines usually penetrated that belly full of fuel, with similar effects to what we saw with the Hellfire missiles. The ATHE was an evolutionary link between the Republic and Imperial walkers, having longer legs than the TE, but not as long as the ATAT. -AT. For whatever reason, there are no images of this vehicle, but I believe this has to do with the fact that Kua and Rathana had some insider intel. A certain embodiment of the dark side may have told them to focus on building a towering fortress and to not worry about the next iteration of wartime tank. Because it is said that they began work on the AT-80 -AT before the AT-HE was even finished. After Cad Bane captured the Holocron and Kyber Crystal required to locate all known Force-sensitive children, Anakin would deploy these walkers in another novel way. You are not thinking of using those to transport the clones to that frigate. Well, they are pressurized. And they're equipped with magnetic feet. Mmm, good call. As the walkers were released, they gently floated down to make contact, and we see that they are using the rapid-fire laser charges during this rescue mission of Master Opal, not wanting to blow up the ship with explosive shells. These walkers would go down with the enemy ship, but the mission was mostly a success. Kaidi Mundi and Kenobi would lead one of the largest defensives of the entire war, during the Second Battle of Geonosis. Once we have landed, we shall knock out the shield generator. That is our primary target. Y-Wing bombers would first try to take out the gun emplacements near the LZ, but Geonosian cannons were still operational and firing away on the LA-80s racing through the flak, along with growing numbers of Nantech starfighters. Get the tanks on the ground, now! Mundi's forces were shot down short of the LZ, and Kenobi's were shot down as well but Crash landed a bit closer, while Skywalker was in position, but lost all of his ATTEs. 
Skywalker's tanks are gone, and they're trying to contact General Kenobi's forces for support. Falling back on one of the oldest and most successful tactics, they circled the wagons, or walkers and gunships, to create an impromptu armored base to try and hold off the bugs swarming with sonic blasters, speeders, and AATs, while also trying to coordinate with Ularan and Atmosphere to locate the downed generals. As the clones fought through the chaos, they find the only survivor of this 212th group were Kenobi and a single clone. Muda used his saber to cut through some of the anti-tank barricades and made it near Skywalker's position, as the lead Venator was now being strafed by the Nantex fighters. Skywalker was able to bring down that defensive wall blocking their path to the shield generator, and the flame troopers were clearing out the tunnels. From this vantage point, Kai could see that the LZ was about to be overwhelmed, and was able to call on air support just in time. By now, most of the walkers had been disabled, but Kenobi believed there was still enough to pull off the victory. You'll be able to temporarily jam their scanners so they are unable to target the incoming tanks. Once the tanks knock out the shield, Master Mundi can bring the rest of the troops in with the gunships. It's one of the best examples of that genius decision by Rathana to make a tank without repulsor tech. The ATTEs were able to walk through the shields and open fire on the generator with their high explosive shells and the gunships perfectly coordinated to swoop in just as the protective plasma layer fell apart. The next target was the main droid and weapons factory. Luminara and Dooley's forces were coming in with fresh gunships, tanks, and hundreds of troops. As they pushed through, it was looking like an easy victory, but the first bad sign was the ambush launch from the tall rocky spires. And while the tanks were encircling the fortress and defending the clones from enemy infantry, for the role of actually punching through the thick fortress walls, that task went to a row of AV-7 cannons. But then a new model of Bactoid tank emerged through the thick plate doors. The simply named Super Tank would unleash a barrage of mortar fire that was unrelenting for several minutes, easily destroying the unarmored cannons, and just through accuracy by volume, were able to land devastating hits on the weak spots of the ATTs. While the armor of the Super Tank was impenetrable to even the mass driver cannon, Having no weak spots on any forward-facing section, perhaps only near the launchers themselves, which is why we see it has an armored hood that only peels back when firing. Ahsoka and Barriss Afi use this weapon to hit the main generator and bring down the entire factory, surviving by being inside of this indestructible new tank. In Felucia, we got to see the walker being used in the role of long-range artillery, and quickly switching into an armored troop carrier role to take a CIS fortress. And after years as a beloved workhorse of the Jedi Generals, its most famous use would be to try and kill Kenobi. When Cody executed Order 66 and immediately moved to kill the traitorous general. <laughs> Though it wasn't a high explosive shell, it also wasn't one of those smaller anti-personnel laser firing shells either. This equivalent of a heavy laser cannon bolt may have been subtly guided by the Force, as Obi-Wan would just barely make it out alive. As soon as the Republic became the Empire, these walkers near instantly went from a symbol of proud fighters of democracy to symbols of oppression. Walkers all across the galaxy were moved to protect political centers, and used as an implied threat of force against the citizens. And when they deemed that the protest became a riot, those six anti-personnel cannons would open fire. Or like we see on Raxus Secundus, the Coruscant of the CIS had millions of citizens that were not instantly kneeling to their new Emperor, including their leader. I can no longer condone this unjust occupation. As the people started to resist the clones, the ATTE stepped in to help squash any thoughts of rebellion. And notice that all the Republic coloring is grayed out, both on the troopers and the vehicles. When Bad Batch rescued Senator Avi Singh, they had to get past Walker patrols, and as they escape, they commandeer one, exploiting their intimate knowledge of this vehicle to take out the entire crew, record chucking them out of the forward side hatch. The Imperial clone gunners were able to load a heavy plasma charge and angle the gun to sink a shot that disabled the rear legs, forcing Bad Batch to jack another one, only for a third walker to land a second shot. With tech's repairs, they were able to get the damaged walker operational, spewing thick black smoke and leaking oil as it dragged itself to a spot designated by the Senator. When the enemy walker caught up, a shot to the midsection scrapped it, but using the wreckage and a thermal charge, they were able to collapse their escape tunnel entrance and lose the Imperial clones. Some Imperial variants would open up the sides of the rear section, keeping a protective front, but then allowing the troops to open fire from this raised platform as they moved into the rebellious populations. All this made it able to engage threats on the side, of course this opened it up to grenades, while others had a flat top for moving large amounts of cargo. Over the following months, these engineering marvels were being scrapped, along with all the other remnants of the Clone Wars on the junk world Bracca, sharing a mass grave with their enemy, as everything from Venators to Lucra Hulks ended up here. 
15 years later, by 4BBY, Ahsoka wanted the Spectres to reach out to old allies hiding out on the planet Silos. And Kanan, an Order 66 survivor, is teleported back to his youth when he sees the allies' mobile home. Now that is a work of art. Looks like an old Republic tank. Used during the Clone Wars. When they approach, the man who saw clones kill his master is quick to ignite his blade, triggering Wolf to take some shots. But Rex gets Wolf and Gregor to calm down while Ezra reminds Kanan that Ahsoka told them to trust these allies. When they get inside, we see that it looks like a mobile command variant of Walker, and or perhaps a variant that had the top flattened for cargo, with the clones adding parts back like the main gun and other repairs. There are tons of accents to make it feel like home, from wind chimes to lights, and practical mods to make it a multi-story home with balcony handrails, with balcony handrails to dry your clothes and towels, and a flat seating area that doubles as a landing pad. Here the walker was used to hunt the massive jupas, and either just due to age or the mods, it is pumping out black smoke with each shaky step. It looks like some legs were replaced, and the front step-down ladder on the canopy now works as a lookout spot for the hunts. They connect Zeb to an energy line that acts as a harpoon, and with some teamwork they do bring in the beast. But before the Spectres can leave with Rex's coordinates for potential rebel bases, the betrayal by Wolf brought the imps to this remote world. Wolf didn't want his brothers dragged into the rebel conspiracy, and got ahead of any accusations by contacting the nearest officials. Though he apologized and regretted it, the Empire was already on the way. The first tie got shot down by a rocket launcher, and in the lull before the next wave, Rex gives the new generation a lesson on the mass driver cannon. The Travis controls are over here on the left, and the elevations on the right. But it isn't long before they spot a trio of AATs closing in on them. Facing off against their Imperial replacements, Rex has to admit he is impressed with this new behemoth. Reinforced armor plating, heavy cannons, and anti-personnel blasters. Mm. Turning to race into the sandstorm, they are able to take advantage of the Jedi's powers to sense the enemy when all other sensor systems were down. By trusting the Force, Ezra puts a perfect shot into the AAT's weakness, the flexible neck. When they emerge from the sandstorm, the clones help the Spectres get off in their ship, but they know that the old heroes have no chance against the two walkers. While the clones were deciding to go out in a bang, full steam ahead, eating powerful bolts that drop it, only to rise up again, spewing smoke and slamming into the legs of the Goliath, while trying to fire at the second. But as you can see, the energy shots are harmlessly dispersing across the surface. And as the ATAT -AT seems immovable, the mass driver cannon loses power. Rex screams at the imps to come out and fight him, before accepting that he will be disintegrated by these turrets. He closes his eyes as the Spectres return to blast into the enemy, dropping down to hijacked one and use it to open fire on the other, providing a shocking defeat for the Imperial forces that would lead to Vader's Inquisitors getting personally involved. In the views of some military strategists, the AT-AT -AT overcorrected for the worry of mines. It wasn't as stable, but did hit the main objective of everything Imperial at this time. It struck fear into the population. You drop one of these down and it acted like an instant castle, towering over a city and able to rain death from above like some angry god. As the Rebel Alliance was formally organized and the Galactic Civil War was raging on, this discarded masterpiece was being rebuilt by mechanics all across the stars, impressed into the fight to restore the Republic. At least one fell into the hands of a Weequay gang, who placed it at the Sreeler spaceport to extort payments from visiting spacers which resulted in it having its back legs blown off thanks to a concussion missile fired by Chewbacca. Months after the Battle of Endor, in 5 ABY, the New Republic was pitted against these during the Battle of Kuat Driveyards. Perhaps the most logistically important battle of the entire war, the Imperial Remnant threw everything they had into the defense of the largest supplier of Republic and Imperial ships and vehicles. In the shipyards that made up the massive orbital ring, AT-ATs and AT-TEs crawled along the surface to try and shoot down NR forces. Though this final battle with the Walker was the loss, it would be forever loved and respected by factions all across the galaxy. That's it for the breakdown, and as for behind the scenes facts, one of the longest running standoffs on vehicle lore concerns that mass driver cannon. A lot of the early cross-section books were just worked on from images of ships and vehicles, without actually seeing them in action, and a lot of what happens on screen was for plot and cool special effect purposes, and the lore comes second. Movies and later shows were king, and though the walker always looks like it's just firing a laser cannon, the whole idea of it being a mass driver firing a physical shell has never faded away. It was re-established in every Legends and even now the new canon books, though it's finally addressed on why it looks like a laser by vaguely saying that it could load shells that fired plasma bolts, which is what I meant by saying it kind of works like a magazine. Many of the same stop-motion animators for the AT-ATs in Empire Strike Back were brought in to work with a CGI team in Attack of the Clones to try and capture the same feel of the movement. 
but there was also a deliberate choice to make them not seem invincible. Like, each side of the Clone Wars was devastatingly powerful, and it would not just be an easy win for the good guys. Which is why we see them blown up so quickly upon their first deployment on Geonosis. In the Battlefront games, they act as mobile spawn points, and in Battlegrounds, they can be built in mech factories. All the technical info comes from the Attack of the Clones Visual Dictionary, Complete Cross-Sections, Imperial Handbook, Encyclopedia of Starfighters and Other Vehicles, and Rise of the Separatists. But most important of all, remember, no armor can stop plot-based projectiles. And the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is all about the missile-spamming monster that is the IG-227 Hailfire Class Droid Tank. Like the OG-9 homing spider droid, the Hailfire was used to collect debt years before the Clone Wars broke out. Many financial commentators have pointed out that there are some startling similarities between the Hut Cartels and the Intergalactic Banking Clan. While some lenders might go through the planetary or republic court systems, the Huts and the Munes are willing to make much riskier loans. Added risk comes along with higher rates, but desperate criminals and spacers are willing to take these loans, knowing the exceptionally high returns on piracy and spice running could more than make up for it. The only problem is these people aren't exactly going to dress up for a day in court. Their dressing up will be in body armor and bandoliers, shooting at any debt collectors that come by. Hots would resort to bounty hunters and assassins, but the Munes use loopholes to legally deploy these hoop drive tanks, as the IBC sent droids with rockets to collect from delinquent borrowers. Because the bank would often loan to prospecting settlers of remote worlds, there were times when hailfires were used to repossess entire planets. Whether outright destroying a city, or just scaring off the borrowers and acting as a sentry, the IG-227 had a great rate of return. Millions of credits and loans could be retrieved with a small 60,000 credit investment, the same price as a TIE Fighter, and less than the OG-9. But unlike the spider duo that were made by Bactoid, the Hailfire was produced by the techno-religious Zychar bugs of Howard Charles Engineering. They were able to keep the cost down by using a simple but effective magpul system on each of the hoops. Called a hoop drive, it would alternate between positive and negative charge differentials in the magpulse unit, causing the wheel to spin towards the rear or forward so that it could accelerate or reverse. This gave it near instant acceleration, and the treads on these things allowed it to overcome almost any terrain. Much like the OG-9, it did not have a complicated AI. It isn't like the HMP that can just be told to hunt and eliminate an enemy. Behind this red photoreceptor eye, there are an array of sensors that receive direct input from the commander. You tell it where to go, then its processors were able to avoid obstacles and engage previously identified enemies. Sometimes this created a flaw where it wouldn't prioritize targets, opening up on troops before vehicles. But if this ever happened, the commander had an easy way to override it, telling it to eliminate ATTEs first, for example. And a single Hellfire can wreck the battlefield with its 30 missile payload, 15 in each box. It also had small twin-mounted blasters for dealing with some lightly armored troops, but this was the only thing it had to protect itself while it made its way back to the hangar or to the base in order to resupply. Later in the war, Hao Chao developed a resupply drone that could fly out to meet the Hailfire and get it set up to roll with a fresh 30. With this supply line, they were able to make it appear like the Hailfire never ran out of ammunition. Paired up with the OG-9, the Spiders would prioritize troops, and the Hailfire would rain down rockets on vehicles. By firing a cluster of 3 or 4 rockets at a time, they were able to pick LAATs out of the sky, though of course these gunships were the bane of its existence. Other things like the height were deliberately chosen so that they could fire over CIS assets, just like the homing spider. Other cool features are that you could use these wheels to run over ranks of clone troopers, and that these weapon attachments were modular, meaning that it could be swapped out for heavy artillery, ion cannons, and anti-personnel stun weapons. I assume that they would use these stun weapons when they weren't that angry with debtors, and later when they didn't want terrible PR when taking over worlds for the CIS. It would also work great as a clone catcher. During its debut in the Battle of Geonosis, 4,100 of these Hailfires were present. In this first battle, they proved to be such a powerful enemy that the Grand Army of the Republic developed Bantha Squad as an anti-Hailfire Special Forces unit. The Hailfire could be seen in conflicts all across the galaxy, and even fighting against the Republic's first generation of at, -AT. Many had a similar fate to the at, -AT -E. Even after the droid decommission at the end of the Clone Wars, some were out there still slinging rockets. During the subjugation of Kashyyyk, the Wookiees used repurposed Hailfires to fight off the Empire. 
This must have been an insanely abrupt shift in thinking, as the droids became their only way to fight off the clone troopers, who had just been their allies a few weeks before. And this is actually one of the CIS droids that was able to be salvaged by the Alliance to Restore the Republic, deploying them against the Empire on various worlds from one ABY on. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. The stat for the top speed is only 45 kilometers per hour, or 28 miles per hour, but that just doesn't make sense to me. That means you'd be honked at for being too slow in a residential neighborhood, and that really doesn't match what we see on screen. There were tons of visual ways that Lucas wanted to signify that the CIS were the bad guys, and even the color of smoke was used to help the viewer realize this, as the LA-80s rockets would leave these clean white smoke trails, whereas the Hailfire's rockets were all erratic and raspy, leaving smoggy black trails. And this vehicle was inspired by a mix of two Russian vehicles, the big-wheeled Russian Tsar tank, and the rocket packs on the Katruska. But it also draws on things like a 16th century Korean rocket launcher system called the Hwakcha. Additional information was gained by the canon guide Star Wars Encyclopedia of Starships and Other Vehicles, Legends Guide The New Essential Guide to Vehicles and Vessels, The New Essential Chronology, The Essential Guide to Warfare, and Ultimate Star Wars while also appearing in the game Star Wars Commander. But most important of all, remember, just pay your debts, and the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, Meta-Nerds? This breakdown will have us looking under the exoshell armor to see how everything worked, its history, and end with behind-the-scenes facts pulling from all these different resources to fully understand the TX-130 Saber Tank. While the Separatist AAT was battle-hardened for more than a decade before the Battle of Geonosis, the TX-130 would not hit the battlefront until some months after the war. Manufactured by Rathana Heavy Engineering, the subsidiary of Kuat Drive Yards, that created everything from the Acclimator to ATTE and would later produce the Onager class Star Destroyer and TX-225 tank. While the ATTE was performing even better than expected, the generals realized that this only operated in a heavy tank role, and there was a need for a fast response and attack armor that would still be deadly against tanks and softer targets, but giving up the ability to punch through deflector shields, fortress walls, or level entire mountains in exchange for speed hitting a top speed of 320 km per hour, is part of why it was dubbed the Jedi Starfighter of the Ground, as this was nearly six times faster than its main enemy, the AAT, and its brother, the ATTE, definitely meeting the design requirements. But that is its boost speed, which admittedly only lasts a few seconds, great for avoiding attacks or closing a gap in an ambush, but even its cruising speed of 193 km per hour is nearly four times the other tanks, with a small profile at a length of 8.2 meters, height of 2.3 meters, and a width of 3.05 meters, making it about half the length of the ATTE, as well as half its height, and 60% the width. And while it's true that mass production of this tank wasn't ready at the start of the war like the LAATs or other Republic ships and vehicles, there were prototypes made intended to be fielded when the war eventually kicked off and to be piloted by Jedi to get real-world feedback on the tank design. These are the TX-130s used by Mace Windu and Ada Sakura during the first Battle of Geonosis, being delivered to the surface via LAATC, or carriers, and they were able to put its power and speed to brilliant use. These prototypes will go on to see heavy use during the next series of battles to Renvar, to Raxus Prime, and then on to Thule and Seleucami. With the high praise of the Jedi and elite clone forces, Rathana went into overdrive to get these saber tanks onto battlefronts all across the galaxy. So let's look at the official schematic to see how it all worked. Getting the saddest part out of the way first, the clone gunner up top is, quote, usually the lowest ranking trooper because he is exposed to the most hazardous battle conditions. A coldness that sounds like something Grievous would say about his droids, but safely behind the armor was the tank pilot slash commander, which was a Jedi at first and then later high ranking clone specialists. He is surrounded by panels that provide all sorts of battlefront terrain data, locations of allied troops and mission objectives, and targeting data for each of the weapons, with a radar system located right below that medium laser cannon, and a pair of comm and telemetry antennas that all bring data to the main computer CPU located under this nose armor, with a series of backup CPUs lining this section. The cockpit is accessed via this quick release door towards the rear, like we see in the AAT. And also like its droid army rival, it utilizes a series of batteries put into a big series and wrapped around a coil to create a powerful charge for the laser cannons, with a motor to raise and lower the guns to hit ground targets and even shoot down some enemy transports. These are heavy rated laser cannons, and are so strong that they slapped a muzzle suppressor on it and have gas-powered dampening systems to counteract the recoil force when those lasers are fired. There are six fuel cells that are mounted in a heavily armored fuel bay underneath its main hull. 
providing it with an operational range of 400 kilometers before needing to refuel, either at a base or to be whisked away by an LAATC up into an acclimator or venator. The way that it lifts off the ground and floats is via the massive repulsor field generator, with the exchange conduit injecting raw fuel into the repulsor lifts at high pressure to provide that turbocharged boost. While the standard repulsor lift units are here, and the magna coils that amplify everything are all throughout this base, requiring Rathana to develop new heat sinks for all their repulsor and boosting tech. All this power and speed meant that these systems created more heat than Mustafar down there, but specially sheathed heat sinks cool the engine and help radiate heat away. Luckily, the advanced armor system is strong but relatively lightweight. By laminating high tensile strength materials in a prototype carbon strand weave pattern, nearly every inch of this tank is covered in this carbon laminate process, with this entire front section being double laminated. The AAT simply added thick sections of solid durasteel, which mostly did the job and fit their style of being easy to produce for their simple ships and vehicles, but the Sabre tank only cost 10k more at 85,000 credits. And it includes a deflector shield generator, called the Phase 3 Exoshell Deflector Shield Generator System. It was the first one to be installed in a ground vehicle. The AAT cannot penetrate this shield, but the only catch is that these shield generator power cells up front aren't large enough to leave this shielding permanently on, like we might see in a capital ship. So when the shield was recharging, it had to rely on the reactive armor, shedding off layers of this carbon laminate with each blow. But most clones were confident in its offensive capabilities, being able to take out enemy tanks with its variable munition launchers, one on each side for a total of 16 to 20 concussion missiles on board, which could also be filled with cluster thermal detonator bombs or other explosive ordnance, all packed into these sections, which are hard to get a direct hit on if it's facing the enemy. This sloped, double-armored section up front would either deflect or eat the incoming blast. In fact, no crucial weapon or energy system is up front in these sections, unlike the AAT, which we saw had devastating failures, perhaps due to the weakness of that front hatch and those side blaster cannons. Some other cool features are that the repulsor engine lock lets it turn on a dime like a tank with treads, but this feature isn't used that often. These stabilizer wings are something you'd normally only see in starfighters, and really add to that nickname, the Jedi Starfighter of the Ground. There are these towing fixtures up front, which show that this vehicle could be used in a support role to free allies from difficult terrain, but also on the offensive for pulling down walls or clearing out obstacles. And this gunner turret is not standard on all of them. They seem to be retired from the middle to later parts of the war, perhaps seeing how many clones were dying up there, and some would replace this whole section with an astromech socket. These versions were as close to a starfighter as you could get. And since everything inside could be done with a single pilot, the R2 unit just helped with calculating the best routes on the battlefield, slicing into enemy comms, and adding in targeting data by finding weaknesses in an enemy position or vehicle. And this last point is a bit of speculation over this single line saying, interchangeable engines, which reminded me of how the AAT reloads its rockets and gets fresh armor up front by detaching this entire foot section. So since most of the fuel and power systems are on this bottom layer, I could see the Sabre tank being modular too, with this whole bottom part separating at a Republic base. Refueling the missiles on the side would be easy and modular either way, but I'd imagine the heat and complex prototype power systems would be finicky. I think it's plausible that this whole section could be removed. There was also the S variant that had upgraded targeting systems and allowed it to use its heavy guns and missiles at a much greater distance, acting like a sniping tank or artillery. While the T was larger, able to carry 5 troops inside and 100 kilograms of cargo, with larger fuel tanks and meant to work in a scout role. These were only fielded in the final year of the Clone Wars, 19 BBY, on the battlefronts across Megiddo, Kashyyyk, Naboo, and Yavin 4. All the Jedi were known to use this like a Delta 7, calling on their force abilities to pull out an even greater agility and maneuvers, and it was loved by clone troopers and Republic allies, but for how great it was, the Sabre tank was relatively short-lived. All production stopped as soon as the Empire declared this new era of peace. But at least they didn't scrap them all. Many lived on until they had maintenance problems, and its descendants would live on for decades. Specifically, the TX-130Ts would live on the longest into this Imperial era, used famously during the Battle of New Plimto, where Order 66 survivors were hunted down and the local resistance population was systematically executed. The Nasorians were able to hold off even the Empire's mighty new AT-AT walker, hiding out in steep jungle cliffsides, where the battle finally got bogged down, and it looked like it might be a powerful morale victory for the burgeoning resistance movement until the TX-130Ts arrived. Their smaller size and great speed were able to pursue the rebels into the terrain that was inaccessible to the walkers. And the tank's firepower, armor, and shields meant it could easily take everything the Nasorians threw at them. And with the tank's five trooper capacity, one the tanks finally couldn't pursue, each could release a squad of still battle-hardened Imperial clone troopers. 
After a month of brutal fighting, the tanks would force a surrender, and what was intended to be a morale boost for rebels across the galaxy was turned into a threat and example by Emperor Palpatine, with the 501st executing all the surrendering survivors, and anyone else found alive across the planet were summarily turned into slaves and sent off to Orvax 4. Though the rebels would capture some during the Battle of Turek 4, and then over the course of the Galactic Civil War, there was always a handful of them that fell into the hands of Rebel Alliance and other resistance movements. They never seemed to be used in any major Rebel victories, perhaps due to the complex nature of the tank making it difficult to operate and the high level of maintenance. Or they were taken out by one of its many successors. Or even the up-armored Imperial Assault Tank, which is what the Empire did with all the AATs left from the Separatist side. The 2M Saber Repulsor Tank was the most similar, with no qualitative difference from arms to armor. It even kept a shield. And with this one, we do get explicit complaints about it breaking down all the time. This model branched off to the Scout Class 2M, which was shortened overall and made more like a heavy speeder than a tank. But this open top and apparently was used on some icy worlds with snowtroopers. The Imperial Repulsor Tank 1H would be produced by Abrikian Industries and was cheaper at 50k, but had a similar speed and impressive armament. There were high hopes for this tank, and 80 of them were given to the Imperial Hammer's Elite Armor Unit, aka Hell's Hammer. But all of the rest of them ever produced, 1,420 of the 1,500 made in total, were assigned to patrol the first Death Star. A funny idea not explored too often is that there were enormous sections of this moon-sized battle station that had entire tank battalions for defense, and all of them were destroyed that fateful day. With this loss, the S1 Firehawk was produced, and all of these went to that same group, Hell's Hammer. And this tank could hit an insane 400 km per hour top speed, but there isn't much else known about it. But this last addition, also primarily to Hell's Hammer, was the TX-225. The GAVR was for Repulsor, and the GAVW was for Wheeled Treads, but each had a drastically reduced speed down to just 72 km per hour. It lost that heavy laser cannon and missiles, but in this time of fighting rebels, not the CIS military, the twin medium cannons were almost always powerful enough. And an interesting detail is that the armor is still using that composite laminate method, but now they're working in depleted duranium, which is stronger than the durasteel used in most ships and vehicles, and is what was used in Grievous's cybernetic skeleton. It was incredibly hard to work, but laying it out in flat strips and panels did make the TX-225 armor even greater than the 130. The ones deployed the Jetta were part of the notorious Hammer's Elite Armor Unit. While a thermal detonator takes out the treads, later it is this one chucked underneath that finally sets it all off with the 225 likely having many crucial systems down below like in the Saber Tank. And all throughout this Rebel era, each of these variants would fall into enemy hands, often painted with red Rebel colors, as well as the countless opportunists in the form of criminals and mercenary groups that looted the battlefront for the latest military weaponry. So that's it for the breakdown, and as for behind-the-scenes facts, its first appearance was in the Clone Wars video game, with this cross-section being in the instruction booklet that came in the game case. It's so sad that we lose stuff like this with modern gaming. A lot of the other info came from the Star Wars Legion game with their fighter tank unit expansion, and the Clone Wars campaign guide for tabletop RPG, and of course its depiction in Battlefront. Well, it even gets a mention in the novelization of Revenge of the Sith. But most important of all, remember, if you aren't shown on screen in the movies, you're probably one of the cooler aspects of Star Wars lore. And the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, Meta Nerds? Today we'll be taking a deep dive into one of the most intimidating droids to march into battle, the Octoptara Combat Droid, as well as the variants of similar names. We'll break down the differences between these machines, how versatile they were for the Separatists, and of course, some interesting behind the scenes facts to wrap things up. Designed and manufactured by the Skakoans of the Techno Union, and named after the living creature, the Octoptara, back on their world of Skako. The Techno Union Army. <laughs> Count. This droid had two main variants that we need to address before moving forward with the breakdown. The standard size is known as the Combat Tri Droid, and the larger size, like the ones we see on Megiddo and Christophsis, are called the Magna Tri Droid. So to preempt any confusion, I'll address each of these droids by their combat or Magna distinction when going over their stats and history. With that out of the way, let's take a closer look at the Tri Droid, starting with the Combat variant. Standing at a height of 3.6 meters, or 11 feet 10 inches, the combat tri-droid was still a rather imposing foe to face, backing up the B1s and B2s. It's about a foot taller than your standard school bus, and just under the height of two clone troopers, who stand at an even 6 foot. However, it isn't made clear if this is the default height when its legs are in a crouched position, as seen in these images, or if that is the tallest it could get. 
Based on the brief scenes from the movie though, I'd wager my last credit that it's the former, with the combat tri-droid actually being capable of a slightly greater stature. This terrifying tripod was classified as a fourth degree droid, meaning it was built for military and security purposes, as opposed to say a certain R2 unit, who wasn't purely bred for battle, he just took a liking to it. The combat tri-droids had red sensors and were armed with three laser cannons, but there was yet another variant that added even more of a threat than these massive turrets. The ever cruel Skakoans filled the head of this droid with a plague virus during the Battle of Uba 4, which would be released into the air upon the droid's destruction, giving these horrors the nickname of the Virus Droid. During the Battle of Coruscant, we see these droids with another ordnance variation, not firing blaster bolts, but instead a single deadly beam, similar to that of Bactoid's homing spider droid. After firing any of these weapons, and this applies to the larger variant as well, the droid's bulbous cranium would rotate, allowing for a new forward-facing gun to unleash a volley at whatever poor soldiers were in this beast's warpath. This made the tri-droid very difficult to fight, as it had no true front or back, and all sides were defended at all times. We don't have any further information on this droid's speed, weight, or cost, all still corporate secrets of the Techno Union. What we do know, however, is that the smaller combat tri-droid was the first of many models they built, with the larger Magna tri-droid following soon after. Sadly, that's about it for the little brother, so let's look to the towering Magna in all its spindly glory. The Octoptara Magna tri-droid was a behemoth, standing at a height of 14.59 meters, or 49 feet. That's 4 feet taller than the letters on the Hollywood sign, if it came here to liberate Earth. Although this model was the second of the two, from its use in the Clone Wars, it appears to be the more popular variant. Maybe it was the imposing size that sold the Seps on its 100,000 credit price tag, which is the cost of 2.5 Vulture droids, or one-third the cost of an ATTE, while having a top speed of 50 kilometers per hour, or 31 miles per hour about 10 kilometers per hour slower than the Republic's main walker. But the Magna can do something the ATTE never dreamed of. When it comes to firepower, it not only has the standard, albeit larger, laser cannon turrets, it can also be fitted with deadly, heavy ordnance launchers. One missile was enough to not only destroy a UTAT, but flip it over into the air several meters before the massive, heavy tank came crashing down. And it hurts to think what that kind of concussive force would do to a poor shiny who just transferred to the outer rim. The ammunition was stored in the head of the walker, with a total of 48 shells to dish out destruction. In theory, 48 major pieces of armor could be destroyed by a single magnet tri-droid all for just 100,000 credits. Even though these three cannons were its only pure weapons, its size could also be used for attack. With massive claws on the ends of its long legs, and the sheer weight of the machine at work, allowed the magna to stomp and crush through enemies as well. This size did have its downsides though, for if small groups of well-trained infantry could get close enough, the walker did not have any sort of defense against this kind of attack. This weakness is demonstrated a few times by a certain chosen one in his Elite 501st, so it was best to use these massive mechs in tandem with other tanks and infantry to support it. But what if all is lost, armor is destroyed, and all of your battle droid support is cut to scrap by those pesky Jedi? Fear not, because the Magnetri droid has a few surprises left in it. First, and it is safe to assume the smaller model could do this as well, the droid could use its claws to climb sheer walls, like we see on Christophsis. Presumably it could do this to cliffs as well, or really just about any surface, making it a viable option for dramatic escapes or even very creative attacks, stomping all over everything from subterranean bases to spaceports and floating cities like Bespin. But if climbing isn't your style, don't worry, the Skakoans have a plan B, as seen on yet another potential variant of the Tridroid. As we see during the daring escape of Echo on Skako Minor, the Techno Union implemented a new design for their famed Tridroid, that being a massive thruster that could propel this terror into the sky and fly in and out of combat. As if the Magna Tridroid wasn't scary enough, apparently they fly now. They fly now! <laughs> he forgot, he forgot. But what if that it, was the first time they used them? They're not using them since the Clone Wars. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. A self-propelled, computer-automated, mobile artillery unit capable of destroying heavy Republic tanks in a single shot, now soaring through the air. All I can say is luckily the Clone Wars was rigged, because the CIS had some very disturbing toys. With the stats and variants done, let's talk history. Like I said, the smaller combat droid was one of the first out of the factory, followed by the larger Magna. It isn't exactly known when in the timeline this variant came out, just that it was implemented into battle by Warm Loathsome in 22 BBY just months after the Battle of Geonosis. It was during the Battle of Christophsis that we see both the pros and cons of this walker, with it being able to deal out incredible amounts of damage on the battlefront, but is very susceptible to attacks from the more creative forces of the Republic. Here's where we saw the climbing abilities of this droid, 
with Asajj Ventress attempting to escape from the Jedi using a hidden tri-droid that was clung to the side of the building. This would not work in her favor as she got caught monologuing instead of making her retreat, and Anakin alongside Obi-Wan leapt onto the stilt-like legs of this machine and cut through them. A major weakness when all of the generals of your enemy's army are wielding these devices that slice through legs like butter. And of course, it sent this titanic droid falling to the ground below. We don't see them pop up again for some time, with the next appearance coming during Anakin and Rex's rescue of the ARC Trooper Echo from the clutches of Wat Tambor and Skakor Minor. This flying variant is painted in crisp Techno Union colors and soaring along D1 aerial battle droids, which were the perfect complement, something that really would have helped out on Christophsis. But along with Clone Force 99, he was still able to take it down just like before. Although the clones and Jedi escape, we don't see another variant of the Tri-Droid until the very end of the Clone War, though that doesn't mean they weren't used across the galaxy. We see these droids swarming the streets of Coruscant during the abduction of the Senate, these being the smaller combat ones, which are also seen taking on the 212th during the Battle of Utapau. The large Magna Tri-Droid is seen one last time during Order 66 on Megiddo, flipping that hover tank, right before Bakara and his marines got the call that took down Master Mundi. Following the rise of the Empire and the slaughter of the Separatist Council at the hands of Lord Vader, almost all Tri-Droids, Magna and Combat alike, were deactivated and scrapped. I say almost, because the Legends has it that many remained active on Uba 4, as planetary security. No further use of this droid was documented, as with many of the CIS war machines. Being controlled by a droid brain as opposed to a pilot, oftentimes made it more trouble than it was worth for the Alliance to restore them, if they could find any at all. And clearly Palpatine wanted to go in a different direction. An undignified end to such a cool piece of tech. That closes the holocron on the Octoptara Tri-Droid, but let's look at some behind the scenes facts. Its first appearance was in Chapter 23 of the original Clone Wars show, and then of course in Revenge of the Sith, the Clone Wars, as well as some books and games like Republic Heroes. LEGO included the combat variant in its Utapau battle pack as cannon fodder for the clones, and Hasbro has also gotten in on the action with both the smaller variant and more impressively the large Magna Tri-Droid from the Clone Wars, being a Walmart exclusive at the time. The Octoptara was designed by Ryan Church for Revenge of the Sith, and was one of the few vehicles seen throughout Star Wars media that has a plethora of color variants, at least five seen across different shows and films. If you want more, be sure to check out these resources, but that does it for the Octoptara Tri-Droid. Most important of all, remember, if you start smelling that spicy air of a cracked Octoptara, tell your Batch brothers you love them, and the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, Meta Nerds? Today we're going to be taking a look at a criminally underexplored vehicle within both Star Wars Legends and Canon, the Republic's UT-80. We'll go over what little history we have, the specifications of this strange tank, and take a look behind the scenes to see what kind of details may be hidden in the archives. Let's crack open our holocrons and explore the reason this vehicle came to be. The Unstable Terrain Artillery Transport, also called the Trident, was a vehicle born of necessity was a collaboration between two companies that allowed this vehicle to glide into the battlefront in the midst of the Clone Wars. Our old friends at the famous Kuat Drive Yards decided to work in tandem with the engineers of the also obscure High Altitude Entry Transport 221, the fine engineers over at Mikun Corporations. Mikun was known more so for its work with repulsor technology, and with Kuat coming to the realization that its all-terrain line of combat vehicles wasn't quite living up to its name, it was time to work in a new design. One that would incorporate many of the classic Kuat features, but also integrate a series of repulsor lift skis to enable this thing to safely cross precarious terrain, like the bridges of Megiddo and Agamar. It was the disastrous Battle of Agamar, in fact, that allowed the UTAT to get up and running. As the Republic launched its attack on the world, known as the Mirgoshir Campaign, they found that the usually dependable ATTE was a poor choice given this world was abundant with natural land bridges. These heavy, plodding walkers stomped onto these paths with such force that it often led these bridges to give way and collapse under the weight resulting in a devastating loss of both equipment and, more crucially, the clones' lives. A Pyrrhic victory if there ever was one. And so with a lesson learned, the UTAT hovered off that assembly line and was pressed into combat. Mainly seeing its action towards the end of the Clone Wars, the UTAT was heavily used during Kaidi Mundi's Siege of Megiddo, a key Separatist world in the Outer Rim. We can see several of these craft being used to go gun to gun with the massive Octoptara, with the droid armies bombarding the front line. While we do see one damaged by a well-placed rocket, similar to the Hailfire downing the ATTE at the very beginning of the war on Geonosis, it's safe to assume these floating battle barges were getting results, as we do see Mundi and Bakara pushing forward against the droid army. 
We also know that these highly specialized death sleds were being put to work on the bridge-heavy world of Kato Nymordia, perhaps being led by Plo's bros in the Wolfpack before Order 66 went down. Aside from the wreckage of this vehicle being seen on scrap worlds after the rise of the Empire, that is all of the history the UTAT has written so far, as we barely see it in either canon or legends, despite it supposedly being introduced in 22 BBY. That either goes to show just how incredibly specific the circumstances needed to be for the Trident to be seen in battle, or out of universe, the producers of the Clone Wars didn't see much need to incorporate such an obscure vehicle into the Republic's army. Like the ATAP, it's another shame. So since that's it for its short history, let's break down the specs of this thing. It actually has quite a bit of interesting features, unique to its role within the Grand Army. With a length of 23.8 meters, or just a bit over 78 feet, the UTAT was actually longer than its cousin, the ATTE, and about 13 Minox long. And if it came floating into combat on our Earth battlefields, it would be comparable to the size of 2.5 M1 Abrams tanks. We don't actually have a height measurement, shockingly, but just from what we see in the movies and from pictures, it's safe to say that it was around an ATTE, not including the legs, and so much taller than the Senate. Maintaining the mystery of this strange behemoth is its cost, as we also never do find out how many credits this baby would cost the Republic. What we do have is its speed. Clocking in at 45 kilometers per hour, or just under 28 miles per hour, it's safe to say that the UTAT wasn't blazing into battle. But that, however, wasn't its purpose, as you'll see when we look at these prongs that gave the Trident its name. These being the three massive forward facing cannons. The main cannon of the UTAT was an artillery turbo laser, perfect for taking on massive droid walkers or thinning out swarms of CIS infantry. Flanking this great gun are two medium laser cannons, and while they may not look as deadly as the main turret, they certainly shouldn't be underestimated. These cannons could easily overpower opposing tanks, such as the AAT. And speaking of the armored assault tank, the configuration of the Trident's cannons do bear a striking resemblance to the droid's tank, and I'd wager some inspiration was taken on Kuat's part. Is that legal? I will make it legal. If they weren't liquidated, I'm sure Bactoid might have been suing Kuat. But it doesn't end there for the UTAT, as once again it shares a feature with its quadrupedal cousin, but this time doubles it, having four anti infantry guns to guard the rear. The UTAT was more than capable of surviving a flank attack from some daring droids. Despite having six cannons, it only needed five gunners, with the single pilot manning the final turret. Its cockpit also shares the design with the ATTE, although slightly more angled, and all this firepower made it a more mobile and self-sufficient artillery option for the GAR. Unlike the exposed and vulnerable AV-7 cannon, those still block from going through shields unlike the AT-AP. As the war trudged on and battles waged for months, these vehicles would be forced into frontline combat like we see on Megiddo before Master Moody meets his end. Exposed, close to the enemy, and completely undefended from the powerful Tri-Droids. And while it's impressive, the UTAT wasn't perfect by any means. Its repulsor skis made it easier to glide over impossible terrain, but did open up a crucial weak point. If a rocket or mine was able to get underneath this piece and do damage to the 16 skis, well... And taking a closer look at those skis, we can see that they are in two rows on the belly of the tank, totally canceling out its weight and allowing it to glide, made up of a series of repulsors. Which, interesting side note, there's actually anti-repulsor technology in the ATTE's feet. Instead of repelling gravity, it allows it to sort of stick to any surface. These 16 repulsing skis were very useful not only on unstable bridges, but also on snow or even water. These were low power repulsor lifts though, thus explaining its quite sad max speed. And this also made maneuvering the tank a tedious process. One can only imagine how miserable this thing would be to parallel park. And luckily, the skis were blaster proof, so no sneaky commando droid could take down a UTAT with measly blaster rifle fire. It is a proper tank, and you had to use explosives, being equipped with heavy armor, bridge deploying materials for creating its own path, and even bomblet generators. This tech allowed this monster to unleash a hail of ion charged misery against all opposing clankers, instantly rendering them inert. Not bad if the seps ever get too close, and you don't even have to worry about hurting your own men. Just some high pitch ringing in their comms. Scanning equipment was stored below the cockpit, and although this vehicle was not a designated troop carrier by design, it could haul 20 clone troopers into battle, along with a whopping 26 tons of cargo, which could include Jabba and 16 of his closest family members. So that's it for the breakdown, hopefully we can help this thing be a little less obscure. Let's look at some cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. 
The UTAT made its debut in Revenge of the Sith back in 2005 during the infamous Order 66 scene. Aside from that lone appearance, it was only seen as scrap in some versions of the Force Unleashed. Not even every version, and is mentioned in the Tarkin novel. It is apparently seen in cutscenes from 2005's Battlefront 2, but I couldn't find it. Let me know if you guys did. Almost all of the information on the UTAT comes from an old StarWars.com feature, What's the Story? In this feature, Billy Bueller and the Dark Moose supply us with the specs and name. Moose even suggests a different name, opting for the ATCS or All Terrain Combat Sled, but this never caught on. The information these two provided ended up in the Visual Dictionary and Complete Star Wars Encyclopedia, etching Billy and Moose into Star Wars history. Unlike almost everything that has ever existed in the history of Star Wars, the UTAT has no representation in the merchandise lineup. The rights for all the merchandising, all the action figures, all the toys. And then when that movie exploded, the toy sales, well that's where the money really was. No Hasbro toys, no Legos, no sick t-shirts, nothing outside of its place on trading cards and of course the visual dictionary. But the mighty trident didn't even get a spot in the iconic cross sections books. To make sure you understand this point, Star Wars has made toys on characters and vehicles not even seen on screen. I'm looking at you, Constable Zuvio, and your supposed 7 seconds of screen time. So the UTAT's omission is somewhat surprising. The UTAT never appeared in the Clone Wars, making it, along with the ATAP, as some of the few iconic Republic vehicles that don't make the jump to animation. So that closes the hollow file on the UTAT. But most important of all, remember. If you want to go sledding in the galaxy far, far away, make sure you take this war toboggan, and the Force will be with you, always. Ouch time. Trade disputes can be resolved through diplomacy, debate, or an army. What's up, meta nerds? Today we're going to be taking a tour of the multi troop transport, otherwise known as the MTT. We'll explore the role it played for both the Trade Federation and the CIS, delve into its cross-section, and even that time, the MTT seemingly took flight. Designed and manufactured by Bactoid Armor Workshops, the MTT was used at first by the Nymoidian-led Trade Federation. There is very little to no information about their deployment before the famous Battle of Naboo, and so before we talk history, let's take an in-depth look at the specifications of this behemoth. The multi-troop transport is quite a humble name for such a monster of a machine. With a length of 35.6 meters, or approximately 117 feet long, it was longer than 19 steamrolled Gungans, but still considerably shorter than the Republic's A6 Juggernaut. And at 10.54 meters, or almost 35 feet tall, the MTT was a Yoda higher than two Fambas. Cargo-wise, it's estimated that the MTT could haul 12 tons. That's enough to haul 112 OOM battle droids, including their blasters, and still have enough energy to add three and a half dobacks. If one of these beasts showed up here on Earth, it would be as long as 14 smart cars, taller than 4 M1 Abrams tanks, and would have enough hauling power to transport 879 bars of gold. At a sluggish 35 kilometers per hour, or only 22 miles per hour, the MTT isn't going to be winning any pod races. The speed makes it very vulnerable to attacks, which is why we always see it escorted with AATs, STAPs, and battle droids, or holding back towards the rear of the battlefront have an Earth comparison just so you know how truly sluggish this thing is, the record for the fastest human sprint is 28 miles per hour. But then again, Usain Bolt wasn't carrying 12 tons of nasally death. Roger, roger. The MTT was only armed with two twin blaster cannons, mounted on a rotatable ball turret on the front of the vehicle. While extremely powerful and accurate, having even been said to shoot down starfighters, the placement of these guns made the transport dangerously vulnerable from any angle besides the front. And while we're on the subject, that front of the MTT is heavily armored, and not just to protect its portable pop-up army. It could also use its rounded face as a battering ram, knocking its way through walls and trees, like we saw it doing as the Trade Federation droid army was clearing a path through the dense Naboo forest. Maybe Ventress should have brought a few of these to Ragosa. There's even more going on inside of the MTT, which we can see thanks to one incredible cross-section. Starting up at the top, we see that the MTT is piloted by a battle droid, while another serves as the gunner, something similar to what we see in the AAT. These vehicles were usually on pre-programmed paths set up by the droid control ship, but the pilot could deviate from these orders when necessary. Since the model we're looking at is the original, as we move down we can get a closer look at this vehicle's most infamous feature, the droid Rax. Factoid Armor Workshop, who also made the B1s, really took advantage of designing this thing with droids in mind, as I can't really see any other army being able to take advantage of this system. 
The droids were folded into the fetal position, loaded up into four smaller racks, and stowed away safely until duty called. The base model of MTT could carry up to 112 standard OOM battle droids, and we'll discuss the variants in just a sec. We can see here that the rack is also operated by two OOM battle droids, an overseer and an operator. The entire forward interior, as expected, is dominated by the MTT's main feature, and so the other essentials of this transport were housed in the back. We can see the power generating cooling systems, not to mention the many vents and fins that would make sure the MTT doesn't overheat. Interestingly, the main power generators are said to be provided by Kuat Drive Yards, who became known throughout the galaxy for their Republic warships. I guess when both sides are secretly run by the Sith, it doesn't really matter where the credits come from. But if you want some more information on that, we actually covered this in an old video, explaining how Kuat Drive Yards would have ended up in the CIS, but how Palpatine's machinations made them a vehement supporter of the Republic. Now that we've covered the original, let's quickly run down the variations. As war broke out, the methodical deployment of battle droids became increasingly obsolete. To counter this, some MTTs were outfitted with new racks to drop B-1 battle droids onto the field already standing upright. While this did fix the issue with the speed of deployment, it did limit how many droids could be brought to the battlefront. This design seemed to be considered an improvement, as we see MTTs throughout the Clone Wars being used to quickly drop off super battle droids, of which it could only carry 12 at a time. We see them doing just that during the Battle of Dathomir, littering this red jungle world with dozens of clankers. This version, as well as others used by the CIS, were given a paint job to better match the blue and gray look of the Confederacy. Another time to see the MTT variant was during Wat Tambor's occupation of Ryloth, where this sleazy Skakoan used two of these transports to haul treasure back to his palace. While we never see the full interior of these models, it could be assumed that the droid racks were removed, giving Tambor even more cargo space for his riches. New model or not, we do get to see a new feature of the MTT, the cargo hatch, where Mace Windu alongside Razor and Stack were hiding. We see that it has more than enough room for the cargo, and maybe Tambor would have gotten away with it if he put a couple droidicas in there as well. As we see, the cross section also says how it was great for transporting destroyer droids. The history of the MTT is pretty straightforward, having almost nothing before its appearance on the plains of Naboo. The Trade Federation deployed at least 12, which combined could deploy 1,452 droids. Flanked by AATs and STAPs, the MTTs stayed out of the line of fire as the army that they brought to bear had seemingly won the day. That was until a certain chosen one interfered, shutting down the entire droid army. After their debut, we see the MTTs being used throughout the Clone Wars as previously mentioned. But Bactoid also continued to innovate new transports for the CIS. These included the MUT and Trade Federation Troop Transport, think flying MTT, but ultimately the multi-troop transport remained the go-to vehicle for most of the war. Other notable times that we see the MTT in use was during the Battle of Kashyyyk, and even the Battle of Coruscant. When unable to use the MTT to deploy troops, the CIS often made use of the HMP droid gunship, to quickly fly in clankers alongside a devastating barrage of suppressive fire, like we saw in Scipio. The influence of the MTT's design was also seen in one of the deadliest creations ever brought out by Bactoid. The super tank. Like all things Confederacy, the MTT saw the end of its glory days when Darth Vader ended the Clone Wars on Mustafar. While it has been said that the MTT did see later action in the Galactic Civil War, it did not play a notable role in any key battles. Well, that about wraps it up for the MTT, but you definitely want to stick around for these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. It was originally designed to look like a train, but the final look for the MTT took a cue from nature thanks to Doug Chang with its tall facade and chin guns made to resemble an African elephant's skull and tusks. And while not much changed regarding the MTT and its switch from Legends to Canon, it did receive a bit of meddling. It went from 31 meters long in Legends to 35.6 in Canon. Strangely though, it shrunk in height, going from 13 meters tall to just 10.54 meters. Cross-section comes from Star Wars Complete Cross-Sections, and additional information comes from Star Wars Encyclopedia of Starfighters and Other Vehicles, and Ultimate Star Wars. But most important of all, remember that the MTT, an entire army, is just a carry-on. And the Force will be with you. Always. Concentrate all your fire on the nearest starship! When you need the heaviest artillery on the battlefront, look no further than the SPHA. What's up, men and nerds? Today we'll be taking a look at the inventively named self-propelled heavy artillery, otherwise known as the SPHA. Using canon and legend sources, we'll do a deep dive into this massive artillery piece, learning its capabilities, stats, role, and all of its variants. 
The Grand Army of the Republic took to the field of battle with a wider range of weaponry at its disposal, suitable for all targets in any planetary battlefront imaginable. For the heaviest, most well-protected targets, the GAR fielded the Titanic SPHA line of artillery cannons. While each variant mounted a different weapon, all SPHA shared the same chassis. With a length of 140.2 meters and 20.6 meters in height, the bulk of the SPHA resembled a small building more than a combat vehicle. This size was necessary to contain the massive reactor which powered the weapon systems of the walker, while making sure that it was heavily armored, especially in the frontal quarter, as any damage from incoming fire could cause catastrophic meltdowns. They were staffed by a crew of 25, 10 of these being dedicated gunners which were housed in the walker's command deck. This deck was lined with sensors and terminals to allow precise targeting and relaying of data to enemy positions. Each SPHA was a valuable system and a prime target for enemy commanders. Thus, some were armed with 12 anti-personnel blasters mounted around the perimeter of the vehicle, in addition to a security detail of 20 to 30 clone troopers, which would be carried on board as passengers, and which could disembark and spread out to engage threats. An array of 12 heavy dual-jointed legs, each larger than the legs of an ATTE, moved the gigantic vehicle at a surprisingly decent speed of 35 km per hour. And while it is technically a self-propelled walker, it's usually using those legs for a minor repositioning and to bring its armament to bear, with long-distance travel being done in the hold of Republic warships such as the Acclimator, which would typically carry 36 of these walkers. While being far too large to be carried by dropship, repositioning was not usually an issue as the SPHA could probably measure range to target by zip code rather than meters, and they usually operated in teams of four receiving orders from the command bases such as the PX-4, which collated and prioritized calls for fire across the battlefront. These orders would then be relayed to the SPHA commander, which would go into action against the most protected and valuable targets that other weaponry couldn't touch, and they were only used against such important targets since they had a limited number of shots, after which they would be rotated to the rear, neither act as mobile bases holding down already gained territory, or ideally being replaced by freshly charged SPHAs. And now looking to the variants, we'll start with the one we're most familiar with, the SPHA-T. T standing for Turbo Laser. A hundred of these were deployed along with the rest of the clone army at the First Battle of Geonosis, proving devastatingly effective against Separatist core ships. Unlike most turbo laser cannons, the SPHAT fired a solid beam of white-blue energy which behaved more like a laser beam, though which would in fact be a steady stream of plasma. There are similar weaponry in the RX-200 and even the Death Star laser, in that the T's beam was composed of a number of sub-beams which combined together through a curved emitter dish to form a single collimated beam. This massively powerful beam would lance directly into targets, but would require a clear line of sight. While this line of sight requirement theoretically made the vehicle susceptible to return fire, in practice they were situated far behind Republic lines to be out of range for most Separatist weaponry. The unwieldiness of this beam rendered it ineffective not only against aerial craft, but even most tanks and other ground vehicles. But it's not an issue if you use it for its designated role, engaging major targets, and keeping them away from clone forces to batter down enemy installations during siege warfare. If Mace Windu's army on Dantooine had access to these things, they could have kept the seismic tanks of the droid forces at bay. During planetary sieges, SPHATs could wear down the shields of major cities, or even military bases. And while this may take months, in some locations, this was the only option. General Kenobi. Commander Cody. The siege goes well. With our continued barrage, their shields should be down in three months. But we've been here a month already. Yes, sir. We're right on schedule. And while it's not limited by ammunition in the normal sense, it's not firing shells, the enormous amount of power it drew from the reactor meant that it had to be cycled and recharged in continuous combat. But if plugged into the systems of a Venator, for example, they could easily be fitted to use in an anti-capital ship role, something that Anakin Skywalker actually came up with, and what we see to great effect in the Battle of Coruscant. And when the Republic didn't have an orbital blockade, CIS warships could drop into high atmosphere and use their capital-grade weaponry to rain down destruction on Republic forces, an orbital bombardment. When they did this, SPHAT batteries were powerful enough to penetrate even capital ship-grade deflector shields preventing SEP warships from having an easy go at Loyalist forces when they weren't present. It was much easier to leave a few of these behind than an entire fleet in orbit. And this is also what's happening during the First Battle of Geonosis, punching right through the core ship shielding and grounding them with concentrated fire, preventing them from escaping with their payloads of battle droids and more war machines. The SPHA-I for Ion Cannon traded the dorsally mounted turbolaser with a heavy Ion Cannon. And while it lacked the destructive power of its turbolaser cousin, it could more rapidly overwhelm a shield generator, not destroying any targets, but bringing down the enemy's defenses and paving the way for the SPHATs to be even more effective. 
and when paired with ground defense forces to be used against enemy warships, the ion cannon effect could be deadly, disabling thrusters and repulsors, causing the massive capital ships to free fall to the surface. It would have the same effect what we see with the core ships, in that case the repulsors were destroyed, but being ion disabled would have an equally catastrophic effect. The SBHA V, V for anti-vehicle laser, took the mass and power out of the original and turned it against more mobile ground targets. And while no images of it exist, it is said to have the same chassis and specs as all the other variants, including the considerable crew and size. And it's likely that the main armament, the anti-vehicle laser, was located in a rotating mount to enable it to better engage vehicles in any direction. It had to move quicker and fire with more precision, and use far less energy in the beam, still being enough to destroy an AAT or spider droid. Hopefully one day we'll be able to see this beast sniping Seppi armor from across the battlefront with semi-rapid fire. The SPHAC traded out the armament for a concussion missile launcher, which wouldn't have been something you see on a gunship, but at this size it would be a capital ship grade launcher. It has the same bulky chassis, but would not require the immense reactor used to power the laser. And so you can imagine all this space was used for an armored magazine to keep all those concussion missiles continually firing. And since concussion missiles come in sizes ranging from anti-vehicle to capital ship busters, the SBHAC was likely very versatile and able to engage a range of targets depending on its ammunition load. This type of vehicle is very unique, being one of the only ground-based vehicles to be armed with concussion missiles in all of Star Wars. Continuing the trend of physical-based munitions, the self-propelled heavy artillery mass driver cannon mounted, well, you guessed it, the same thing we see on top of the ATT. The SPHA M cannon propelled a physical shell at incredible speed, usually enveloping the round in energy to increase its speed and penetration, so a coat of plasma over a real artillery shell. If this was scaled up, being on a longer rail system afforded by the vehicle's massive barrel, the range of this artillery piece would be unmatched by anything else out there. This class of mass driver could penetrate directly through most deflector shields, though ray shield and concussion shields would usually have sufficient power to stop such projectiles. The ray shields strong enough to do this, however, were typically mounted only on the most important installations and large warships, leaving most, even shielded targets at the mercy of the SPHAM. It's possible these were deployed during the Battle of Munalists, but their parabolic rounds curving down into their targets, unlike the plasma beam or laser weaponry. But since this variant moved around via repulsors rather than feet, we're back to the issue of finding space for a large reactor, for the power-hungry systems that are repulsors at this scale. All of these SPHA variants served the Grand Army of the Republic as effective super-heavy artillery, and these vehicles were even known to temporarily continue into Imperial service during the early years of the regime. While the line would largely be replaced by more effective and mobile laser artillery, such as the SPMA, one last variant was designed specifically for use in the Imperial Army. The self-propelled heavy artillery thermobaric launcher, or SPHAF, adding a special war crime capability of the kind sought after by the New Order. The F essentially stands for fire, as upon impact, these shells would release a fast-acting chemical catalyst that would ignite the atmosphere on standard Type 1 worlds starting a self-sustaining chain reaction that would create an apocalyptic firestorm. Like the defoliator prototype employed by the CIS during the Clone Wars, these shells were launched in a high arc to come down on top of targets, including those behind cover. Any organic soldiers or plant matter would be incinerated in a brief but intense firestorm, and those even close to the blast radius or inside of cover would likely still suffer horrific burns. The impact was considered so terrible that Leia Organa compared its effects to the Death Star 1, just in terms of how reprehensible it was. And while the Rebels were happy to protest its use, I'm sure in the back of Rex's head, he knew the 501st would have loved to have had a few SPHAFs in their arsenal at Umbara. Apparently, cooking enemy troops and civilians alive was a bit too much even for the Empire, and their use is hardly mentioned. It is unknown when they were retired or how extensive their use was. Their ability to sear down vegetation to expose partisans could be considered even more useful than their direct impact. But since it was so gigantic and hard to deploy, it would kill everyone in the blast radius in a way that was terrible for PR. There's not many instances where this could be used, as really you would only use this thing on a remote, hidden jungle base. And so it is dark to think that the main rebel base on Yavin would have been a prime candidate for this kind of fate. If the SBHA was ever dropped down here on Earth, it'd be almost as long as the wingspan of two 747 passenger airliners, or one and a half football fields. This colossal walker dwarfed everything else on the battlefront, being longer than 15 Sepi AATs, or even seven Imperial AT-ATs, while being about the height of two MTTs stacked on top of each other. So it's a good thing the SBHA was well armored, because it was sure hard to miss. 
that's it for the breakdown. As for the cool facts and behind the scenes stuff, early concepts for Attack of the Clones had the SPHAT moving via a system of massive treads. But this was changed by George Lucas to a leg system to match its ATTE cousins. Like many Star Wars vehicles, its size seen on screen doesn't quite match the size in the databank, seeming to be more around 60 meters in length. And these things are similar to supermassive artillery guns from real history, such as the Gustav and Paris guns which could shell their targets with multi-ton rounds from dozens of miles away. Like in Star Wars, these giant artillery cannons fell out of service in favor of smaller, higher precision artillery pieces that didn't take months to assemble. But most important of all, remember, there's no Geneva Convention in the galaxy far, far away, and the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, Mena Nerds? This video is all about the vehicle that cut down rows of clone infantry, the OG-9 homing spider droid. Unlike the HMP droid gunship, this walker did not have any personality matrix, long-term memory modules, or a vocoder to communicate with the world around it. So although I made the argument that the gunship may have had some sort of sentience, I think we need to view the OG-9 as a conventional mindless droid. Just a four-legged tool for dealing death, and actually for collecting debts. The OG-9 was commissioned by the Commerce Guild for the purpose of convincing debtors to give over their delinquent credits. But it was designed and manufactured by Bactroid Armor Workshop, the Geonosians that produced most of the droid army. After the snafu on Naboo, the Republic tried to break up some of the Trade Federation's weapons facilities, including the providers of tanks and B1s over at Bactoid. Before they were destroyed, these homing spiders were bought up by the Commerce Guild, along with the DSD1 Dwarf Spider. At a cost of only 70,000 credits, you get a whole lot of firepower and features. Its main weapon was the homing laser that could sweep through the battlefront. Notice that this laser doesn't just burn through things, but contains so much power that it actually creates a decent sized explosion on impact. That bottom laser is the anti-personnel cannon, firing volleys of plasma bolts that can melt through their fleshy foes. It's also reported to have a retractable ion cannon, but this is never seen. It is often compared to the Republic's ATTE in the fact that it is a walker that can move a large gun around the battlefront and that it can take on difficult terrain. The main ball is connected to the four legs via these long reinforced hydraulic struts, giving the walker a wide and sturdy stance. Then each of these legs also had shock absorbers and adjustable foot pads so that each could adapt independently to climb steep and uneven ground. Really innovative design made sure that its internal components were completely sealed off, so that the OG-9 could walk along the seafloor. And whether submerged thousands of feet underwater, deep in a cavern, or on a mountaintop, this communication receiver made sure that it could still receive orders from the control computer. Remember, these are very simple droids, without a complex AI, so almost everything had to be directly sent out from Lucre Hulks and core ships. It did have automated targeting, firing, and reactions to terrain, but it is interesting to keep in mind that these were always being told directly where to go on the battlefront. Kind of like a midpoint between our current remote-operated drones and fully autonomous units like commando droids. Other cool features is that it supposedly could be outfitted with different weaponry, and the hydraulics could let it bring those legs in and stand up tall, cutting down ships with that laser, or whipping out its concealed ion cannon. But again, that has never been depicted, although it would be pretty amazing to see. Its normal standing height is 7.2 meters or 24 feet, making it taller than an AAT, but shorter than a Hailfire. This height was crucial so that it could stand above and fire over most other CIS droids during an attack. Because, you know, just standing next to each other in loose formations all firing in the same direction is a quick way to increase friendly fire. The only flaw is that although the encasing of the core was built with thick durasteel, there is a weak point at the connection of these two hemispheres. If directly hit on this area, the top would pop right off as the generators and gas required for these powerful lasers set off a chain reaction. But how was it used during the Clone Wars? While 7,500 of them were present during the opening, doing what it was told to and just marching towards the Republic forces while unleashing its weapons. You can see that it had really good range, and the whole plan to fire over CIS assets worked very well as the battle droids charged the clone troopers. Here we see the DSD-1 rushing ahead of its OG-9 brother. Now I mentioned that they were built and sold alongside each other, making for some very cool pairings on the battlefront. These spiders earned a terrifying reputation throughout the Clone Wars due to the burrowing abilities of the DSD-1. This small spider was used by the Commerce Guild to break up mining strikers and pirates that held themselves up deep in their mining tunnels. This ability was also great for raiding anti-CIS populations and Republic outposts. 
When the DSD-1 found an enemy, it would report back to its big brother, who would lumber its way over to finish him off. Its 90 km per hour or 56 mile per hour top speed meant that it may take some time to get there, but whenever you saw the little spider pop up, you knew that it was only a matter of time before you and your allies were being cut down by its laser scythe. Some OG-9s were present during the Battle of Mimban, killing a Jedi Master, and one nobly tried to bring balance to the Force by opening fire on Jar Jar Binks. Later, they would be seen on Felucia, moments before Ayla Sakura was killed via Order 66. Because they rely so heavily on direct control from CIS personnel, it is less likely that any survived the decommission of CIS droids after the end of the Clone Wars. And sadly, there are no reports of them being used by rebels or any pirate factions. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. Something that always confused me and was one of my few disappointments in the Clone Wars TV show is that there are no OG-9s or Hailfires, two of my favorite vehicles. I wanted to point out that there were some inconsistencies with the guidebooks that say that the top weapon is the anti-personnel cannon and the bottom is the homing laser. I debated if I should change this for the video, as I could make an argument for why it's called that, but it just seems like pointless complication and probably a result of a mistake on their part. It is known for its main laser beam that is fired on top, and it doesn't make sense that the shooting gun isn't the cannon and that the beam weapon isn't the laser. I think it's gotta be the other way around, so that's how I presented it earlier, despite the guidebooks. And I wanted to point out interesting things that both battlefronts did right. The original shows how good it is against infantry, but takes forever against an ATTE, which probably wouldn't take that long, but definitely makes the point of how specialized the droid army was. Let the OG-9 focus on troops, let the Hailfire focus on vehicles. The new battlefront has a more boring, if also somewhat accurate use of the OG-9. They wouldn't be piloted by other droids, and I hear that it works as just a giant turret while the Republics attack a core ship, and remember they didn't have an AI, so you can see how a command to just have them line up as turrets actually makes a lot of sense. Additional information was gained via the Star Wars New Essential Guide to Vehicles and Vessels, On the Frontline, Essential Guide to Warfare, Ultimate Star Wars, and the Complete Encyclopedia. But most important of all, remember, Always shoot over friendlies, not in between them. And the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, Meta Nerds? This time we're going to be taking a look into another specialized member of Kuat's all terrain lineup, the All Terrain Pod Walker. We'll go over its purpose, its use by the GAR, and how the Maker himself brought this walker to life. But first, let's lift the metaphorical hood and see what made the ATAP so unique. Standing at an impressive 11 meters or roughly 36 feet, the ATAP would tower over the ATTE, being over double its height and just under six Dexter Jetsters. In our world, this walker would be about the height of two male giraffes, and surely just as graceful. From turret to tail, this thing was 15.4 meters long or over 50 feet, making it longer than a T-Rex and just under the length of three Felucian Jellygrubs. Its impressive size didn't stop it from sprinting around the battlefront, with a top speed of 60 km per hour, or about 37 miles per hour. While that might not seem fast, the top speed of an Abrams tank is 45 miles per hour, and that thing is on treads. The ATAP is still faster than the Separatist's favorite tank as well, the AAT, which only has a top speed of 34 miles per hour. We don't have a weight for this walker, but we do know that it had a cargo capacity of 200 kilograms, or about 441 pounds, which is just about 882 ears of corn, and only about a quarter due back. A two-day supply of rations was also on board, just in case the battle rages on longer than expected. With no shielding system, the ATAP relied on its thick plate armor for any and all defensive needs. Now onto the main event of this beast, the three cannons. From top to bottom, we have a medium blaster cannon, operated by an exposed gunner and a swivel turret, the powerful mass driver cannon, just like the one on the ATTE, and finally a smaller heavy repeating laser cannon on the underside of the hull, which was meant for dealing with smaller threats. With all this firepower, you might think the role of this walker would be frontline armor, and we'll get into its role in a moment, but I really want to break down that big gun, the mass driver. Unlike other weapons in the Star Wars universe, the mass driver is essentially a slug thrower, firing a monstrously vicious Durasteel round that was moving at hypersonic speeds. The range was far, even further than the naked eye could see, which is why the ATAP was equipped with a very impressive targeting system, as well as a sophisticated suite for data relay. 
This kind of power would require a lot of stability, and since the ATAP was essentially just the forward section of an ATTE, that meant it needed that big third leg in the middle of the body to provide a more stable firing platform, ensuring that mass driver hit its targets without the entire vehicle tipping backwards. It also had integral recoil compensation systems, as well as a top of the line gyro stabilization system, ensuring this walker would remain standing. Because of this walker's deadly targeting capabilities and one-shot potential, the clones affectionately nicknamed the ATAP the Sniper Tank. The ventral cannon was a repeating blaster, mainly used to fend off infantry, and the turret on the dorsal side of this thing was used against incoming enemy vehicles that came too close for the mass driver. All of this could be yours for the low price of 90,000 Republic credits, which means that you could have three of these walkers for just the price of one ATT, and even some spare credits left over for a few hundred cups of Jawa juice. Now that we know the in and outs of this walker, what exactly are we supposed to do with it? It was not intended to be a frontline assault craft, but instead to serve mainly as a highly mobile artillery unit. Now you might think the Grand Army of the Republic didn't need any more of that, since that role was nicely filled by the AB-7. However, if we look closer, the ATAP solves a few of that cannon's issues. First, as a walker, it can maneuver through friendly and enemy shielding, something the AB-7 could not, being propelled via repulsor lifts. This made shoot and scoot tactics an even more viable strategy. The AB-7 had another glaring weakness, it did not have any means of self-defense should the enemy get too close. The ATAP once again corrects this flaw, making it a more versatile vehicle to have in your armor lineup. And we're not alone in thinking that, as many clone commanders incorporated this tank into their legions, including the 41st Elite, the 327th Star Corps, and the 91st Mobile Recon Corps, which is just a few among many others. Kuat made this vehicle available well into the Clone Wars, perhaps seeing the same flaws we just mentioned in current Republic artillery, and the ATAP quickly found its way into the Outer Rim sieges. Just as quickly, we see how the Jedi Generals misused this craft in their combat strategies. At least one was destroyed during the Battle of Horain, and their role as long-range artillery was seemingly completely ignored by the wisest Jedi of them all, Master Yoda. On the Wookiee homeworld of Kashyyyk, Masters Yoda, Luminara, Gree, and the 41st Elite were preparing for a massive droid assault on Kachiro Beach. And perhaps it was in their haste to unload the Venator that we see several ATAPs taking point alongside the infantry. Once the battle begins to rage, we still see these walkers charging into combat alongside the mighty turbo tanks. While the ATAP could be used to support larger armor, it is strange to see it so front and center, especially as the swift corporate alliance tank droids are closing in over the water, and the droid gunships are swooping in through the flak filled skies. Aside from this battle, we do see them in use in a more proper way. On Felucia, under the command of Master Ayla Sakura and Clone Marshal Commander Bly, we see two ATAPs bringing up the rear in a column of armor. Supported by the heavy ATTE and the nimble Swamp Speeders, the ATAP looms over the less protected ATOT in a seemingly defensive position. This makes more sense than whatever was happening on Kashyyyk, and I'm sure this grouping of vehicles would have turned the opposing droids to scrap had the infamous Order 66 not been given out, and General Sakura shot in the back by her once loyal men. It's never confirmed when the Emperor ordered the production of these walkers to end, but we do know that sometime around the historic Battle of Yavin, the Alliance had gotten their hands on a few of these walkers, heavily modified them, and sent them out into war during the Battle of Tatooine, which ended in a rebel victory, proving that this old relic of the Clone Wars could still pack a punch. Legends say that some criminal organizations made great use of this old walker, with both the Hut Cartel and Zan Consortium using the ATAP extensively to grow their underworld empires. By the time the First Order came into existence, the ATAP's legacy was still being felt as the Urban Assault Triped Transport, or UATT, was inspired by that old design from Kuwa. So with its history in the books, let's see what we can learn behind the scenes. George Lucas himself requested that the armor of the clone army be diversified for Revenge of the Sith, and so the ATAP was born. Initial concepts for this walker were done by author and artist Alex Yeager, who called it the Pod Attack Walker, or PAW for short. And much like the UTAT, the ATAP does not appear in any on screen Star Wars media outside of Revenge of the Sith, its first and only appearance. As much as we love the ATTE, it would have been nice to see the full array of vehicles the Republic had represented in a show all about the Clone Wars. However, unlike the UTAT, this vehicle does pop up in a few comics and games, most notably Empire at War. 
Even in the base game, the ATAP is used by the criminal factions as their main source of armor. It also appears in LEGO Star Wars 3, The Clone Wars, as an air support option. And speaking of LEGO, the ATAP has been brought to us by the building company on three separate occasions, with their latest model arriving in 2019. Hasbro also got in on the action, giving kids and collectors a gorgeous model of the walker, and a few repaints in the years following. It's good to see that despite its minimal time on screen, or pages, the ATAP has left its mark. This wraps things up on the All-Terrain Attack Pod. Please hit that like button, leave some comments, and subscribe. It's the best way to help me out. But most important of all, remember, not always the tactical genius Yoda was. And the Force will be with you. Always. When you want the transport capability of an MTT, but you don't need to have enough armor to knock down a building, look no further than the Platoon Attack Craft. What's up, Meta Nerds? Today we're going to be taking a look at the Trade Federation's Platoon Attack Craft, otherwise known as the PAC. We'll be using both Legends and Canon sources to deliver you a complete picture of the PAC's stats, capabilities, and role in the Trade Federation's forces from the Battle of Naboo to beyond. The Platoon Attack Craft played an essential role in Trade Federation and later CIS forces, transporting massive quantities of battle droids as a part of a larger combined arms operation. The vehicle, 26 meters in length, was essentially a repulsor lift sled adapted from civilian use similar to how the Trade Federation adapted the STAP from a civilian airhook. Here we can see the continued trend of the Trade Federation in this early period when they tried to present themselves as a purely commercial enterprise, concealing their considerable warfighting abilities in the development of their combat vehicles. This slide was piloted by a pair of OOM pilot droids, likely replaced during the Clone Wars with independently thinking models. The PAC carried a rack stowing 112 battle droids armed with standard blaster rifles, identical to the rack carried on board its larger brother, the multi-troop transport. The PAC, with its open design, is unarmored and did not have any weaponry, making the troops it carried very vulnerable even to small arms. Thus, the PAC's primary role was shuttling droids around in occupied areas or far behind the battle lines, ideally away from enemy fire. During the occupation of Naboo, they can commonly be seen fulfilling this purpose. Later, we would see them break this rule, with the PACs being used in the direct assault on Republic positions in the amphibious assault on Kachiro Beach, possibly only because the heavy MTTs could not hover across the lake. When the Trade Federation became a part of the Confederacy of Independent Systems, they took their arsenal with them, including their stockpile of PACs. Platoon attack craft were used to shuttle droids from the factories and holding areas to the Petronaki Arena on Geonosis, during what would become the first Battle of the Clone Wars, and they were later seen on Hisrich in the aforementioned Kashyyyk. Unlike most donated vehicles, they were not repainted in CIS colors, instead appearing in their standard Trade Federation livery. So without armor and weapons, why would the Trade Federation CIS use the PAC over the much more capable MTT Big Brother? Well, firstly, and never to be underestimated in importance to Nymoidians, is cost. This is outrageous! I object! The PAC cost a mere 37,000 credits, versus the MTT's 120,000, so it's more than three times cheaper. Additionally, the use of less materials freed up additional supplies and factory space, meaning you could pump out these and other craft faster. Secondly, the PAC was a faster vehicle, nearly twice the speed, moving without any of the heavy armor of the MTT at a rate of 50 km per hour at maximum thrust. In a transport role, the PAC was superior to the MTT, moving troops to their destination faster and with equal transport capacity, as long as they did not encounter enemy resistance. The Trade Federation clearly saw them as integral to their combat operations, with their C9979 transports carrying 28 of these vehicles, compared to just 11 MTTs and with Lucre Hulks transporting 1,500 PACs compared to 550 MTTs, almost triple the amount. So with all those advantages, why are they so rarely seen in the Clone Wars? The most important reason of all is their vulnerability. They can't be used in the battle lines like the MTT, like we see on Dathomir during Grievous' invasion. Even on nominally secured planets, their cargo of droids is extremely vulnerable to even attacks from blasters and grenades. Thus, on worlds with significant partisan activity, such as Ryloth and Onderon, it was safer to move droids and cargo within protected MTTs, with thick armor that was virtually impossible for lightly armed rebels to breach. Unless, of course, they got help from the CIA, <coughs> I mean Jedi. I love this! However, it can be assumed that on secure Separatist worlds, it would have been a common sight to see PACs shuttling around cargo and droids going in between factories and garrisons. That's just the side of the Clone Wars we don't see too often. And then because the droid army was decommissioned after the Clone Wars, these all would have been rapidly decommissioned vehicles, and it was simple to reconvert them, just take the rack off, and now they're standard civilian cargo sleds. And this would have been a really useful vehicle for any world. 
being the same length as two and a half school buses, and although no stats exist on the width or height, we can estimate it to be around two meters tall, without the rack, using this B-1 pilot droid as a reference. This would make it as tall as a king-size bed and almost as wide as a Wookiee plus a Jawa. Although it looks the same, it is unknown whether the droids would deploy from the racks as with the MTT, with those racks spreading laterally in a sequential fashion, or if they deployed by some other method. And keep in mind that the MTT could swap out its rack to carry 20 B2 Super Battle Droids, or 20 Droidicas. It's unknown if the PAC had this capability, but I don't see why not. Which is terrifying to think about, a rapid response hover sled full of 20 Droidicas. Sadly, there's not too much cool facts or behind the scenes material to discuss with this vehicle. Its first identification was oddly not in a vehicle, but rather a locations sourcebook, with its name emerging in the early drafts of The Phantom Menace. A LEGO set created for the PAC in 2015 carried a paltry 8 droids in comparison to what should be 112, a minifig collector's dream. Maybe an update to this forgotten vehicle will come out soon, if not, we'll all express to Dave Filoni our utmost disappointment. But most important of all, remember, if your tactical droid commander assigns you to one of these, make sure you get this bottom bunk, it might give you some semblance of protection. And the force will be with you. Always. What's up, meta-nerds? Let's break down the All-Terrain Open Transport, or ATOT, and we'll start with its main role. It might seem odd to have an open top in a war where an enemy was pumping out swarms of cheap and effective droid fighters like the Vulture and Hyena. They could just strafe these tightly packed in clones, or drop a single bomb on them. But just looking at the context we first see them in does help us understand it more. They have the most heavily armed and armored unit at the very front, the ATT. In that vehicle's breakdown, we saw how effective the main cannon could be at long range, and the suite of terrain sensors to assess the threats on the battlefront. It was accurate enough to shoot down nimble starfighters, and even incoming rockets. And then at the rear of this column, we see a pair of AT-APs. The all-terrain attack pod had lighter armor, didn't serve that dual role as a troop transport like the TE, but was a great mix of that tank and artillery like the AV-7. Having this enormous heavy blaster cannon, that makes the mass driver look small in comparison, even though it's the exact same one used on the at -TE. Since that mass driver cannon had a variable munitions launcher, it could fire everything from bunker busters to armor-piercing rounds, generate bolts to take down battle droids, or shoot down starfighters. And although not explicitly stated, I don't see why it couldn't also fire flak and work like an anti-aircraft gun, like we saw with the Geonosians during the Second Battle of Geonosis. And if you look in between the walkers, there are two pairs of ISPs. The infantry support platform was a rapid response hovercraft, with two twin blaster cannons that would race out to the sides to flank any enemies they encountered, or break through the ambush and circle back to pincer these attackers. So it wasn't like the open transports were leading the charge against fortress walls, waiting for hot droid oil to be poured on them. And they even had the boys on slugback keeping a lookout as well. One design improvement over the tactical enforcer is that it no longer has a weak, flexible midsection. It does have this smaller, more ATAT like weak neck connection, but even then, because of the way this armored section extends over it, you still get full range of motion without the threat from being shot down from above. With aircraft being your greatest threat, this would force the enemy to take a lower angle of attack trying to shoot at it from the sides. And when possible, a smart walker pilot could make that angle of attack impossible by using terrain like buildings, canyons, or vegetation to make sure the starfighter couldn't get a low side angle. There were three major battles of Felucia, with this sector being one of the hottest conflict zones of the war. Neither Republic nor Separatist General felt that they ever had complete control of this jungle world, with the fate of a battle being changed by the arrival of a C-9979 or Acclimator descending through the hot and humid atmosphere. And so these walkers would be crucial in making sure that any area that was captured by the Republic would be securely supplied and defended from there on out. The ATOT itself stood 5.8 meters tall and had a length of 14.3 meters, making it a child Jawa shorter than the ATTE and about an Ewok longer, while actually being a bit slower at 55 kilometers per hour or 34 miles per hour, and likely had a similar 500 mile range on its fuel tank. Most of the walker line used the same parts. So everything from the sensors inside to the legs themselves are the same. And though slightly different, the same goes for the cockpit canopy design and function. The forward weaponry is a pair of medium laser cannons, while the rear two are anti-personnel cannons, in the same style as the ATTE. And we can imagine the inside look pretty similar as well, with a gunner operating each of these guns in a large open troop section, but not split into two sections. Kuat driveyards state that there are 34 seats for troops up top, and I'd guess likely around 20 to 30 troops inside. Though officially, there is no internal troop capacity ever mentioned, and so it may have just been dedicated to supplies, heavy weaponry like turrets, and small vehicles like speeder bikes and frog walkers. If there are no troops inside, this could point to another theory I have on why we see this open top design pop up towards the end of the war. If we're keeping it real with Kuat, their armor wasn't cutting it. 
All the walkers were impervious to things like blaster fire and grenades, and while it's true that an ATOT trooper would be worried if they did walk into an ambush, all that small arms fire would be focused on them. But if a separatist bomb or a missile hit you, you were dead either way, no matter which armored walker you were in. You can have a nice Dura Steel coffin in your ATTE, or be scattered out the top like clone confetti, but the survival rate was the same. Toward the end of the war, debates were raging in the Senate over how they were going to keep paying for everything getting so bad that it threatened to foil Palpatine's plans and bring peace. The Republic is near bankruptcy due to the cost of this war. But this bill essentially deregulate the banks? A small price to pay to finance the war, is it not? So the ATOT was a cheaper option, and could move about three times the troops of the ATT. Since they would be used alongside other assets, this was a cheap force multiplier that effectively wasn't any weaker against things like Hailfire droids and hyenas, because dead is dead, they weren't more dead. And in fact, it might have been even safer since they could bail out of the top. Even standing at its highest, it would only be about a two-story jump. Not the most comfortable, but these clones were elite, and they wouldn't have thought twice about it. And that's jumping off from here. But towards the rear, you see the ramp that cut this height in half, to around 10 feet, which was designed to be used when it sat down to deploy them like we see with the ATT. And the fact that this is down while they are moving, not expecting to take contact, before they even saw the enemy, shows how the clones and Republic Command adapted to the war. It didn't hurt to just leave it down, so just have it down all the time, and I could see the training around this being that at the first sign of enemy armor or aircraft, the troops could bail over the top or slide down this ramp, hit the ground running, and spread out to secure the perimeter, and make sure no enemy infantry closed in on the armored units. The height of the walls in this section is perfect to completely protect them from the sides when seated, and even when standing, only their armored heads, about from the eyes up, would be exposed, allowing them to keep a lookout as they walk through the terrain, be that a dense jungle or occupied city. Another interesting use is that since the legs are the same as the ATTE, it could scale almost any terrain, even 90 degree sheer cliff walls, due to the footpads having both magnetic clamps, but more importantly tractor beam tech that's usually only seen in ships, which warped gravity to create this pull, locking the foot onto whatever it was climbing over, allowing the ATOT to shuttle supplies and troops to remote outposts or zones that were first established by LAATs letting the gunships clear everything out, drop some forward command stations and maybe a tank or two, and have the OTs come through to secure these positions. The mission we see them on in the final moments of the war resulted from the Outer Rim sieges, a CIS effort to overwhelm areas in the Outer Rim to draw the Republic out of the core, setting up the attack on Coruscant. The 327th Star Corps Infantry, under the command of Jedi General Aayla Sakura, would try to capture Shu Mai, the president of the Commerce Guild. But to divert the Republic forces, the Separatist leader set off a series of explosions that essentially held the planet hostage. Toxins were leaking into the planet-wide aquifer on Felucia, and if the Republic didn't act quickly, this would poison all life on this lush world within just four days. The armored column was led by General Sakura, and she had just discovered enemy armor near the water treatment facility. Just as Order 66 was being broadcast, a Felucia bird, possibly a variant of a Pico Pico, gets startled and screeches past Ayla, distracting her for just a moment as her clones open fire. Partly due to her leadership style, but also just because they'd seen how unstoppable Jedi could be, they make extra sure that she is dead. In the Imperial era, like most of the CIS and Republic ships and vehicles, the ATOTs would be scrapped on planet-wide facilities like Bracca. While some ATTEs and Juggernauts live on a bit longer, they ultimately met the same fate, with stormtroopers and cargo being moved around with things like the Imperial Troop Transport and AT-AT. There was no longer the need for as many walkers, since their main advantage was that they could walk through energy shields, just like we see with infantry, and not be repulsed away like the hovercraft using repulsor tech to get off the ground. Since the ATOT wasn't meant to lead from the front, though using a repulsor craft would have been quicker to shuttle things about, it also meant that you couldn't walk through your own shields. Clones would put up portable base shield generators and be confident that enemy AATs or C9979s could not get through, since they both rely heavily on repulsor tech. But in order for this strategy to work, your resupply vehicles also had to be walkers, even if that meant they were a bit slower. But when this wasn't a concern, you did have the RTT, the Republic Troop Transport, which was like a powerful speeder, a land-based LAAT, and would be the inspiration for the ITT. Since the enemy was now your own citizens, not a massive, fully funded military with repulsor tanks and their own energy shields. But on the rare occasion when the enemy did get their hands on a shield, the Empire could send in their ATAT, DP, and ST. So that's it for the breakdown. I hope it explains why the ATOT definitely had a role in the Republic Army. And as for behind the scenes facts, like most of the Star Wars ships and vehicles, it was intended to evoke things from World War 1 and 2, which is why you have stuff like charging tactics, exposed gunners, manually firing cannons, and other tech that seems out of place on a sci-fi battlefront. And so this was meant to be reminiscent of open-top troop carriers, everything from trucks to half-tracks. 
Now, they only appear in Revenge of the Sith, and it is a bit of a forgotten vehicle, only appearing in the 2014 mobile game Galactic Defense, not even in Empire at War or the Battlefront games. And there is no cross-section for it, but the other ones used come from the complete cross-sections book, and there are some details in the complete visual dictionary. But most important of all, remember, when you hear a hyena, tuck and roll, because broken ankles bog down campaigns, and the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is all about the NRN99 Persuader class, aka the Snail Tank. In other videos, we saw how the OG9 and the Hailfire were used to collect debts. If you owed credits to the Commerce Guild, you'd wake up to a towering, mechanized spider laser cutting the roof off of your home. If the Munes recalled your loan, you'd be trying to outrun the Hailfire and its 30 rocket payload. But if you crossed the Corporate Alliance, it was the Snail Tank that you had to worry about. The CA didn't deal too much with personal loans, so they weren't really trying to repossess loaned property, but rather protect their property. Some loved the CA for their ability to civilize remote worlds and bring trade and jobs to these areas, but others had problems with how certain corporations in the Alliance conducted business. Protesters would often block access to these controversial manufacturers, or even destroy property, which is what caused the CA to look to the Techno Union for a solution. They were able to produce a cheap, powerful, and speedy droid unit to bust up the dissenters. Each unit cost the CA only 49,000 credits, that's less than the cost of the disposable TIE Fighter, and even less than the solutions used by the IBC and the Commerce Guild. For that price you got a lot of firepower, with two ion cannons and two heavy repeating blasters, but a modular design allowed it to be swapped out for shock rifles or a series of heavy explosives. I like that with the Hailfire we saw that it had a shock option as well, belying the fact that even in the Outer Rim, you can't just go around killing anything that gets in your way. Or at least not for long. But when you were certain that death and destruction were warranted, you could swap these cannons out for two variable munition launch tubes, capable of firing either 12 concussion missiles, 48 thermal detonators, 4 homing missiles, or 4 dumbfire torpedoes. I think the great variation in weaponry here shows the great variation in the groups that oppose the CA. Some would have just been peaceful protesters getting stunned to regain access to the property, but others would have been dedicated militants. We see some of this with groups like the Nebula Front, a sort of monopoly-busting militia that waged war on the Trade Federation using starfighters, blasters, and bombs. So it is reasonable to think that the CA faced similar folks on the worlds that they operated on. In a way, these droids were battle-hardened by the time that the Clone Wars broke out. When the CA allied itself with the CIS, they donated most of their snail tanks to the war effort, where its design features were able to really shine. The vehicle is essentially a droid brain and munitions wrapped up in a tread system. This main unit here houses everything, with these photoreceptor eye stalks and communications antenna attaching to its droid brain. It actually has a more complex AI than the OG-9 and Hailfire, being able to calculate where to travel and what to destroy in order to accomplish the mission, whereas those other guys just react to things like terrain data while moving along pre-assigned routes. But if any corrections had to be made, the pilot droids located in core ships could always log in and take control of it. This main unit would contain all of the engines that kept everything moving, and the Tabana gas used for its weaponry. By having these pair of side treads out on pylons, it made the tank a lot more stable, but also ensures a good grip when traveling across the debris-filled battlefront. With a height of 6.2 meters, or 20 feet, it was about two-thirds the height of the ACST. And with a length of 10.96 meters, or 36 feet, the snail is about a Jawa longer than an AAT. But despite this size and use of treads instead of repulsors, it still gets up to a great top speed. Standard models have a top speed of 60 km per hour or 37 miles per hour, but some variants can reach 100 km per hour or 62 miles per hour. This made even the base faster than the AAT, and the variant is quicker than even the ATRT. But the way the snail tank combines these traits is kinda terrifying. When this thing was deployed, it would often crash right through buildings to get to its targets. Hitting walls at 60 miles per hour would smash them to pieces, and the incredible grab of those treads meant that it wouldn't even slow down as it accelerated over the resulting rubble. Its eye stalks and a name like Snail Tank might not be that intimidating, but if you understand this thing's ability, you'll think twice about opposing the Corporate Alliance and the CIS. But oppose the Republic did, and over the course of the Clone Wars, they could be seen on various worlds. On Christophsis, they were taken out on the bridge by AV-7 artillery. 
Later, they were a part of an invasion force on Malastare, and would have their droid brains fried by the Electro Proton Bomb. Then they were found on Megiddo, and most notably on Kashyyyk. Here they unveiled some cool abilities, but also a crucial weakness. You could see that droid units could ride on the side tracks, and impressively that with fast enough speeds, they could ride on top of the water. Where the DSD-1 dwarf spider was crawling up along the seafloor, the larger NR-99 was riding the waves. But the Wookiees were able to blow apart one by attaching a single thermal detonator. This housed all that Tabana gas and its droid brain, so this chain reaction instantly turned it into a pile of scrap. After the Clone Wars ended, some Wookiees repurposed Hailfires to use against the Empire, but it's unclear if any snail tanks were used this way. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. This thing was set to appear in Episode 2, and there are even animatics that depict it, but they weren't finished in time for the deadline. And there was some confusion as to whether OOM pilots can control it remotely, or have to actually sit inside. The Wikipedia and some other sources imply that in Episode 3, an OOM was shown inside of one, but I think that is just a confusion of what's happening in this scene. You can see the OOM seeming to fly out from inside of the tank, but if you go back and just slow it down, you can see the OOM standing on the side. So I think this is who we see getting blown towards the top of the screen. But let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Additional information comes from the Star Wars Encyclopedia of Starfighters and Other Vehicles, Ultimate Star Wars, and the Complete Visual Dictionary. So that's it for the NRN99 snail tank. But most important of all, remember, beware the bulldozing snails, and the Force will be with you, always. When Seppi tanks are closing in on your position, you're gonna call for armor support. But when they aren't available, you're gonna rely on the dependable AV-7. What's up, Mena Nerds? Today we're doing a deep dive into the Republic AV-7 anti-vehicle cannon, using both legends and cannon sources to construct a full picture of this vehicle, its stats, capabilities, and role in the Grand Army of the Republic. The AV-7 serves the dual role of anti-vehicle cannon and medium artillery piece for the Grand Army of the Republic. We will discuss both of these roles, and how the AV-7 serves them on the battlefronts of the Clone Wars as well as the technical specifications, real-world comparisons, and behind-the-scenes facts. First, and most importantly, what's in the name? The AV-7's primary task is destruction of enemy vehicles. The cannon itself is served by one gunner seated in an open mount, with a selection of screens in front of him displaying targeting data likely fed from the forward spotters or orbital reconnaissance. Depending on range to target, the cannon will elevate or depress, aided by the four-leg assembly the cannon is mounted on, which can flex to allow additional range of motion for targeting. The legs also serve as shock absorbers, reducing the cannon's recoil as it fires. It is firing plasma energy shells, capable of destroying AATs and snail tanks with a single direct hit. The AV-7's shells fall on the target in a shallow arc rather than drilling into them from the front, resulting in hits impacting the weaker topside and or the rear armor of enemy armored assets, resulting in almost guaranteed kills. They can crank down for direct fire as well, creating enough blast and overpressure to wipe out friendly and enemy infantry alike with impunity, as Captain Rex noted during the Battle of Christophsis. The AV-7s also fulfill the role of medium artillery, providing indirect fire support to GAR forces at moderate range. On the battlefield, SPHATs and AV-7s would likely work together, with SPHATs firing at extreme long range at major enemy targets, while AV-7s could focus on tactical fire support against enemy infantry and armor. Their plasma shells were more than capable of shattering closely packed separate destroyed columns, and the overpressure from the blast could kill or injure organics as well even when not in the direct blast radius. While the ammunition fired by the AV-7s was plasma and not kinetic, they could nevertheless be programmed to detonate at selective heights, such as at head level to inflict maximum casualties against infantry. Rex calculated a final firing solution that would cause maximum destruction of the armored column and droids if they placed a few rounds just so. Set them to cook off at chest height rather than on impact. The explosion would flatten anything standing, and the shrapnel from the droids would kill any organics standing in the blast radius. AV-7s were seen throughout the Clone Wars, from the Battle of Christophsis to the Second Battle of Geonosis. And while the plasma shells were devastating against unshielded targets, they had difficulty penetrating enemy shields, both vehicle-based and larger theater deflector shields. The deployment of a theater ray shield by Confederate General Warm Loathsome completely nullified the firepower of a quartet of these guns. While during the siege of Poggle the Lesser's factory, the AV-7s were unable to penetrate the shielding of the newly deployed Separatist supertanks. 
Here we see a major weakness in the AB7s as well. Despite their tremendous firepower, they are incredibly vulnerable to all manner of enemy return fire. Rockets, tank shells, and even infantry blasters pose a threat to this cannon as it is an unarmored vehicle with an exposed gunner. In the anti-tank role, the AB7 is depending on its range, hoping to neutralize the target before it can return enemy fire. In this way, the AV-7 is depending on range, concealment, and firepower for survival, similar to the World War II era anti-tank guns such as the Pac-40. In the counter-battery role, the AV-7's open design makes it more vulnerable to CIS armored artillery, such as the HHEM. Thus, it is best employed in entrenched positions to lessen the effect of incoming enemy fire. Using the firing arc so that it can stay behind cover, and only have to worry about enemy air or artillery. But the final advantage possessed by the AV-7 is its mobility. Despite its appearance, it does not rely on its legs as its primary means of locomotion, like say its counterpart, the J-1 Proton Cannon. Instead, its legs fold under the chassis, and the AV-7 moves via a built-in repulsor lift. This puts the AV-7 in a class of self-propelled artillery, able to move with Republic armored columns and deploy as needed rather than relying on space or aerial transport for redeployment. The repulsor lift would enable the AV-7 to employ shoot-and-scoot tactics in counter-battery operations, firing salvos at enemy artillery positions, then quickly redeploying before enemy rangefinders can triangulate their position and return fire. The AV-7 was also mounted on rail assemblies as part of some Venator-class Star Destroyers, being the secondary armament along its port and starboard trenches, between the brim and hull decks. These cannons lack legs and instead are built into rolling rails to aid in absorption of recoil. This was likely an improvised measure, as these weapons were not a part of the Venator's standard armament, and may have been a late war practice on an informal basis, such as the addition of SPHATs to bolster a Venator's ventral armament in the Open Circle Fleet. Now for some stats and comparisons of the AV-7. It was manufactured by the firm Tame and Back, responsible for all manner of turbolaser weaponry, costing the Republic 14,000 credits apiece brand new. However, by the time these weapons left the GAR service, they could be picked up secondhand for as little as 8,000 credits. So that's a lot of firepower for planetary security forces, rebels, and whoever else could get their hands on these guns, as they were phased out of the Empire in favor of more modern and effective artillery designs, such as the M102 Fire Arc, SPMA, and the V1A8 Penetrator. Though the main cost of this thing is going to be in the shells, but since they are plasma, perhaps it is running off of common Tabana gas. It might be one of the cheapest bang for your bucks out there in the galaxy. Including the cannon, the AV-7 was a hair over 15 meters in length, which means if it was brought to Earth, it would stand the same length as a standard US semi-trailer. While no stats exist for its width, approximating by the size of the cannon barrel and gunner, the AV-7 is about 9 meters in width, or 4 golf carts end to end. Sadly, we get no weight approximation for the AV-7, making it difficult to determine how powerful its built-in repulsor is. And now for some cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. In the last video on the ATRT Frogwalker, I forgot to mention that the main advantage of walkers is that they can walk through shields. All repulsor lift technology, which makes everything hover in the Star Wars universe, repels against all forms of energy shields, like the same poles of a magnet. But if this cannon could not walk on those feet, instead using the repulsor tech, then it wouldn't have been able to go in and out of shielding. Which isn't that much of a deal breaker for artillery, it's not supposed to be scrambling all across the battlefront, but it may have limited the scoot and shoot tactics, meaning you couldn't have your shields up, move out of it to fire, and then move back in. Like you could if you were using the ATTE in a kind of artillery role. The AV-7 has popped up in several modes and games throughout the years. The 2011 Hasbro model comes with a tread-based propulsion system, a decidedly non-canon, if interesting, variant. Just look at the silly little treads on the feet. But if you want to use the AV-7s in action yourself, you can try out a number of Empire at War mods, such as the Fall of the Republic or Republic at War. As mentioned before, the AV-7's design and operations mimic that of World War II era anti-tank guns, such as the Pac-40, Soviet 45, and 57mm, and US M1 anti-tank gun. Like the AV-7, these guns were much simpler to produce than entire tanks, but provide similar firepower at the expense of crew protection and maneuverability. But most important of all, remember, beware the overpressure, and the Force will be with you, always. When those pesky Republic walkers and gunships pose a threat from the air or from the ground, look no further than the reliable and powerful J-1 semi-autonomous proton cannon for your defense. 
What's up, Meta Nerds? Today we'll be exploring the specs, stats, and history of the Separatist J-1 to see what made it such a formidable field artillery piece for the CIS. We'll use both legends and canon sources to construct a full picture of it, and you'll see why Republic officers were so weary of this weapon's deadly firepower. CIS commanders had a wide variety of weapon systems at their disposal, covering all manner of engagement ranges and requirements. Confederate armor, AATs, NRN99 snail tanks, and IG-227 hailfires tended to steal the glory in offensive operations, hovering, treading, and rolling forward to crush Loyalist positions. However, when pushed onto the defensive, SEPI officers knew they could rely on the J-1. It squatted down on four crab-like legs, which bowed inward to form the center mounting for a thick cannon assembly. A wide, stubby barrel protruded from the cannon housing, roofed with curving armor plates while an operational control chair jutted out to the left side of the vehicle. With its stout, bug-like appearance, the J-1 appeared every bit the product of the insectoid engineers that the CIS favored, from the Geonosians to the Colicoids. But it was actually produced by the Gumby folks over at the Techno Union, and was an integral part of the industrial conglomerate's contribution to the Separatist Alliance, and would be licensed to be built in factories across the galaxy as the CIS war effort intensified. The J-1, while technically self-propelled, was quite slow to move and repossession. The J-1's leg assemblies could shuffle to align the cannon housing, elevating to engage aerial targets or repositioning to gain a better shot, although this process was very slow and deliberate. Tactical or operational mobility was not a necessity, however, as the J-1 was a field artillery piece designed to function in a defensive role, not to be moving quickly with armored columns like the tanks mentioned before. It did fill a dual role of anti-tank and anti-aircraft artillery, equally capable of blasting Republic tanks on the ground or gunships in the sky, and at major Separatist installations, such as the Shield Generator Spire for Poggle the Lesser's Foundry on Geonosis, or the Occupied Anaxis Assembly Complex, these locations were studded with these gun positions, providing solid all-around defense. J-1s had long range and powerful shells, allowing them to pick off attackers at a distance of several miles before they could close in. On Ryloth, the J-1 battery drove off incoming Republic acclimators and shot down multiple 212th gunships en route to liberate the town of Nabat while dozens of Republic gunships went down in flames over the Geonosian Desert, in one of the most infamous air assaults of the entire war in the second invasion of Geonosis. And while powerful, the J-1s had a slow rate of fire, limited by their firing mechanism. The proton shells were manually loaded by labor droids into the breech loading chamber, firing one round before reloading. Typically, this was not an issue when firing as a part of a battery, especially at long range, but in close quarters, this reload speed limited the J-1's ability to quickly knock out one target after another. In battle, they were best used as a part of a multi-layered network of defenses, in some ways similar to the old firing lines of early rifles, where you could make up for lack of speed by volume and staggering them. With the J-1 dug in and picking off targets at long range, with DSD-1 dwarf spiders putting up a rapid, short-range anti-aircraft flak screen, and hopefully having other pieces filling in the medium range. And we see this in the Second Battle of Geonosis, where they were used in a multi-layered defense along with Geonosian sonic cannons and Nantex fighters, making the skies a very lethal place for Republic craft. Sonic cannons also complemented the J-1s on Poggle shield generator outpost, covering that medium range, while J-10 dual blaster cannons engaged infantry, allowing the artillery to focus more on armored targets. If they needed to, J-1s could be used against infantry at point-blank range, but their effectiveness was limited, and alone they tended to fall prey to enemy units that got close. Y-wings that penetrated the anti-aircraft screen at the assembly complex and on Geonosis would come in for screaming dive-bombing runs, too fast and at too steep of an angle for the J-1s to track. They probably would have done the same against the J-1 battery at Nabat, if not for the Republic's reluctance to wipe out the entire village in the process. J-1s were likely protected against shell fragments and small arms, with that light armor plating on the side, but it could be easily taken out by enemy tanks. And it didn't appear to be hardened against EMP attacks either, with even handheld droid poppers being able to temporarily scramble their scanners. Like all vehicles, J-1s could be vulnerable, but when properly employed and supported, it did form a vital part of the Confederate officer's defensive screen. And as for that semi-autonomous part of the name, this came from the J-1's optionally manned nature. A gunner, whether they be droid or organic, could sit in the left side mounted gunner's chair, with a targeting panel that would display all the important information needed. Range to target, shell type, firing solution, etc. However, the cannon came with a built-in droid brain enabling it to function independently if desired. 
So though not looking like a B1 or B2 battle droid, this, just like the fighters and other tanks, is a droid unit. Separatist commanders could have the option to slave circuit all J1 batteries in a sector to a certain target, giving better top-down control. However, it has been noted in the galaxy far, far away that totally automated gunnery tends to be predictable and less accurate. So having a gunner when possible was preferred in most situations. That droid brain is fed data via these two large photoreceptor eyes, located right below the main gun and enabling it to form its own firing solutions. With a confirmed height of 6.5 meters and about 6 meters long and wide, for the body, not including the gun barrel, the J1 would be about four standard American bathtubs laid end to end or a common giraffe reclining long ways, while being about a third shorter than the AAT, or half the size of a Republic ATTE, giving this stout vehicle lots of places to position itself in town squares, alleys, or atop properly reinforced buildings. J1s were also seen as a part of the port and starboard armament of some separatist warships, such as the Munificent Class Frigate or Providence Class Carrier Destroyer. Here, these guns were fed with a magazine-type ammunition rack, giving these guns a much faster rate of fire, and bolted directly to the deck, with firepower able to engage shielded capital ships, albeit as a secondary or even tertiary armament. So knowing it was packing that kind of firepower, it's no wonder the J-1 could blow LAATs to smithereens, and could paralyze if not completely destroy ATTEs and saber tanks, and even documented cases of them taking down larger ATHEs and juggernauts as well. That's it for the breakdown, and as for some cool facts and behind the scenes stuff, the J1s are similar to the high caliber flak guns of World War II, such as the German Flak 88. But the Flak 88 was powerful and long range, used to pick off Allied bombers flying over Germany, slowly firing heavy flak shells which could reach high altitudes. Like the J1, the Flak 88 also was pressed into an anti-tank role, able to pierce most Allied tank armor with a single shot. Allied tanks learned to fear the 88 in open plains, where the German cannon could knock out Allied armor at long range before they could even close the distance. And just like we saw with the SEPs, in close quarters, the 88 was easy prey. And they even share similar anti-aircraft tactics, with rapid-fire 20mm and slower 37mm anti-aircraft guns, and slower 37mm AA guns covering those close to medium range, while the 88 picked off targets from afar, like we see with the J1s and Dwarf Spiders working together. The J1s can be seen in LEGO Star Wars The Clone Wars 3's Battlefield mode, and has been made into many LEGO sets, both official and man-made. Please hit that like button, it's the best way to help me out. But most important of all, remember, you're not getting any reinforcements until those guns are out of commission. And the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, Mena Nerds? In today's video, we're going to be talking about the DSD-1 Dwarf Spider Droid. We'll do a full breakdown of its terrifying ability, see why those in the mining profession worried that this thing would pop up out of the ground and kill them, learn how it worked and the many ways that it was used by the CIS during the Clone Wars, as well as look at some variants and behind the scenes facts. The Dwarf Spider Droid was built by Bactoid Armor Workshop, the same people that would produce the majority of the weapons, vehicles, and droids of the CIS. It would stand at a height of 1.98 meters or 6.5 feet tall, not including this large antenna, being only a few centimeters taller than a B1 battle droid. At a width of 3.05 meters or 10 feet, it was about 1.5 B1 battle droids across. And with a mass of 337 kilograms, it weighed more than 5 B1s. If it showed up here on Earth, it would be just taller than an F-150 truck, wider than a school bus, and weigh nearly as much as 2,000 Goliath Bird Eater Spiders. The Dwarf Spider Droid consists of a turret-like head with multiple infrared photoreceptors and scanners. Things like the ARC Trooper Stealth Walker might have been able to cloak their EM signature and invade these infrared scanners, but the droid also has a pair of echolocation emitters. Sound wave data cross-referenced with the IR data might have been able to detect any anomalies via cloaking or jamming tech. The DSD-1 was colloquially known as the Burrowing Spider Droid because of its terrifying ability to dig after its opponents. More on how that was used to break up the mining guild strikers in a bit. The droid used four spider-like legs for locomotion, these legs would help in movement and provide a stable platform when aiming, and even allowed it to scale some steep terrain. The Dwarf Spider droids would have masculine programming, but it wouldn't communicate via Galactic Basic, instead using a sort of binary, speaking via a series of beeps, not actual words like we hear with some battle droids and even stuff like the HMP droid gunship. The main armament of the Dwarf Spider droid would be a single heavy blaster cannon. This gun would be versatile and work against a variety of targets. Its anti-personnel firing mode would easily take out clones or enemies from afar. Its secondary firing mode would be much slower but more powerful, easily blowing through light vehicles like the ATRT, though it did only put dents in larger Republic vehicles like the ATTE. But it would even be able to shoot down aircraft, 
By dropping those back legs and giving it enough of a firing arc, we see that it had enough elevation to hit stuff like the clone gunship used by Rex, Cody, and Bad Batch on an axis. The rotation speed of the head was rather slow, and so it wouldn't be able to fight faster targets. Another flaw was that the length of the blaster cannon barrel would sometimes prevent it from turning or even maneuvering in tight spaces. The underside of the DSD was also a weak spot for explosives, but as a final attack it could initiate self-destruct, causing its generator to violently explode, vaporizing the DSD, and anyone unfortunate enough to be around it when it happened. Though sometimes this could happen from incoming attacks, which would also set off the generator and sometimes damage nearby CIS assets. Though as Wrecker shows us, if you can also block the barrel right as it fires, the attack will destroy itself without initiating the self-destruct feature. And the vibro knife carried by Hunter seems to discharge some disabling electric energy, so when stabbed through the photoreceptor, it would travel to the droid brain and shut it down. As for its history, it is actually quite the Outer Rim corporate dystopian nightmare. The DSD-1 would first be operated by the Commerce Guild in the years before the outbreak of the Clone Wars. Commerce Guild would operate many mining operations across the galaxy, and on several occasions, these miners would try to revolt. To counter this, the Commerce Guild would deploy the DSDs to enter the mines and convince everyone to get back to work. After this, it would be used in conjunction with its big brother, the OG-9 spider droid, to pay a visit to those who were trying to evade paying the Commerce Guild. Right before the outbreak of the Clone Wars, Commerce Guild would join the Confederacy of Independent Systems and provide it with their battle droids and vehicles, with these two spider droids being a main addition to the CIS vast droid collection. The DSD would first see operations during the very outbreak of the Clone Wars, in the earliest moments of the Battle of Geonosis in 22 BBY. Before the Colosseum and the main battle erupted, several DSDs were protecting multiple anti-orbital guns surrounding the Geonosian arena, and these large guns would protect the planet from capital ships in orbit. These guns and the spider droids defending them would be destroyed by Mace Windu and Luminara and Dooley, with the assistance of some TX-130 Saber tanks. Now that the clones and the rest of the Jedi could arrive on the planet, the DSDs would soon face the Republic in full force. On Geonosis, the DSDs proved their worth and were able to pick up clone troopers from many kilometers. Not only were they killing clones, but they were also helpful in pinpointing specific targets. The big antenna was relaying enemy positions and data back to command, and they would help their big brothers the OG-9s in a specific tactic. The DSDs would race out and scout ahead, but as soon as a bigger threat or overwhelming force would appear, calling in the OG-9 with its laser that could just cut through ranks of troopers, and the big gun that could punch holes in things like the ATT. After Geonosis, the DSD would be operating on numerous Separatist-controlled worlds for a variety of different purposes. In most cases, they were on the front lines with many other battle droids used by the CIS. It would be present at major battles such as Christophsis, Malastare, and many others. On Malastare, the DSDs would be lethal to the Dug mounted troops, wiping out all but one of them before they could reach the droids, only to be shot dead as he attempted to destroy them up close and personal. And in Legends, we know of their use on Munalinst, Dantooine, and Thule, just to name a few. And the Separatists would also use the DSDs on defense. On Teth, they were stationed here to defend against the ATTEs on an almost vertical cliff. Having the high ground, the Spiders had an incredible advantage and could fire on the ATTE's feet, disabling their legs and causing them to fall to their doom. Another time we see them defending the Separatist prison complex, the Citadel, on the planet Lola Seyu. But the commander of the base, O.C. Sobek, seems to prefer the similar LM-432 crab droid over the dwarf spider droid, as we only see two DSDs way off in the background, compared to the dozens if not hundreds of crab droids used on this base. Quite the opposite can be said for the Separatist base on Felucia, where a ton of DSDs are stationed to defend this base, as well as patrolling the surrounding forests. And it would also return to its roots as an anti-riot unit in service with the CIS on Reluctant Worlds. Onderon was one such world, but the Onderon rebels were able to use guerrilla warfare style tactics, and were able to best many of the dwarf spiders. Throughout the war, several variants of the DSD would be made. The first is the amphibious version developed for the swamplands, marshes, and other wet environments, and could actually operate underwater. This type's blaster cannon seems to be bigger than the normal version, although whether if this is because it is a stronger gun or just something to do with it being able to operate underwater is unknown. This type was used during the later stages of the Battle of Kashyyyk against the Republic and the native Wookiees. These last two variants are now legends, but they are some of the coolest ones. There was the heavy dwarf spider droid, which now had three of those heavy blaster cannons. It also had some sort of apparatus on its back, which we don't know exactly what it was, but it was most likely some sort of upgraded power generator to support the additional firepower. This type saw use at the Battle of Geonosis, where it was extremely effective against infantry. The last type was the Advanced Dwarf Spider Droid, or ADSD. This type was heavily redesigned, and included many more enhancements. 
additional armor plating on its legs, a top-mounted turret with explosive blast rounds, and an ability to fight in complete darkness, along with linked missile launchers, made this a much deadlier version over your standard DSD. The Clone Commando Delta Squad would face this type on numerous occasions, and Captain Rex even faced one of these as well. And believe it or not, the ADSD was actually available before the Clone Wars, where it was also used in the same anti-riot duty, but of course more reserved when those rioters acquired some heavy ordnance. When the time came to join the CIS, the ADSD was also added, but sparingly due to its high costs. When the time came for the Clone Wars to end with the execution of Order 66, all of the droids used by the CIS would be ordered to shut down. This is true in canon at least, but the DSD has a special story in Legends. Initially, they were shut down like the rest, but a few years into the Imperial era, the Empire began recommissioning the DSDs into Imperial service, and they were first put to use against their former masters, with the Imperials sicking them on newly captured Separatist worlds. While other DSDs were sent to many training centers across the galaxy, allowing many stormtroopers to train against this Clone Wars terror. While others almost became a sort of Imperial attack dog, where they would be used in stormtrooper squads to be sent in against rebels that were held up in a building or cave system, or would be alongside them when out on patrol. So that's it for its history and breakdown, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. The Dwarf Spider Droid is created for Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Originally, all of the different Separatist groups were just going to be painted the same B1 battle droid color, but this was later changed to make the droid army more unique, with each faction having this assemblage of different droids. The Advanced Dwarf Spider Droid was created for the Republic Commando video game, and the Heavy DSD was created for the Clone Campaign's expansion pack for Star Wars Battlegrounds. Additional information comes from the Visual Dictionaries, Complete Locations, Essential Guide to Droids, Encyclopedias of Starfighters and Other Vehicles, and Ultimate Star Wars. But most important of all, remember, if your Union rep doesn't have a plan for killing the burrowing spider robot that shoots lasers out of its face and calls for an even bigger spider friend, then just get another job. And the Force will be with you, always. What's up, Meta Nerds? Today we're going to take a closer look at the rarely seen, yet instantly iconic ride of the Separatist's most feared commander, General Grievous. We'll look into what history we have, how this mechanical monster would look in our world, and how a mineral miner from a long-lost Star Wars series may have been the inspiration for this beast. Fresh off the assembly lines of Argao at Z Gomo Turnbull Gupat Corporation, a manufacturer owned and operated by our favorite mutants at the Intergalactic Banking Clan, the Sumu 6 Personal Wheel Bike is the not-so-catchy design name for what we commonly refer to as the Grievous Wheel Bike. Brand new, this thing is going to cost you 15,000 credits, which is quite a steal in the galaxy far, far away. Price cheaper than the expendable Vulture Droid, and even less than a single Droidica. Not only is it a swift and powerful vehicle when in wheel mode, but it doubles as a walker, with four sprawling legs armed with a terrain claw at the end. This baby is able to spring into action at a moment's notice, grip onto any terrain you might come across. While on its wheels, this ride is only 2.5 meters tall, or roughly 8 and a quarter feet, meaning it's only a Yoda taller than your standard school bus. When in walker mode, the wheel bike stands at a more imposing 3.9 meters tall, or just about 13 feet, making it a Jawa taller than a hoop in the NBA. What it lacked in sheer imposing size, however, it more than makes up for in speed. When rolling down the Powan Freeway at full speed, this bike can reach 330 kilometers per hour. That's 205 miles per hour, which begs the question, what are they feeding the Veractyls if good old Bogo was able to keep up with it? To put that in the real world perspective, NASCAR drivers average about 200 miles per hour, and they don't have to worry about driving off 30 story cliffs, into a sinkhole, dodging shots from Cody's finest, all while being chased by the sassiest Jedi in the Order. On its legs, in walker mode, it only manages to have a top speed of 10 kilometers per hour, being around 6 miles per hour, and quite the anticlimactic stat. That's why Grievous was so quick to get this thing rolling. We can see the activation panel the general uses to fire up his wheels, with five hinged toggles and a vibrant display, and being open and easy to get into. It appears to be controlled by a set of handlebars, making it a simple enough to control system for any normal humanoid to operate. And that was the idea, as although the Smooth 6 was originally designed as a military scouting vehicle, it eventually found itself being sold to civilians on the racing scene. You can see the Munes were playing to multiple markets, not just in galaxy-spanning wars, but even in wheel bike design. Grievous did make some modifications himself, as the wheel bike was sold as a two-seater, with a pilot and a passenger, making sure there was absolutely no chance he would have a B1 passenger. Grievous disposed of the sidecar feature entirely, favoring instead the ND-53 double laser cannon. Even if his bike was mainly used as an escape craft, it never hurt to pack a punch on the way out. 
And while we never get to see this cannon fire in any media thus far, it could be speculated that aside from the offensive capability, it could be used to blow holes through any obstacles in the general's path of retreat for some real Batmobile action. Now, of course, the Clone Wars only came about by having both sides base their lies and half-truths, the CIS only talking about Republic corruption and apathy toward crime, and the Republic only focusing on greedy corporations. Nobody working to solve both issues, just shouting how the other side was wrong. In a genius move by the Munes, this vehicle doesn't use standard fuel, but instead has capacitors built into the chain that made up the wheels. Let's dive into a cross-section to explain what exactly is happening here. As you can see, links within the wheels store energy that is used to fire the main cannon, as well as motivate the legs. To stay stable, this vehicle uses a gyroscopic system. Think of a fancy pool table on a cruise ship, moving effortlessly with the waves to make everything stable. Being a speed demon didn't leave much room for cargo, only supporting 10 kilograms or just 22 pounds of supplies. Being the predominant craft of a cyborg has its advantages. So instead of packing a handmade lunch with a note from Count Dooku, Grievous packed a few more surprises into his wheel bike. Never too far from the good general was his trusty Electro Staff, as well as his DT-57 Annihilator, a blaster rifle only ever seen in the cold grasp of Grievous, and, well, one other guy. So uncivilized. That does it for the specs on this thing, so let's get into its history. We only ever see this model of machine used once for any significant reason, that being the famed Battle of Utapau. Moments before the galaxy was changed forever with Order 66, Obi-Wan Kenobi's mission to destroy the droid's general was underway. Playing to Grievous's ego, Obi-Wan baited Grievous into a lightsaber duel for the ages, in front of an audience of battle droids. The two longtime enemies clashed blades for what would have been their final time. Kenobi got the upper hand, pun intended, by severing several of the cyborg's cybernetic limbs, before the clones of the 212th descended from the skies looking to finally end the conflict. Following a focused force push, Grievous had felt the tides of battle shift and followed his oldest tactic of running away as fast as he could, scurrying across the gantry like a roach that just won't die. Grievous was able to climb into his wheel bike and roar off the platform, nearly flattening Kenobi beneath those engineering marvels of the wheel teeth. Zooming through the traffic of battle, Grievous atop his bike plowed through droid and clone alike, only caring for his own survival, ripped straight from the pages of his classic military guidebook. The wheel bike quickly shifted to its legs, leaping onto the docked control ship's outer hull and rolling down the side to escape his nemesis. These moments show the real versatility of this machine, making it perfect for situations just like this. No wonder Grievous had three of them on the planet, presumably strategically placed throughout the Separatist compound. With Kenobi hot on his tail, Grievous raced through Pal City, getting far away from the main battle raging on the many platforms. With Solus One not far away, Obi-Wan managed to catch up to Grievous despite the head start. Kenobi at his side, Grievous decided to break out his arsenal, trying to zap Kenobi off the boga with a few well-placed shocks from the Electro Staff's purple beams. But the Jedi proved too clever, wrestling the staff from Grievous's grip and smashing it into the teeth of the bike, even knocking a few off. Seeing his bike starting to take damage, Grievous snagged the staff once more, and a tug-of-war ensued, with the general's strength proving too much for the wily Jedi Master. Banking around the dirt road corners of the city, two enemies entwined and fighting for their lives, General Grievous reached out for his hidden annihilator hoping to get a lucky shot off right into Obi-Wan's head. But as we all know, luck would not be on his side. Being thrown off the bike alongside his most hated rival, Grievous barely made it off in time to avoid cascading down into the miles-deep sinkhole alongside his trusty metal steed. Ironically, had the blaster stayed aboard the bike, it is highly possible Grievous would have killed Kenobi at long last, as the rifle wouldn't have been on the platform to begin with, and cowardly Grievous wouldn't have met his fiery end. While this is the end of the infamous General's most trusted ride, it appears to have had a legacy in the far-off reaches of the galaxy, on the mining colony of Teens Horky. A young man by the name of Jan Tosh used a very similar craft known as the 48 Roller Wheel Bike. And although this particular vehicle was not a direct follow-up of the Gupat Corporation, being made instead by the Gallus Tech Corporation, it seems safe to say that whoever was working on this had heard some stories about the Clone Wars, about the many battles, and heard of Grievous and his sick set of wheels. That wraps up the history, let's explore the many behind-the-scenes facts about this metal marvel. Making its debut in the Revenge of the Sith Jr. novelization, and then of course the movie itself, somehow this brief yet amazing chase scene is all that we get to see of Grievous' wheel bike, despite the general being in so many books, TV shows, games, and other forms of media. It's said to have been in The Force Unleashed, but I couldn't find it. Perhaps it was too hard to animate, but even when given a chance to use this vehicle in the Clone Wars, 
Filoni's team opted for the new combat speeder. While interesting in its own right, it would have been nice to see Grievous utilize such a recognizable part of his arsenal. And I say recognizable because despite only appearing in this part of the film, the Grievous wheel bike has made many appearances in various toy lines. Multiple Lego sets, and all new, albeit similar designs of the Clone Wars toy line, and even a Transformer version have all seen their way into collections of fans all over the world. Bafflingly, the original Hasbro toy has the pilot seat on the wrong side. Maybe it was a concept art given by Lucasfilm that ended up being switched in the final product, but there's never been a clear answer. Original concept ideas for Revenge of the Sith has the wheel bike being more like a sentient mount for Grievous, as a synthetic counter to the animal mount Obi-Wan rides. The strikingly similar 48-wheel roller made its debut into the droids cartoon series in 1985. And while never confirmed, I find it highly likely that somewhere within the Lucasfilm think tank, someone had a passing memory of this oft-forgotten vehicle while designing the new version for Grievous. In fact, there's been a bunch of similarities like this, with names, designs, and story beats from droids making it into the mainline films. Even my favorite, Kaibo Ren. No one stops Kaibo Ren! Blast them! Another potential inspiration for the wheel bike is the Spider-Man villain Big Wheel. Jackson Wheel, real name, became the pilot of a giant wheel vehicle to take on his foe at the time, Rocket Racer. Just looking at this image, it's easy to make the comparison between the obscure 70s Marvel villain and our beloved cyborg's pimped out ride. The Mono Wheel is a real world translation of this iconic Star Wars ship, though lacking the legs or laser cannon. It's fascinating to see that even in sketches from the 1860s, this concept has been rattling around in the minds of inventors, though it may be some time before our real world counterpart can blaze past us at 200 miles per hour. So that's it for General Grievous' wheel bike. But most important of all, remember, if you're gonna drag race, always pick the Varactyl and family. And the Force will be with you. Always. I want lightning up here now! Here comes the cavalry. What's up, Meta Nerds? Today we're going to be taking a detailed look at the Republic's all terrain recon transport, aka the ATRT. We'll be pulling from both legends and canon to see how these versatile walkers were used to great effect by the clone army, continued to see deployment into the Imperial era, and even beyond. The all terrain reconnaissance transport, Republic Scout Walker, or all terrain recon transport, known simply as the ATRT, was the bipedal walker striding off the assembly line at Kuat Drive Yards, the main source of all the Republic's ground vehicles. Part of their lauded all terrain line, the ATRT is a single man vehicle that cost anywhere between 8,000 and 20,000 credits, and stood a mere 3.4 meters in height. At only 1.5 Wookiees tall, it was one of the smallest walkers to ever stomp off a of Kuat. But as a wise Muppet once said, Size matters not. Because although it's not as imposing as the ATTE or even the ATAP, what it lacks in intimidation, it more than makes up for in speed and maneuverability. Able to reach top speeds of 75 kilometers per hour, or roughly 46 miles per hour, this thing can not just walk like its bigger brothers, but full-on sprint into combat, leaping over explosions, tough terrain, and even evading blaster bolts being fired from across the battlefront. Often deployed in packs, it's rare to see less than four per squad, and for major engagements, dozens could be bounding across the war-torn front to attack the enemy, like what we see on Umbara. This comparably small frame comes with more deployment options as well, with a single rider able to be dropped by an LAAT gunship without requiring a landing, and you can even march a pair of walkers across the battlefront in safety by packing them into the ATTE until you felt safe enough to use these swift little recon walkers, unfolding similar to the B1 out of an MTT, and jumping into combat like what we see on Ryloth. It's not all positives, however, with no shielding. You just get the metal armor plating protecting the pilot's lower half, the thin legs, a single but heavy repeating blaster cannon, and a very exposed driver, all meant the ATRT couldn't be used by any shiny fresh off a of Camino. So enter the advanced recon force trooper. Did the kidnapper see you? No, sir. We're the best scouts in the regiment. Better known as the ARF Trooper, these clones were trained to make the best use out of these machines, minimizing its notable flaws by making use of numbers and speed, almost always with deadly results. Let's take a look at the tactics used during the liberation of Ryloth and what made the boys in Lightning Squad so effective. Descending from an ATTE by order of Jedi General Mace Windu, at least five scout walkers came barreling to the rescue after the droid army pinned down the clone's heavy walkers on this narrow path. Led by Windu and Commander Pons, the scout walkers used their incredible agility to close the gap between themselves and the enemy's several AATs in a remarkably quick time, dodging bolts and leaping clear over explosions. All the training the ARFs received on those augmented reality battlefronts in the bowels of Kamino really paid off when a trooper was able to throw a thermal detonator right below the main barrel of the Separatist tank. 
After thinning the herd, the rest of the squads surrounding the remaining tanks were incredibly precise in their aim, targeting the tank's weakness and blasting them to scrap. We also see how accurate the main gun of the walker is, with Mace able to decapitate the droid commander. Although designed to take on infantry, the main gun of the ATRT was an extreme threat to larger vehicles when multiple walkers could focus their fire. We see this strategy used again on Umbara to a similar effect, with dozens of speedy walkers being dropped into the battlefront amidst a rain of heavy artillery fire. Weaving through the bright green bolts on this darkened hellscape of a planet, the ARFs of Anakin's 501st found success getting to the Umbaran machines, once again overwhelming them with a barrage of cannon fire. These light walkers were also perfect for urban missions, as seen during the Battle of Kiros. With the 501st galloping into battle atop their walkers, blasting droids through the more settled villages once inhabited by the Togruta. Backing up the even faster BARC speeder bikes, the recon walkers made short work of the droids along the way. The walkers were then used by Anakin and Ahsoka to quickly survey the surrounding area for bombs planted by slaver Darts Dinar. And it's in this search that we get a good look at the sensor system on the main viewing screen of the walkers console. This is a scout vehicle, first and foremost after all, so a state-of-the-art sensor system was a must. Thanks to the sprinting capability of these walkers, Anakin and Ahsoka were able to stop any more damage from being done by the Zygerian scum. Racing back to assist Obi-Wan, we get a great example of all the power in those legs. Anakin and his Padawan launched themselves into the air atop their walkers to get close to the escaping ship. This burst gave them enough distance to be able to summon the Force and finish off this maneuver and land on Dinar's ship, leading to some uh, aggressive negotiations. Where are they? It should be noted how some squads customized their rides similar to their armor. With the 501st painting their mounts blue, bearing the name of their legion, and with Razor and Stack of Lightning Squadron painting theirs with Arabish letters B, E, and A. Despite all my digging, I couldn't find any specific meaning. We'll just have to email Filoni to get to the bottom of this. As the war raged on into its final months, we see the ARF trooper replaced by the less creatively named ATRT driver. It isn't made clear if these troops are a completely different branch of the GAR or simply the next evolution of the ARF. And this could be hinted at the design of Hound, an ARF trooper sergeant stationed on Coruscant, whose helmet bears more of a similar style to that of the ATRT driver, but that's purely speculation. The scout walkers were present on Kashyyyk when Order 66 came down, and despite the ordeal giving Commander Grieg quite a headache, his men were seen using now Imperial ATRTs to hunt down Yoda, and would be immediately turned to enforce obedience from the Wookiee people. Using the nimble walkers to quickly spread through the jungles and Wookiee cities, the first moves of what would turn this entire planet into a slave camp. Shown with their bright searchlight, and we even see how it works as a weapon rack for the driver's rifles, this squad came across a downed Wookiee flyer, immediately spreading out to pursue and capture any survivors. Even though the Empire was known to dismantle and quickly replace the Republic's war machines, it did hang on to the ATRT. Legends has it that a few of these walkers were used during Operation Nightfall, with some even being left behind to guard the ravaged temple in case of any Jedi return. The clones of Lightning Squad, now Stormtroopers, were also allowed to continue use of their walkers. Many were even used as policing vehicles, at least according to former Imperial, now Rebel, and totally not with a fake beard, Crix Madine. Eventually, the Empire did phase this nimble vehicle out of the frontline combat role, in favor of the ATDP and ATST. I suppose the smaller ATRT didn't quite fit into the Tarkin Doctrine. Not scary and far too cheap and practical. Like with most vehicles, the Rebel Alliance is also said to have gotten their hands on a few, making some modifications to the weaponry, deciding to forego the repeating blaster for either a flamethrower or a Z6 rotary cannon, like the kind used by Heavy. These walkers proved popular, as some were even being used as late as 34 ABY by the First Order on Planet 4 Dan, which makes these little guys one of the longest living walkers in the galaxy. That covers the history of the ATRT, but let's dive into some behind the scenes facts. The ATRT was designed by concept artist TK Frame for Revenge of the Sith, but it first appeared in Clone Wars, the 2003 Cartoon Network show by Gendy Tartakovsky, specifically in Chapter 22. After Anakin and Obi-Wan lower the shields surrounding the Separatist compound, Commander Cody sends in dozens of ATRTs to provide backup to his infantry and air support. It's always interesting to see how many characters and vehicles so synonymous with Revenge of the Sith appeared first in this Clone Wars show. As the lead-in meant to hype the movie, it felt like a VIP sneak peek for us that saw it live. The ATRT appears in several video games, with perhaps its most notable appearance in both the classic and rebooted Battlefront 2. With it supporting a grenade launcher in the classic, though it was much slower than depicted now. It also appears in the Force Unleashed, but only the Nintendo DS version. According to the script for Revenge of the Sith, the ATRT was supposed to play a more significant role. Yoda would distract a group of now villainous clones, only for Chewie to pull the pilot from its saddle and take command of the walker, in a callback to Return of the Jedi. I'm always down for more Revenge of the Sith, but I think it's not a bad omission. The Tarzan scream from the Battle of Kashyyyk works better as a far more subtle homage to Chewbacca's ATST takeover. 
ATRT also has been a popular toy for both Hasbro and LEGO to produce over these years, with 10 separate models by LEGO since 2005, and Hasbro joining in on many releases in both the Clone Wars figure line and, of course, the basic figure line for Revenge of the Sith. The first release of the Recon Walker was even motorized, though maybe not hitting those 46 mile an hour top speeds. Even Hot Toys is getting in on the fun with the 501st variant of the Walker and ARF Trooper heading to market. Despite its limited screen time, the ATRT is proving to have a lasting impact on the Star Wars fandom. Let me know what you think of it down in the comments. But most important of all, remember, never look a gift walker in the cannon, and the Force will be with you, always. A walker with sound dampening, thermal and electronic cloaking, and a stealth system that is usually reserved for starfighters. What's up, Meta Nerds? This video is going to be a short spotlight about a vehicle that most people have never heard about. The All-Terrain Force Reconnaissance Walker, the AT-FRC. This comes from the Legend Sourcebook Lead by Example, where we get a ton of cool details. It was made during the Clone Wars and designed as an improvement on the AT-RT. It ended up being about midway in size between the RT and the AT-ST, and is said to have a similar speed. So around 90 km per hour or 56 miles per hour, almost twice as fast as the Armored Assault Tank. Like all the walkers, it was manufactured by Kuat Drive Yards, and despite all of its tech, it only cost 75,000 credits. Designed to be used by the ARC Troopers, it is specialized around stealth and efficient target elimination. Two ARC Troopers would be seated in the cockpit, with the driver slash gunner seated up high and towards the rear, and the dedicated reconnaissance systems operator seated lower and towards the front. His job was to use the state-of-the-art Fabritech Longview 341A sensor array to pick up on enemy comms and communicate that data back to HQ. This whole system was highly encrypted, and it is believed that the CIS never cracked this code throughout the war. They were never able to detect the intrusion. But in addition to concealing its comm presence, it also went through insane lengths to hide its physical presence as well. First off is the active sound baffling system, which was able to cancel out the noise of the engine and drive servos. This tech is similar to noise-canceling headphones and even technology in some cars, using speakers to send out the opposite of the waveform that was created by this walker stomping around. This minimizes the net sound wave. Then it had a dual thermal-slash-EMP dampening system that was able to conceal some of the energy emissions, perhaps through a similar system sending out opposing electromagnetic waves. Then just to top it all off, there was an optical camouflage system. We have seen some personal cloaking devices that make you invisible to the eye, and you can also see them on larger ships like the prototype stealth ship, and starfighters like the TIE Phantom and the Scimitar. But with this walker purpose-built for ARC Troopers, we get what I believe is the only invisible walker. Keep in mind that because it could also cloak its thermal and electronic signature, and the fact that you can barely hear it stomping around, then the ATFRC is almost completely undetectable. You can use thermal imaging to pick up a cloaked ship or person with a cloaked device, but that wouldn't work so well with this walker. So it's got its defense covered, but it also has some powerful offensive capabilities. A chin-mounted ball turret double-barreled auto blaster is designed to quickly rip through troops, and a rapid-fire concussion grenade launcher can blow apart light armor in seconds. So as you can see, this thing is mostly designed for reconnaissance deep behind enemy lines, and for eliminating any scouts or lookouts that may have discovered it. If it detected larger tanks or other heavy armor, it would most likely just try and remain undetected and collect intel for other Republic forces. Some other interesting features is that if the reconnaissance system operator was ever incapacitated, the driver can take control of all the systems. And this walker contains an additional customizable hardpoint, allowing Republic forces to attach mission-specific hardware to the ATFRC. All considered, it's a shame that we didn't see more of this stealth walker that was specifically designed for the elite ARC troopers. It would live on into Imperial service as well, but the exact amount that survived decommission is unknown. But most important of all, remember, this is what happens when you let ARC troopers pimp your walker. And the Force will be with you. Always. Concentrate fire on the center of the storm! When all subtlety has gone out the window and you need to break through the heaviest defenses, look no further than the awe-inspiring power of the at, -AT. What's up, Meta Nerds? In this complete breakdown of the all-terrain armored transport, we're pulling from both legends and canon sources, talking about its stats, capabilities, and role in the battlefield. Sit back, relax, and get ready for a tale that stretches all the way from Jabim to Jakku. The all-terrain armored transport serves as the mainstay of Imperial assaults on the most heavily defended positions, towering over the battlefront and delivering lethal salvos of laser fire. 
this hulking walker stood at an intimidating 22.5 meters, essentially a reinforced troop compartment atop a quarter of powerful legs, with a head-like command module mounted on the front, bearing the walker's weaponry and sensor systems. It carried up to 40 troops, plus additional equipment on a two-tiered transport deck, and was extremely well-armored, impervious to all but the heaviest attacks. So let's look at every system, but like all good breakdowns, we'll start with the armament. The heaviest weaponry of the walker is carried directly below the chin, coming in the form of two Tamenback MS-1 heavy laser cannons. These cannons were extremely powerful, capable of dealing with ground targets such as medium tanks and heavily protected bunkers with ease, and at a range of up to 17 kilometers. That's over 10 miles. These cannons were fire-linked, offering a pair of modes, both single and dual fire in conjunction, all with firing data from the cockpit. In some AT-ATs, these Tamenbacks were switched with the MK-3EW heavy laser cannons, which bore a no less destructive reputation. These were fixed, although the head could swivel on the move to engage targets in a deceptively broad 180 degree field of fire. The heavy cannons were augmented by a pair of FF-4 medium repeating blaster cannons, positioned in a swivel mount on each cheek of the command module. These cannons, with their even broader field of fire and independent adjustability, could engage lighter ground vehicles, installations, and even airspeeders. Their built-in rangefinder afforded them independent accuracy against such secondary targets, picking off positions to clear the main cannons to engage the heaviest targets. In some AT-ATs, these FF-4s were replaced by MK-2EW medium blaster cannons, and these variations seemed to depend on the factory line from which they were produced. While the AT-AT could dish out considerable damage, it could also take return fire exceedingly well, being one of the most well-protected vehicles in the Empire's service. Dense 9095 T8511 grade Durasteel armor plated the entirety of this massive war machine, thick enough to be invulnerable to most weaponry. During the Battle of Hoth, rebel forces turned P-Tower anti-vehicle emplacements against these walkers, and even though they could penetrate the armor of ATSTs and repulsor tanks, they had no effect on this walker's legs. Three ATTE rounds at point-blank range likewise failed to even dent the heavy armor of this walker. In another impressive feat, a volley of four proton torpedoes from the Ghost failed to halt the advance of another ATAT -AT on Sphirna. They were simply impervious to most weaponry, its armor harmlessly dissipating attacks, which was necessary to move them through heavily defended lines, breaching the enemy's perimeter, and delivering their onboard infantry to their targets. Mines, likewise, were virtually useless, the heavy Durasteel foot pads simply muffling the blasts, and the armored belly of the vehicle being too high to be impacted by such explosions, a notable design improvement from the ATT. Only concentrated heavy artillery or ground fire from tanks and heavy guns was capable of bringing down this walker in conventional combat. This durability was so considerable that perhaps its greatest attribute was its psychological effect, invoking terror and making the rebels feel impotent, with a single walker being able to snuff out the sparks of rebellion in cities all across the galaxy. Of course, this is also what made the Jedi invaluable to the Rebel Alliance. If you could get close in with a lightsaber, like Kanan Jarrus on Sphirna, or Luke Skywalker on Hoth, then any AT-AT will be in for a bad time. While the walker was durable and lethal, it was also very top-heavy with its weight concentrated on the upper third of the AT-AT above its towering legs. To guarantee the stability of the walker as well as accuracy on the move, the gate of the AT-AT was carefully managed. Impulse terrain sensors on each foot pad worked in conjunction with ground-penetrating radar scans in order to give the pilots in the cockpit an expert view of the terrain ahead. While moving, the pilots enjoyed a 3D understanding of the ground beyond the walker, including factors such as density and composition of the soil, rock, earth, or snow. This combination of excellent sensors allowed it to operate in a number of environments, including through water and amid deep snow, without concern for losing its footing from sudden pitfalls or unexpectedly loose rock or soil. It definitely lived up to the all-terrain reputation of their line, surprising opposing forces when moving through rugged ground and giving Imperial commanders greater approach options. Of course, it should technically be called the most terrain's armored transport, as there were still certain environments that it was just unsuitable for, such as extremely steep hillsides, and even deep bogs and swamps could arrest the vehicle's motion, and certainly couldn't crawl up sheer cliff walls or hang upside down like its beloved Republic predecessor. But the walker's considerable height also proved an advantage in easily passing over trench lines, non-explosive anti-tank obstacles, and had the sheer power to just smash through buildings and anything built up to try and stop it. Enemy vehicles in defilade or behind cover that might not be seen with visual sensors could be detected by its other sensors like the radar, 
and the ATAT -AT drivers would be sure to rain down fire from above. But it wasn't exactly a stealth vehicle, as just the motion from the impact of the foot pads would shake the ground with such force that it was noticeable kilometers away. But again, especially under the Tarkin Doctrine, this was seen as mostly a plus, just another way to strike terror in civilians and break the ranks of rebels, as the torturous booms slowly increased in strength, giving a young rebel plenty of time to go home and rethink his life. Armies could throw all their weaponry at the AT-AT -AT battle line, only to watch it be harmlessly absorbed, combine that with the psychological terror, and you'll understand why the Battle of Hoth was such a moral victory for the Rebel Alliance, as it was the first major battle where these were taken down. Rex, Wolf, Gregor, and the Spectres did have some luck against these, but that was before the official start of the Galactic Civil War. It was on an obscure world, where the resistance and successful evacuation at Hoth would be a story told throughout the galaxy. The vehicle's weapons and motion was powered by a reactor system of two Kuat Drive Yards FW-62 compact fusion drive systems. These drive systems, while powerful, could overload if breached and detonated. With this power, the heavy AT-AT could move at a considerable 60 km per hour, or 37 miles per hour, although that is on the best conditions on the most suitable terrain. Three fuel slug tanks at the rear of the vehicle provided a continual power feed into the reactor. Being a solid form of fuel, think of the little pellets in a pellet grill, and this area was the most well protected, with extra plating of that special durasteel armor to increase the walker's survivability. The head in which the command cabin was located contained the main crew, with a surprisingly low number of just three individuals. Two pilots, specially trained and drawn from the grueling selection process of already proven veterans, crewed the vehicle and fired its armaments. They were directed by a vehicle commander with access to a periscope and additional command and control communications. AT-AT crews developed a close connection with their vehicles and were encouraged to consider themselves as an extension of their vehicle and vice versa, often personally overseeing maintenance on these machines. AT-AT pilots wore helmets and suits which directly interfaced with the computers of the walker, like an augmented reality system, giving them a level of control like you might see in a fighter jet. Uses six electro-optical sensors giving the pilot an unprecedented 360 degrees of situational awareness. The pilot can actually look through the aircraft itself. Those sensors giving them a simulated 360 degree field of vision, as well as the vehicle's vitals. How's our hull looking? Badly damaged. We're at 70% integrity and in falling. Like electrical systems and fuel reserves. Wearing their full armor and helmet gave crews additional protection in the case of a breach and did have some protection against radiation and fire. Unsurprisingly, AT-AT pilots considered themselves and their vehicles to be invulnerable and gained a reputation for possibly well-deserved arrogance. Two additional deck officers oversaw the troop compartment, allowing the pilot and crew to focus on their primary duties. For all that firepower and capability, it was not a tank. Its primary purpose was to deliver infantry rather than slug it out with enemy vehicles. That was left for purpose-built Imperial walkers and repulsor craft, and its 40 troops were typically either stormtroopers or Imperial army assault troopers, especially trained in deployment from this unique beast. A boom system could either drop the troops into combat directly from the belly, going out in several rapid waves, or the walker could kneel and the troops could disembark via a boarding ramp. In case of a breach, the onboard personnel could try and get out through a pair of escape hatches, one on each side of the compartment, to ensure that no matter which side the walker fell on, there was always a route to escape from the vehicle. Before deployment, troops were secured in two rows of seats, two on each deck, with a padded crash belt locking them into place, so injuries from impacts or a fall would be minimized. There's a clever design built into these benches that would wirelessly charge the packs and suits of storm and snow troopers. A combat speeder bike garage at the AT-AT's rear held up to five speeders. These were typically deployed after the AT-AT had broken through enemy lines, released all its troops, and were now hunting down survivors. Once deployed via a harness system from the rear of the walker, the speeders would ferret out resistance, lay sensors or mines, and serve as scouts and pickets for the main assault force. The speeders were noted to well complement the plotting AT-ATs, screening and scouting for its parent vehicle, which could carry two disassembled ATSTs. And in addition to all that, the supplementary cargo capacity was measured at one ton, a little more than one dewback. The lumbering walkers required massive transports to bring them from their orbiting motherships down to the planetary battlefield. In most deployments, AT-ATs would be brought down singularly or in pairs aboard sizable Theta-class dropships. Although when deployed from the Dreadnought-sized vehicles, they could be brought down four at a time aboard Y-85 Titans. They could also be dropped directly into combat via Gazanti-class cruisers two at a time, going into action immediately and giving them a surprising degree of operational mobility. 
though they were typically deployed for ground assaults from orbit by large dropships. Walkers stationed within super-class warships, such as the Executor-class Star Dreadnought, were delivered to planetary surfaces within the previously mentioned Y-85. Smaller starships, such as the Imperial-class Star Destroyer, deployed single or paired walkers via the Theta-class, while other designs, including the Telgorn Corporation Warlord dropship, were capable of delivering an armored platoon of four walkers directly into battle zones as well. And sometimes they weren't even filled with troops, this whole space was filled with war materiel meant to reinforce some outposts. When deployed, they would often be in staggered formation, providing overlapping fields of fire. As you see, you can get that arc way above 180 degrees, and the pilots would work in synchrony with each other to methodically destroy enemy emplacements, especially useful since the walker contained no aft-mounted weaponry. This is why we often see them flanked by ATSTs or repulsor tanks, being able to fall back and let their big brother take out any anti-tank weaponry the enemy might have, while keeping security and making sure the enemy didn't ambush them from the rear. Now he mentioned it survived that attack from the Ghost, but with its enormous size it was pretty hard to miss and vulnerable to all form of aerial attack. There are many times where this walker has a TIE fighter escort, just to make sure they weren't bombed out by some old refurbished Y-Wing. A properly coordinated AT-AT advance would be a frightening spectacle of combined arms. And while some rebel propaganda, especially after Hoth, like to portray this thing as a big lumbering dope, stupidly designed with a limited field of fire, and easy to topple, they and the Empire knew that the truth was that when used correctly, this was one of the most effective pieces in the entire military. In fact, it's none of these supposedly obvious design flaws that are actually considered flaws by the engineers or the rebels, as they knew the real move was to sneak into this thing, taking advantage of its small crew, or be lucky enough to be able to get a shot onto its neck tube, which couldn't be rigidly covered in that plate armor since it had to be flexible to move side to side. And of course, the genius tactic of using tow cables mounted aboard converted T-47 airspeeders was a form of rebel guerrilla tactics that you just can't plan for. Turning to their history, they were deployed in their prototype stage as early as the Battle of Jabim in the midst of the Clone Wars, where they proved their effectiveness by remaining mobile amid the planet's thick mud, while vaporizing Separatist war machines such as the OG-9 homing spiders and hail fires with ease. These early models with their squared off cargo compartments nonetheless fell to the wayside due more to the Republic's devastating defeat than their own performance. The innovative General Maximilian Veers championed the AT-AT concept and brought it into service as a mainstay of Imperial forces after the Battle of Yavin, where it became the war machine we all know and fear. It fought off a rebel incursion on Karida itself, where its potential to be tripped and disabled first became known. Production was seen on many major Imperial factory worlds, such as Balmara and of course Kuat. In true Imperial fashion, they made sure to modify them to take over the galaxy, being viable on any terrain with a wide variety of more esoteric variants, which is going to get its own video coming soon, as there are just so many variants to try and fit in here. Some of these that were after Endor came with mounted turbo lasers, ion cannons, thicker plate armor, and even an aquatic swimmer version, so all that's going to be in the next breakdown. AT-AT saw use as late as 130 ABY in Legends by Darth Krait's Galactic Empire, in both their standard version and AT-AHT upgrade and as late as 34 ABY by the First Order in a modernized variant alongside the Titanic ATM-6. It's a truly iconic vehicle, doing everything from shooting a Force deity in the sky at the Battle of Adalon to serving as Rey's home as a rusted hulk in the deserts of Jakku. Now they were of course not for private sale, but if you could get the right credentials and 150,000 credits, one of these devastating weapons of war could be yours. Just make sure you stock up on fuel pellets too. If an AT-AT existed in real life, it'd be about as tall as a semi-truck laid vertically, and as long as two school buses or five Volkswagen Beetles. They would tower over the Hollywood sign in Los Angeles, coming in at one and a half times its height, while dwarfing everything else on the battlefront, being longer than two AATs or Rebel Repulsor tanks, while being nearly as tall as three Hailfire droids or two of its predecessors, the ATT. If you didn't have a grapple hook, but you could clone Yoda, you'd have to balance 34 of them on top of each other to reach the top of the stooped cockpit. Although in the right art style, I'm sure he could topple one with the wave of his hand. Now for some cool facts and behind the scenes stuff. The actual size of the AT-AT has been a source of drama in the Star Wars community for as long as The Empire Strikes Back has been out. Radio dramatization, source books, West End RPG guides, and independent articles have given a range of heights from 33 feet to 55 feet, 
Curtis Saxton, Lord of Star Wars Visual Dictionaries, has given the most popularly accepted answer of 22.5 meters. Carefully measuring Luke's height compared to the AT-AT he destroyed with the handy combination of lightsaber and concussion grenade. George Lucas's inspiration for the AT-ATs were the towering Martian tripods from H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds. While also specific design inspiration came from the giant maneuvering cranes that he would see in the port of Oakland as well as a cancelled US Army prototype meant to be used in Vietnam. Just imagine that thing. And of course, there's tons of debate on how to pronounce it. You've heard me use both in this video, but I'm sure there'll be a war in the comments that'll make Palpatine proud over whether you say ATAT -AT or just at at. Bring your best case argument down below. Its role in the battlefield is more akin to IFVs, infantry fighting vehicles, which are designed to drop off a load of infantry and support them while they advance towards the enemy. Unlike IFVs, of course, they can destroy the heaviest armor that comes to face them, so it's a mix of a main battle tank and IFV rolled into one. It seems that in every Star Wars video game, role-playing game, and book, someone just has to hijack an AT-AT to complete their objective. From Cal Kestis seizing one to help Saul Guerrero's partisans on Kashyyyk, to escorting a captured rebel at at in Star Wars Battlefront 2. Aiden Versio captures one in the game's main campaign, and during the liberation of Kashyyyk, a Wookiee named Karatha one-ups Chewbacca's ATST hijack, commandeering an entire at at mid-battle. Just remember, if you intend to board an at at, wait for the 40 troopers to deploy, and then just take out the dorks in AR helmets. That's it for the breakdown, and most important of all, remember, the ground booming from the footsteps of an ATAT -AT means you do have some time to rethink your decision, but do it fast because they can shoot you from 10 miles away. And the Force will be with you. Always. Holding position. What's up, Mena Nerds? Today we'll be breaking down all the variants of the AT-AT -AT Walker. Truly embodying its name, we'll see how the Empire made this lumbering war machine truly an all-terrain vehicle. Using all legends and canon sources, we'll construct a full picture of this iconic Walker's variant spanning dozens of years in canon and more than a century in legends. If you haven't seen it already, I highly recommend you watch the dedicated AT-AT -AT breakdown. You can click on this in the top right corner of the video, and it's also linked down in the description. But assuming you already know the effective base design, let's start with Legends, covering the 8 existing variants in this timeline before switching over the canon, and exploring the 4 additional variants that come out in the Disney era of Star Wars. And starting off with Legends, our first few are a bit simpler, straightforward designs. With Big Palpy ruling a truly galactic empire, Imperial forces could expect to fight on a myriad of different battlegrounds against rebel insurrectionists and later New Republic forces. Specialized for deployment on desert worlds, Kuat Drive Yards developed the Dune Walker. The Dune Walker was a minor variant with identical passengers, crew, and dimensions of the base AT-AT, with the major changes being the replacement of potential tertiary weapon systems with additional Sinar Z-23 heat dissipation units. These are essentially air conditioning units, and though the base unit had these installed, they increased the number of them in the Dune Walker, and were specialized to better function in the scorching deserts of planets such as Tatooine. It's not hard to imagine the 40 Embark Troopers and their crew in their heavy combat gear sweating enough to pass out in this giant cooking metal box of a walker. So while that might be a minor inclusion, it obviously was crucial. Now what you might have picked up on is that the AT-AT -AT has no listed tertiary, no third weapon system, so it's unclear exactly what those heat dissipation units were replacing. On the other side of the spectrum, some of the walkers used by Blizzard Force were equipped with measures to better function in deep winter conditions. Nicknamed Snow Walkers, these winterized AT-ATs came with improved heat circulation systems to keep the crew and passengers warm, de-icing controls to ensure thick ice buildup did not interfere with the hydraulics, logomotion, visual, and weapon systems of the walker, as a lot of the really crucial tech, including the ground scanners, were located in the feet and could be under several meters of snow and ice. And so technically speaking, you've already seen these. It's just funny that the scenes that introduced this walker, we of course think of this as the standard AT-AT, -AT, and of course outwardly it all looks the same, but technically they're specialized systems making sure everything is kept nice and warm and functional. And let's use that to transition to some variants that don't have specific names, as many Imperial forces found ways to modify their walkers to fit the environment they were placed in. 
On planets without a breathable Type 1 atmosphere, ATATs could be outfitted with special gas filters, while additional heat recirculators could be added for worlds even colder than Hoth or when operating in the vacuum of space. For planets with toxic rain or other extreme environments, anti-corrosive sheens would be applied to keep the walker's hydraulics, visuals, and electronics functional. <laughs> so if you want to get even more technically specific here, almost every Imperial garrison modified their walkers in some way to make them best fit their local environment. Places with more hostile natives or animal and plant life were known to pack on dense durasteel holes and extra plating, and some tried to mitigate the effects of radiation or chemical weapons. Looking to the first official combat variant, we have the Heavy ATAT, -AT, featuring, well, heavier armor than its predecessor, but also stronger firepower, likely turbo laser grade as this was seen in some later Imperial walkers. And you might be thinking that the problem with this walker wasn't that it was weak, rebels weren't shooting through it, and its weaponry was more than adequate, and while that might make sense, it's definitely a very Imperial thing to do. Great for the war economy, promotional material, Empire Day celebrations, and to be a little fair, there were ever-increasing reports of rebels getting their hands on proton torpedoes and other explosives, and some had actually punctured the standard walker. So there is some practical aspect to this, even though it's probably mostly driven by the Tarkin Doctrine. The next variant is the All-Terrain Ion Cannon, which switched things up with a major redesign of the hull and weapon system. The majority of the troops bay was removed to make room for an open mount ion cannon attached to the rear of this walker. Sacrificing the troop capacity of the ATAT -AT turned this vehicle from an armored transport to a self-propelled gun, with that ion cannon being its main armament. While not being a factory floor design, the Empire actually sent back some stock ATATs to have Kuat undergo this remodeling. This walker did retain all of its primary head-mounted weaponry, meaning the reactor would have to share power between the regular base weapons and the ion cannon, so probably not able to power both at full efficiency. ATICs were not used as offensive assault vehicles, but rather as mobile defensive platform weapons for key Imperial installations. The ATIC was noted to be very uncommon, not surprisingly as base defense could already be provided by orbiting Imperial warships, dedicated, dug-in turbolasers and ion cannons, and even starfighter patrols and artillery. The cannon possessed a limited firing arc of around 115 degrees, and was clearly intended to engage aerial or space targets, being most effective against capital ships at range from Imperial stations like a supersized ion-firing J-1. Because remember, like we see with the transition from Venator to Imperial Star Destroyers, the Empire had an increased focus on ion weaponry, not wanting to completely destroy the enemy, but disable and capture ships, letting the ISB torture out any info they could get, and hopefully understand the chain of custody to find out how these vehicles fell into rebel hands. And you see the Tarkin Doctrine really drove this next variant, taking the rule of fear literally with this one, the Shadow ATAT. The shadows were specifically designed separately from the main line, being 15.5 meters in height, about 7 meters shorter than the standard ATAT, -AT, while still keeping the same proportions. And of course, that seems small when comparing it to the ultimate behemoth, but it still towered above other combat vehicles, though it likely decreased the power of its weaponry as well. So, why design the shadow differently? The simple answer is intimidation. They were coated in gleaming black armor, purposely meant to strike fear into the enemy. Though, funny enough, it had no specialization for stealth operations. There's no cloaking tech like we see in some ships or vehicles, but they were intended to be used during nighttime attacks or on gloomy, sunless worlds like Umbara. You might be thinking, really? It's just a glossy black paint job? But apparently many rebel soldiers said that this was one of the most frightening things they ever witnessed, as the shadows themselves started opening fire on them, and struck even deeper in the rebel psyche than the already intimidating AT-ATs. What's interesting is that despite the smaller size, it could still carry 40 troops, so it's just packed in a bit tighter but also losing the speeder bikes. One of the most dramatic modifications to the ATTE chassis originated from another local Imperial Garrison's modification, and was so successful that it was officially adopted for factory production. The Aquatic Terrain Armored Transport, more commonly known as the ATAT -AT Swimmer, was a major modification that adapted the walker for underwater operations. Obviously, it's not a walker anymore, as its four armored legs were replaced at the hip joint with repulsor engines, effectively turning this thing into a submarine. The fifth engine at the rear drove the craft forward, while the bottom four possessed limited rotation to adjust the craft's position and provide additional speed when needed. The rear troop compartment was separated into two bays, connected by an additional flexible armor tube, much like we see connecting to the head or the midsection of the ATT. This one also retained its full trooper load of 40 personnel, and were assigned to the Imperial Maritime Division, which was a part of the Imperial Navy, but actually for water. 600 kilograms of cargo could be carried on board, while having a crew of five, likely two pilots, a commander, and two crew chiefs to manage the infantry once they disembarked. 
The ATAT swimmers' pilots were specially trained for this task, drawn from the ranks of the Imperial Army. The head mounted armament remained the same caliber, with the weapons themselves modified for operation in underwater conditions. Along with the rest of the vehicle, everything from sensor tech to air intake had to be changed. The armor and its construction was designed to protect not only against enemy fire, but the deleterious effects of saltwater corrosion, as well as the crushing pressure of deep ocean operations. The head provided a wider field of fire than its already impressive land-based counterpart's arc of 180 degrees, and protected the aft of the vehicle with a twin blaster turret that would end up being mounted on some later models. In battle, the swimmer would deploy alongside sea troopers and TIE fighter boats for protection, engaging enemy targets and pressing through defenses to deploy their payload of infantry on crucial areas. This variant saw surprising success from its original modification by the Imperial Garrison of the World Cabera to its official production as a joint venture between Kuat Drive Yards and the Hydrospear Corporation, and would be used by Darth Krait's Galactic Empire as late as 137 ABY. By this time, the AT-AT swimmer had undergone upgrades of its own, being outfitted with a dual blaster turret on the aft quarter to keep enemy infantry at bay, as well as a launch bay for shark underwater fighters. The swimmer acting as a mothership in its own right, as well as a command vessel favored by Imperial commanders and Sith lords alike. The AT-AT lost none of its fearsome reputation as an aquatic vehicle. The swimmer may actually have the most fearsome reputation of any vehicle in Imperial history participating in the genocide of the Mon Cala, while being virtually impervious to enemy fire. The Final Legends variant also served Darth Krait's Galactic Empire, as well as the Empire in Exile that opposed it, this being the All-Terrain Heavy Armored Transport, or ATAHT. This was a major overhaul, with virtually every element of the walker changed in some fashion. The AHT presented a towering elephantine profile with a humpback troop compartment, covered in overlapping armor plates and weapon stations. A modified, insectoid command cabin featured two bug-eye vision ports on the diagonally sloped front part of the head, along with two twin-cheek-mounted laser cannons partially protected by armored shutters. Below the chin, a single and very heavy laser cannon was mounted, roughly the size of the ATTE's main gun. The humpback rear compartment rose to half the walker's height above the cabin, on which a dual heavy laser cannon sat one above each other on a vertical mount in a ball turret with limited rotation. Additionally, on each armored side of the ATAHT, a single heavy laser cannon, again in a ball turret, covered the entire port and starboard sections of the walker from attack from enemy vehicles. Thus, this heavily armored walker possessed a minimum of nine laser cannons, five of them being heavier than the standard ATAT's main armament. There were no light blasters or laser cannons to deter infantry, which points to the Empire continuing their adherence to combined arms operations, in which the ATAHTs would break the heaviest enemy resistance in vehicles. Infantry and speeders contemporary to this period would screen the walkers' flanks, making sure no saboteurs could make their way in or hijack this thing, allowing the AHT to focus on its main objective. Since it doesn't have repulsor tech, it can walk right through shields, and deliver the firepower of several tanks all at once, and still carrying those 60 troops, and still manage to pack in 8 speeder bikes, and perhaps most impressively, 3 entire ATRCT, the riot control transports, a sort of upgraded and more deadly ATRT or ATPT. In this way, even without an escort, this walker could deploy enough troops and vehicles to form its entire own defensive screen if needed. It isn't clear if those RCTs were disassembled, like how some of the original ATATs could carry two disassembled ATSTs, but given its much greater size, I wouldn't be shocked if they were fully operational RCTs, sitting inside ready to be deployed via a boom system straight into battle. It could also carry up to two metric tons of cargo, and enough consumables for all the vehicles to last up to one week. The additional internal space likely accommodated a larger reactor to power the lumbering machine with its much heavier weight, and the only element not noticeably changed were the legs. The relatively smaller size of the locomotion system in comparison to the rest of the vehicle would make you think it had an even more sluggish gait, but it's actually noted to have an increased top speed, now hitting 80 kilometers per hour, or 50 miles per hour. By the time of the Second Galactic Civil War, the AHT had been relegated mostly to operations on worlds where conditions prohibited the use of repulsor vehicles, as other assault craft filled Krait's Empire's needs for ground attacks. It is worth noting that regular ATATs continued to serve Krait's Empire in an updated form. In fact, since the Battle of Endor, some ATATs were upgraded with dual turbo lasers in place of the dual heavy laser cannons as primary armament. So it's safe to say that these late ATAT models carried at least dual turbo lasers. So despite all the flaws pointed out in Rebel propaganda, in that greatest of enemy, gravity, 
It was clearly an effective design that was able to prove its worth as late as 137 years after the Battle of Yavin. But now let's look at the cannon variants. The first variant we see is fairly minor, a straightforward upgrade to the walker, being the Elite ATAT. Combining the dark armor of the shadow with the heavier firepower and thicker armor of the heavy ATAT. Its laser cannons were upgraded, which must mean that they became turbo laser grade. And Imperial commanders took the threat of tow cable attacks like those seen on Hoth very seriously. So seriously that the Elite ATAT came with inbuilt saws right inside the legs that would sever cables to avoid tripping from such attacks. As you might guess, only the best of the best ATAT pilots would become those entrusted to pilot the Elite. And remember, all AT-AT pilots were already known to be drawn from a pool of the cream of the crop of Imperial assault drivers, seen as the most arrogant pilots in the entire military. So just imagine how insufferable these elite pilots would be. But curiously, this walker has a very notable weakness, being uniquely susceptible to heavy ion explosives. So perhaps that's a flaw of the certain alloy used in the upgraded armor, being better at diffusing kinetic attacks, diffusing the heat of most lasers, but amplifying the effects of ion weaponry. We can guess that it had a troop capacity of around 40, and would have cost a lot more than the standard 150,000 credits. Next up is a specialized engineering variant, the All-Terrain Armored Cargo Transport, not to be confused with the All-Terrain Construction Transport. Neither of these ATACTs was intended to partake in direct combat, but was specialized for construction and engineering. Standing considerably taller than the ATAT, at a height of almost 32 meters, and a top speed of 50 kilometers per hour, or 31 miles per hour, it was classified as an armored cargo walker. The most notable change was the swapping of the two-tiered troop bay for an open modular cargo hold. This cargo hold was capable of accepting either a dedicated imperial cargo container, or vast numbers of crates, odd containers, and raw materials within its 550 cubic meters of internal space. Even when completely filled, 10 passengers could be carried on board as well. Stevedore or dock droids could be employed, along with Imperial Quartermasters, who would load these transports with supplies, particularly the ultra-dense materials which the ACT could carry with ease that might overwhelm most repulsor trucks. An electromagnetic tensor field reinforced the legs, especially the knee joints, to enable the ATACT to carry greater loads with greater stability. The walker was staffed by a reduced crew of just a single pilot, typically drawn from any Imperial Armored Branch of Service. They were typically deployed on garrison, manufacturing, or mining worlds, where these capabilities could be used to great effect, whether it be shuttling components for Imperial Star Destroyers, or minerals to be turned into armor plating and war materiel. They were used by the Imperial Corps of Engineers whenever military construction was required, from Darth Vader's castle on Mustafar to the Scarif Complex. While not intended for frontline combat, the vehicle was more than capable of defending itself against light threats and providing fire support to Imperial forces, whether it be against hostile wildlife or rebel incursions. Its legs, especially the knees, were always a weakness and vulnerable to even E-Web grade fire, although the vehicle as a whole retained the tough, durable reputation of the AT-AT line. Shrugging off a direct hit from a rocket launcher on Scarif, the walker's chin-mounted MS-2 heavy laser cannons were shifted to the command cabin's cheeks and the medium laser cannons removed entirely, lightening the overall armament. As an engineering vehicle, the walker was not intended for combat, but could be that first response or last-ditch reserve to augment existing Imperial armored forces if they were facing a powerful threat. And these you could actually get a bit cheaper at 125,000 credits. Just as Darth Krait's Empire deployed variants far into Legends, the First Order utilized up-armored and sleeker AT-ATs. The FO AT-AT, manufactured by Kuat's successor company, Kuat and Trala, saw service in the Battle of Krait and beyond, providing First Order forces with a familiar ground assault vehicle. This vehicle was up-armored, created with the next-generation lightweight materials layered across the hull, offering better protection at no increased weight. But notably, its armament was reduced to just the cheek-mounted laser cannons, dropping the iconic heavy chin laser cannons, which might actually be the worst thing we saw at Crate. While less powerful overall, these weapons were improved, being more accurate due to better targeting systems, on top of benefiting from a faster fire rate. Despite its size and power, the role of the mainline assault vehicle was replaced by the ATM-6, which I'll talk about next, but one other minor alteration I wanted to mention, placing of the frontal toe flap with this solid block meant to crush through obstacles as well as an improved shin armor to further protect against catastrophic leg hits. 
A cockpit ramp below the command module in place of the heavy laser cannons offers easier accessibility, but also a potential weak point in the formidable armor plating. Though it would be going into battle screen by updated ATSTs, just like their predecessors decades before. And now we arrive at the all-terrain Mega Caliber 6. The M6 differs considerably in weaponry, complement, internal arrangement, and doctrinal role than all other AT-ATs, significantly departing from the traditional troop transport role into a dedicated siege platform. Towering over the competition with a height of more than 36 meters, about 1.5 times the standard, it brings incredible firepower to any battlefront. At 40 meters long, it's about twice the length of the standard while being an impressive 18 meters wide. The main armament of the vehicle is also its namesake, the Mega Caliber 6 Turbo Laser Cannon. Mounted in an elephantine hump along where the troop bays would usually be positioned, the barrel of the M6 protruded from an armor housing with its internal structure running deep into the walker. The cannon, being a starship-grade turbolaser, is capable of engaging shielded positions rated to deflect the attention of capital ships. Despite being mounted in a mobile ground vehicle, the cannon retains a moderate fire rate, outputting considerable destructive power. With accurate fire, the Mega Caliber 6 is more than able to destroy virtually any ground vehicle with a single on-target round. It can devastate even the densest defensive lines in most protected fortresses and fortified cities. A weapons room positioned on the gun deck serves this weapon, more reminiscent of a firing center on a capital ship, which is powered by a dedicated power plant directly above the weapons room. Heavy duty, heat exhaust, and shock absorbers help the M6 deal with the destructive blowback of such a powerful weapon. The ATM-6 is further armed with a pair of medium, anti-ship laser cannons on the cheeks of the heavily armored command cabin, these typically being the lightest armament capital ships would bring to bear on each other in ship-to-ship -ship duels, and more than capable of devastating any medium or heavy ground vehicle with a single salvo. This already obscene firepower is greatly strengthened by a pair of chin-mounted heavy laser cannons positioned between the angular jowls of the command module, which themselves are studded with horizontally racked targeting sensors. By its armament alone, the M6 does away with any pretense for any dedicated anti-infantry firepower, instead is solely dedicated to the destruction of highly fortified installations in enemy armored divisions. This extreme firepower combined with the power demands for such a gargantuan and mighty vehicle, and all this required an upgraded power system. Rather than relying on a bay of fuel cells, it utilizes a large fusion reactor embedded deep within the behemoth's lower rear section kept in continuous operation to generate sufficient power for the weapons and locomotion. The dual hemisphere reactor, measuring at least 8 meters in diameter, is kept in operation by a supply of reactant fuel, with an outer shell masking an internal reactor coil in the extremely harmful energies emitted by its operation. A chain of four turbolaser gas canisters run down the ATM-6's sloped back, providing the ammunition for the main weapon, but also a potential target for enemy forces able to get around the vehicle's rear quarter. The Mega Caliber 6 cannon and the reactor take up the majority of the internal space, with enough room left for an auxiliary compartment capable of being swapped out with a number of mission modules depending on the walker's deployment. For the Battle of Crate, this compartment was utilized as an auxiliary troop bay, carrying 12 passengers into battle. It's possible this compartment could also be used as a dedicated command and control center for ground forces, or as an engineering space, maybe even a communications node during operations. Now, of course, bringing 12 troops in the battle was hardly significant next to those carried on the smaller First Order ATAT, or what could be deployed through assault landers and armed shuttles. And it is incapable of deploying its troops through an assault drop through the belly, which is the ultimate sign of a departure from the troop transport role. Maybe all those guys on board are just meant to make sure it isn't captured. Its rear legs are mostly the same, but the front pair are considerably modified. It bears massive armored forelegs terminating in mech carpal foot structures similar to a simian. These redesigned frontal legs bear more of the ATM-6's considerable weight, but also are meant to brace the walker during the firing of the Mega Caliber 6 main cannon, ensuring it is a stable firing platform. The complicated system of heavy hydraulic pistons and overlapping gears that all drive the forelegs require their own ventilation gates, which were cleverly designed to work as cable cutters, severing any slim chance of these behemoths being taken down in the fashion of its predecessors. The entire vehicle is clad in hyper-advanced armor, developed in secret foundries in the unknown regions, even denser and tougher than those of the AT-ATs. But like the standard, the command cabin is equipped with a system of sensor screens, providing the pair of pilots with up-to-date targeting, tactical, and terrain data, all from the onboard sensors from the JAL rangefinders to the footpad terrain sensors. 
A vehicle commander stands behind and above the pilots, typically with his own command dais, in the typically domineering First Order fashion. In summary, the ATM-6 amps up the psychological terror and overwhelming firepower classic to the AT-AT line, providing First Order officers a nearly unstoppable siege engine to finally snuff out any sparks of the New Republic. My question to you is, of all those variants, which is your favorite, and if you had to choose between the ATM-6 and ATAHT, which of these supersized armored titans would you prefer to use on the battlefield? And could one of them defeat the other in a 1v1 match? Let me know in the comments down below. Now for a couple cool facts and behind the scenes stuff, the ATM-6 would be roughly equal in height to the massive redwood trees in California, the tallest trees on the planet, or a whopping one-fifth the height of the Space Needle in Toronto. Lengthwise, it's as long as two bowling lanes laid end-to-end, -end, or longer than 12 74Z speeder bikes. Now, like some of the wonkiest vehicles in Star Wars, the Shadow and ATIC were developed originally just as toys. The ATIC in particular being discontinued by Kenner after being kit-bashed together, but still happily making it into the Legends continuity as a very rare variant. I haven't seen if there's any mods for Empire at War, or similar strategy games that have the giant ATAHT or M6. But if you know of one, definitely comment down below. But most important of all, remember, I hope General Veers is getting royalty checks from all these variants, and the Force will be with you. Always. These things are proof that you can have great action scenes that are guided by the lore, not breaking it. What's up, Meta Nerds? In today's video, we're going to be talking about the All Terrain Armored Cargo Transport, or the ATACT. We will do a complete breakdown of its stats, see how it was used on multiple planets, and end with some behind the scenes facts. The ATACT was produced by Kuat Drive Yards, the company that produced almost all of the walkers for the Republic and Empire. Though technically not for sale, word on the hollow net is that these run the Empire about 125k apiece, just over twice the cost of a TIE Fighter. At a glance, the ATACT looks like it's just a simple variant of the ATAT, but it actually has some really big design differences. For starters, you got the size. The cargo transport had a height of 31.85 meters or 104 feet, making it about as tall as an AT-AT with an AT-ST standing on top. And at 34.9 meters or 115 feet long, it was 14 meters longer than the standard AT-AT, being more than an entire X-Wing longer, space that was all used for this large cargo bay. This area was able to carry up to 550 cubic meters of cargo, which could hold a total weight of 5,000 metric tons, about equal to the weight of 6,135 dubaks. If it showed up here on Earth, it would stand taller than a 10-story building, be about half the length of a 747, have the cargo space of 16 20-foot shipping containers, and haul more cargo than you could fit on the backs of 46,000 horses. They had these specifically designed cargo pods that were used for transport, which had this distinctive orange coloring, a modular system that allowed these pods to be picked up by other ships and vehicles. And we can even see that they were designed to be taken off with this conveying system. This additional height did provide for a longer stride, but came at the cost of structural stability. U-Wings at the Battle of Scarif were able to exploit this weakness and bring the whole thing crashing down with a single mounted Roba M45 heavy repeating ion cannon. Whereas on Hoth, we saw that the more powerful P-Tower laser cannons proved ineffective on a standard at, -AT. So how is this possible? Well, it is due to a very important difference in the design of this cargo walker. To provide extra power to move this enormous cargo, the ATACT has stronger engines. Which is simple enough, but to help with the fact that all of this new weight is set on top of longer legs, the load would be supported by an electromagnetic tensor field. A tensor field essentially nullifies the weight of gravity on objects, making them a whole lot easier to transport. Tensor fields aren't often mentioned in Star Wars lore as much as other types of technology, but you have seen them used before. Some examples of other ships with tensor fields are the C9979 landing craft, which would generate them in their wings, in order to prevent them from sagging under the extreme weight of all the AATs. In a tensor field failing was the culprit of the invisible hand breaking in half during the Battle of Coruscant, as the ship simply couldn't handle the gravitational pull without one. And with the ATACT, we see that the tensor field generators are in the knee, right where the gunner is aiming. With all those ion shots on target, the complete weight of the walker is now bearing down on this single leg. The full, non-nullified load proves too much, and so we don't see it exploding in a ball of flames, but buckling and snapping from supporting too much extra weight. A cool little detail that shows how action can be logically guided by well-written lore, not just dismissed in favor of action scenes, which is so often the case when it comes to things like shields, where we simply have to say that the plot willed it. Its large cargo hold was monitored by stevedore droids, which we unfortunately don't have a current visual of them, but they would help to divide the loads on the walker to make trips more manageable as some of these experimental materials are described as ultra-dense. 
And some other interesting things to point out is that the red glow is from an infrared force field generated in the cockpit. The air filters for the vehicle are located right behind the head on the main body. And these walkers use the same solid fuel slugs like we saw in the at, -AT. On board the ACT, you would have a crew of two, and space for up to 10 passengers, which is 20 less than the at, -AT. Because of its cargo role, overall it had much less armor, but the section just over the cargo container is reinforced. And despite not being intended for assault, it could still defend Imperial assets, coming with two Taemin-Bak MS-2 heavy laser cannons, which would be able to blow apart enemy infantry, and easily punch a hole in any attacking ground vehicles. The first time we see the AT-ACT in use is during the numerous construction attempts of Fortress Vader on Mustafar. The Sith Lord consulted an ancient Sith ghost known as Momin to help in the construction of a building that would focus dark side energy. The design of the fortress would start off being rather different from the final version that we would see, with each of its predecessors having a very unlucky history, each being destroyed in some unforeseen way. This would happen eight times, with the ninth building being the one we see in Rogue One. Due to the harsh nature of Mustafar, Vader would use ATACTs and OICTs to build each of the different versions. These would be very useful in safely transporting building materials across the hazardous hellscape. Not only would the lava be dangerous to typical vehicles, but on several occasions, the troops and vehicles stationed at the construction site would be attacked by the local Mustafarians, who weren't too thrilled with a Dark Lord of the Sith plotting his castle right on their home. On one occasion, three Force-sensitive Mustafarians would use their power in an attempt to flood the castle with lava, killing off almost all of the Imperial troops and destroying most of the vehicles. Vader would be able to survive the attack by using the wreckage of an AT-ACT that had been swept up by the lava. And so Vader has this vehicle to thank for him not losing any more limbs to the fires of Mustafar. The next time we would see this walker would be on the tropical paradise world of Scarif. Here, the ATACTs were used to transport heavy cargo and materials across the shallow waters surrounding the Citadel, a highly secretive research base as well as an archive for the Galactic Empire. In the Year Zero BBY, the Rebel Alliance would mount an attack on the Citadel and a gambit to gain access to the Death Star plans. The Rebels would infiltrate the compound using a stolen Zeta class, and a ground battle would ensue. The Rebels would then come under intense fire from at least four ATACTs. This would turn the tide in the Empire's favor, but the victory was cut short when several Rebel Starfighters would get past the shield ring. These Starfighters easily destroyed all the Walkers, paving a clear way for the Rebels to the Citadel. This battle showcased that when against something light like infantry, it was able to defend itself from small arms fire, and even take a rocket directly to the head, just shrugging it off. But due to its overall lack of armor, it is at a heavy disadvantage to purpose-made Starfighters. The X-Wings having more firepower than most Starfighters, and packed a way bigger punch than the T-47 airspeeders on Hoth. These could also be seen on the shipyards of Kuat Drive Yards, transporting materials for building the weapons and ships used by the Empire. Like its use on Scarif, these wouldn't see any action until the facility came under attack. Five years after the Battle of Yavin, the New Republic launched a bombing campaign against the Shipyard Ring, in an effort to cut off the Imperial Remnant's supply to arms and armor. KDY would be forced to use any available assets they had to fend off the New Republic starships. AT-ATs, ATSTs, ATACTs, and even the remaining ATTEs would be used in the defense of these shipyards. But they would not be able to keep the New Republic at bay, and Imperial forces eventually surrendered. And some of these also saw service on the Wookiee home planet of Kashyyyk, where they were used to transport building materials for new Imperial bases, and even transport some Wookiee slaves. After the fall of the Empire and 5 ABY at the Battle of Jakku, Imperial forces on the various worlds across the Empire would surrender and leave. One AT-ACT would be left behind on the Wookiee homeworld, where it would slowly deteriorate and be covered by the natural environment. By 7 ABY, this AT-ACT would be almost completely covered in vegetation, and Han Solo would come across this walker during one of his trips to Kashyyyk. So that's it for its history and breakdown, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind-the-scenes stuff. It first appeared in Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, and a tale of it being used on Mustafar comes from the Darth Vader comic series, issues 23 and 24. The stories of them on Kuat came from Star Wars Insider, and Han Solo finds one on Kashyyyk in the novel Last Shot. And it should be noted that the ATACT has some potential inconsistencies across various sources. For starters, it's said that it has longer legs to give it a faster stride over the normal ATAT, but its top speed is 50 km per hour, or 31 miles per hour whereas the AT-AT tops out at 60 km per hour, or 37 miles per hour. Perhaps its speed is much quicker than it would have been if it had all that cargo on those smaller legs, but it's still incredibly slow. As many fans have pointed out, something like the Juggernaut seems like it would have fit all of the Empire's goals while still being a lot quicker. And since its wheels are actually spinning metal discs, not rubber, it would have done fine on Mustafar too. 
probably better in the marshes of Kashyyyk and the sands of Scarif. Another possible inconsistency is that with the pilots of the ATACT. The Visual Dictionary for Rogue One states that any qualified driver of the Empire could pilot the ATACT, and that they had no specified pilot corps. But they get this completely different look and helmet, and so if not a separate corps, they definitely went by the title of ATACT pilot. And just before we end, a little shout out to the OICT mentioned earlier. Currently, there is almost no information regarding it, aside from its appearance in the Darth Vader comic and a small on-screen appearance in Solo. There's just no stats or history on it. Funny enough, not even what the acronym stands for. The C in CT probably stands for Crane or just Cargo. So that's it for the ATACT. But most important of all, remember, these walkers used to strike fear into the rebels until they took an ion cannon to the knee. And the Force will be with you. Always. What's up, nerds? In this video, we're going to look at a bunch of different crawlers, treaded vehicles, which are pretty rare in Star Wars, understanding why they're actually a great option, and what inspired some really unique creations. To understand how we get these great fan models, let's go back and look at the very first model of the iconic Sandcrawler. This model was made before the concept art and built by Colin Cantwell, the model maker for 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was released in 1968, nine years before A New Hope. Kit bashing is when you make your own creations from model kits, modifying parts and or bashing together parts from multiple kits. Cantwell also worked on almost everything seen in A New Hope, from the ISD, X-Wing, TIE Fighter, and more. And speaking specifically about the Y-Wing in kit bashing, he says, quote, Kit bashing is a method of model building that myself and a few others pioneered in the early 70s. Essentially, you take pieces from cannibalized model kits, cars, planes, trains, etc., as well as shapes from around the office and house. Look closely and you'll see pill bottle engines and Easter egg fuel tanks. The Falcon would be changed dramatically, a last minute scrapping after Space 1999 was released, and it looked too close like the ship, the Eagle. And the Sandcrawler model was then shaped by Ralph McQuarrie, who created most of the concept art, and then further turned into what we know and love by Joe Johnston. But it is in that process that we get these sketches of a similar Imperial Sandcrawling vehicle, an armored troop carrier with a mounted gun up top, which would go on to inspire the PX-4 mobile command base, an Old Republic-era Imperial crawler tank used by the Sith Empire. This massive version would need a crew of 10 and could transport 50 troops, with this long ramp out of the back allowing them to deploy. Tracks that could shrug off smaller anti-vehicle mines and small arms fire. Same goes for the thick armor plating on the rest of this thing, requiring a proper tank or missile firing fighter craft to take it out. Though there is that weak accordion section connecting the two main parts of the vehicle like we saw in the ATT, but they're banking on this turbo laser cannon being able to blow apart any threat it came across. It was also known as a siege tank since it was perfect against enemy strongholds. Being tracked, it can roll right through your shields, not being propelled by electromagnetic and gravitic fields generated by repulsor tech, and could deliver powerful durasteel melting or stone smashing bolts by having all its power directed into this single turbo laser cannon and then put its well-armored nose through that opening and pour out its 50 troopers to secure the position. Over 3,600 years later, Sidious's empire would deploy a similarly sized track troop transport. With an official length of 21.8 meters, the PX-4 mobile command base boasted robust armor and formidable weaponry. Encased in a half-meter thick metallic shell, it featured a centralized command pod further fortified for enhanced protection. Its outer hull was equipped with reflective shielding, while advanced sensors and computers meticulously monitored battle conditions, providing real-time data and AI-generated tactical suggestions to the commander stationed within. Information was relayed through computer displays, holographic tactical interfaces, and communications arrays, which intercepted both Imperial and enemy transmissions. A single Mark 1 ES heavy laser cannon was affixed atop the PX-4, mounted on a slowly rotating turret. Though possessing offensive capabilities, the vehicle primarily served in a non-combat role. Maneuvering across the battlefield on these large track treads, it achieved speeds of up to 100 km per hour, or 62 miles per hour. Though some units were reportedly capable of reaching 200 km per hour, the PX-4 boasted a cargo capacity of one metric ton and enough consumable supplies to sustain operations for a week, and manned by a crew of three, including a dedicated gunner, while accommodating up to seven passengers. The Empire utilized the PX-4 to ensure secure transport of commanders amidst dangerous combat environments. Functioning as a mobile headquarters, it enabled unit leaders to accompany troops while minimizing exposure to potential threats. Typically positioned away from direct battle zones, the PX-4 facilitated strategic decision-making in a secure environment. Deployment involved the utilization of landing craft, predominantly LAATC dropships, being only about 8 inches shorter than the ATT, or it could also be suspended beneath Sentinel class landing craft, or in the vehicle complement of IF 120 landing craft. 
In hostile worlds openly opposed to imperial rule, planetary prefects and governors relied on the PX4 for safe mobility, with some opting to reside permanently in its armored confines. In the complete life of Tarkin, we saw how he was almost killed moving in the lightly armored ITT. Moved a lot quicker, but it wouldn't have been such a close call if he was in a PX4. This command base did remove the weak joint in the middle, even though it was working in the opposite role, not smashing through heavily entrenched enemy positions. It was the opposite, a sort of anchor for the ground forces. But this led to two different fan-inspired vehicles that I think make a lot of sense, and would fill an actual role in military operations. This one is your standard troop transport, one large area which could probably fit a few squads of troopers and speeder bikes, or equipment like portable shield generators and e-web cannons. Really anything, down to just food rations like ramen and canned dubak. In an area where rebels were increasingly getting access to advanced tech like shield generators seen on Adalon, which prompted the Adat Walker advance. And I've been sitting on this factoid just not sure when to throw it in, but I'm glad I remembered this. In these scenes, you can see there are hovercraft that do get through the shielding. But this seems to be from a really smart tactic of having them stick close to the walkers, as the ATATs break the seal, as it were, on the shielding, like hiding under an umbrella or avoiding large waves by staying in the wake of a larger ship. The shielding effect is not present in that area, and so it doesn't interfere with the repulsor tech bouncing off each other like two sides of the same magnet. But back to the model, the design provides a more armored version of the OT, while still giving you the doors to open up and return fire if you want. Put some troops in there with rocket launchers and machine guns or mines, and you get some wild battlefield type action where the troopers can turn this armor into something way more dynamic. Able to deliver carnage and then just keep the ports closed when enemy fire gets too heavy. And same goes for using this thing in urban environments. It's funny to think that with some portable shields, you could effectively lock a hovercraft like the Empire's favorite troop transport, the ITT. Place them at an intersection, and it simply can't move forward, while protecting the attackers at the same time. But the track transport can easily climb over any rubble, physical barriers, or shields that the rebel population put up. And it could pop open these ports for crowd control, just keep an eye out for stray detonators and Molotovs. And if this was when the Senate was still around, just tell the review board you thought the blasters were set to stun. While the early concept art is right in between these two fan creations by having that big gun up top, though on this more nimble version, we see a pair of forward-fixed dual blaster cannons. It could be light turbo laser cannons, but more likely the level of cannons on a starfighter, far greater than the small arms and even the e-web, maybe not blasting through heavily armored positions, but through most civilian structures and vehicles. I never really liked these forward opening ramps, but of course real world vehicles do this, and many other Starcraft do as well, and we see them being used alongside AT-ATs, so the walkers would be taking out the major enemy weaponry, and delivering suppressing fire. Since you do have four deadly bolts firing forward from this thing itself, we can see how the forward opening ramp might be better overall. With tactics developed to open and deploy rapidly, like a smaller scale version of its old Sith Empire ancestors, bombarding the immediate front, injecting troops into the building opening or tree line, with troopers spreading out to engage fire on the flanks and get to cover. It looks spacious enough for speeders or smaller frog walkers as well, so that adds another practical element to these more rapid response crawlers. What is really unique is the shape of the track itself. If these were on hydraulics and able to move in response to obstacles, this might be one of the closest things to a truly all-terrain vehicle in the Imperial military, a lot closer than its big at, -AT brother, which could have trouble if the terrain was too steep or rounded. Though for an even quicker rapid response track tank, there is the Century Tank, essentially a tie on treads that can hit 90 km per hour, and packed a light turbolaser cannon and two medium blaster cannons. And what's funny is that it might still be propelled by a twin ion engine, and this was just the successor to the TIE AP-1. So there are light attack treaded vehicles in the larger command station, but I think these fan-made ones fill a nice gap in Imperial capabilities. But what do you think of all these? Do you wish we saw more non-hovering vehicles in Star Wars? Of course the wheeled versions like the Juggernaut work too, but there's something I just really like about these crawlers. If you have any other suggestions for odd or fan-made craft to look into, comment them down below. But most important of all, remember, Never take your hovercraft down a narrow street, and the Force will be with you, always. Let's take a tour of the galaxy's most famous mobile home. What's up, MetaNerds? This video is all about the Jawa Sandcrawler. We'll cover its history and do a complete breakdown, even a tour of this ship, and then close out with some behind-the-scenes facts and all that good stuff. Let's go back long before the Battle of Yavin, when the first of the Sandcrawlers set upon the Sand Dune Seas. It originally started off as a mining vehicle, with its enormous cargo holds carrying materials to the mining camps, and then over to the spaceports. Around 4000 BBY, there was a mining boom on Tatooine, and this outer rim no man's land was swarmed by sand crawlers made by Corellia Mining Corps and the Zerka Corporation. Each of these models was an enormous vehicle on treads, but the Zerka design didn't stick around. 
It's unclear why exactly the only variants we see are these Corellian models, but if the Zerka models were inferior, I think it's safe to say that the Jawas would have reduced them to parts. And though hated enemies, the Sand People actually ended up helping the Jawas come into possession of them, as they would often attack any sand crawlers that they came across. Came out of nowhere. Wait, damn it. Here they come again. How did they do that? No way would a pair in this thing while getting attacked over and over. The desert can have it. Ah, the Jawas will salvage it eventually anyway. Then we can buy it back and start over. <laughs> Makes sense to me. The Corellian version, aka the Digger Crawler, cost the company 150,000 credits, which is the cost of an X-Wing. There were a couple reasons why they went with treads over repulsors. First, it was the most cost-efficient, both in the production side as even though repulsor lifts are a ubiquitous tech found in all kinds of cheap consumer vehicles, it starts to get pricey with this much larger operation. The vehicle itself already had an incredible weight, but when filled with tons of rock and ore, it just pushes it over the top. And not that the treads never broke down, but they were much more reliable than repulsor tech. When traveling across the Dune Sea, you would often get caught in the raging winds of a sandstorm. These clouds of fine particulates would wreak havoc on repulsor tech, while also pushing around any hovering object. A simple track and some wheels was much less complicated, and when spread over these eight wide tracks, all that weight is nicely distributed and firmly pressing down, preventing you from getting blown over and keeping the ride stable, if admittedly slow. The top speed of the sand crawler was only 30 kilometers per hour, or 19 miles per hour, making it one of the slowest vehicles in the galaxy, about half that of the armored assault tank. The whole of this beast was designed to take the continuous pounding of those sandstorms, which also ended up making them blaster resistant. When the Jawas eventually moved into them, they turned it into a sort of castle. The hole would be the walls that surrounded and protected the city from danger, from both raiding sand people and even the mighty crate dragon. Being 40 meters or 131 feet long, it was about 4 Jawas longer than the MTT. At 20 meters or 66 feet tall, it was twice the height of that droid carrier. And at 13 meters or 43 feet wide, it was nearly two TIE fighters across. If it showed up here on Earth, it would be about three school buses long, four and a half wide, and six tall, around a volume of 72 school buses. So the timeless Tatooine rivalry between these two species was now between nomads and walled city dwellers. The voluminous interior spaces were intended to fill up to 50 tons of cargo, equivalent to 61 dubaks, but this area was now segmented into several workstations and sleeping quarters. Six Jawas would sleep in a space the size of a standard humanoid closet, and there are some reports saying that up to 300 Jawas and 1,500 droids could call this place home. This mobile fortress home would contain everything they needed, with food and drink being acquired through trade. It became custom for about half of the tribe to stay in the hidden, rocky dwellings of their ancestors, while the other half was out on sand crawlers, fishing all sorts of valuables out of the Dune Seas. The settlers had access to blasters and other off-world creations, and so trade was great for everybody. There are no reports of Jawas ever turning these creations on rival Jawa tribes. Instead, quite the opposite. They were said to meet in the desert once a year for a massive swap meet. Sandcrawlers from different tribes would all meet and trade with each other. And this is just speculation, but perhaps the so-called Dune Sea Haggle Day was a tradition created to ensure the strength of the Jawa coming together once a year to ensure that the needs of the Jawa tribes were met first, before they went out and traded with the growing number of offworlders. The village protecting vehicle was propelled by these gyrodyne nuclear fusion engines. Running almost the entire height of the vehicle, these massive vents would expel heat and steam from the reactor. Being fusion power plants, these reactors were the same ones dropped off all those millennia ago, still providing the incredible amount of power needed to keep this thing running. When they did come across something of value, they had a ton of different ways to collect it. If it was a small droid, the side-mounted repulsor tube could extend and pull the droid into the droid bay located on the first deck. These rooms would be strewn with all sorts of oddities, like RA-7 protocol droids, gonk droids, R5 astromechs, treadwells, and tons of other scrap that might be useful in repairing those droids. These could be offloaded when trading via these side hatches with retractable stairways, or just through this main front hatch door. To keep with our castle comparison, you could think of this as the drawbridge to this Jawa fortress. You can see other salvage cranes located inside these upper decks, which processed a wide variety of larger materials, be they hunks of raw ore or ship parts. You can see where the ore would be stored in these bins before being processed by grinders and then scanned by the pre-processing laser, which would identify any valuable metals or minerals. Energy from those reactors would be used to melt down the ore, and it would all flow into molds to make ingots. But the same process could be used to melt down a whole ship, vehicle, or even village. 
In the year 9 ABY, a Jawa tribe on Arvala 7 would strip down the Razor Crest used by a Mandalorian. This would amount to leaving the bounty hunter for dead, and the Jawa should have been able to tell that this was not some derelict craft long left to the elements. It took everything from paneling, valuable engine parts, even wiring, and computer systems that could all fetch some credits. Robbed and left to die in the desert, the Mandalorian opened fire on the Jawas. We can see how they would lay out their day's bounty for sorting, but when their tribesmen started turning into dust, they ran back into their protective fortress. We can see that even the powerful disruptor rifle shot does not disable the sandcrawler. Some steam got a new vent, but other than that it keeps going a great distance. Though again stuck at that max speed of around 20 miles per hour. When the Mando tries to scale the castle walls, we also see how these side panels could open up like windows, and how lookouts on top would coordinate with the commander. In this split level cockpit, the tribe leader and his top advisors would direct the navigators. A wide array of sensors could pick up metals from a great distance, with it all being relayed to the Jawa crew via these ancient sensors. There were 46 crew members on hand spread throughout the sandcrawler as it operated, while the others would be sorting and repairing the salvage tech, operating that forge, or just conducting maintenance. This tribe on Arvala 7 seems to have either had a really great salvaging streak, or their population has overgrown the confines of the hull, as we keep seeing them all spread out when parked, and with these tents on the roof of the sandcrawler. I think most likely they just have a lot of excess salvage to sort, but it could be that they outgrew it. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. It was unheard of for a Tuscan Raider to scale a sandcrawler, but this bounty hunter knows that if he wants his parts back, this is the way. As the Jawa mobilized, they threw scrap to dislodge him, but ultimately had to rely on their trusty ion blasters. Each of these are simple modifications of salvaged blaster parts, each with varying sizes, and even a triple barrel blaster version. These became popular weapons with the Jawa because they were excellent for capturing droids alive. And back on Tatooine, if they ever killed a human settler, even if it was deserved, that would be hard to convince the other humans. Much more likely was that the Jawa killing would be seen as an act of aggression, and these settlers might start to kill Jawa on sight, like how they treated the Tuscans who were often killing each other. We also see that even when confronted with stolen goods, the Jawa are not willing to give them back, but instead they use it to acquire a rare delicacy. But how exactly did the Jawa get from Tatooine to Arvala 7? Well, where this new world is in the galaxy is still a mystery, though its out-of-the-way description likely has it as another sandy Outer Rim world. It is not just another name for Tatooine, and this place only has one sun. The only explanation is that either these sand crawlers were on multiple desert worlds doing their mining thing, and were just abandoned here as well, with later Jawas that were hitching rides with other travelers moving here and rediscovering their favorite vehicle. Or as many have wondered, could the Jawa be a spacefaring people, either buying large ships or just building them in order to take their treasure hunting to the next level? There's a fan-made ship that was really interesting that we covered in a previous video. If you want to check that out, it's a really fun, plausible creation, and made even more plausible after these black-robed Jawa of Arvala 7. So that's it for its history and breakdown, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind-the-scenes stuff. The Sandcrawler has appeared in too many things to list, but the cross-section comes from the Star Wars Complete Cross-Sections book. With additional facts coming from the Encyclopedia of Starfighters and Other Vehicles, the Atlas, and the Essential Guide to Warfare. In a legend story, the way these Jawa who sold the droids to Uncle Owen were killed was with the support of an Imperial Flying Fortress. And those ancient sand crawlers are from the game Knights of the Old Republic. Lucas said the inspiration for the design came from NASA's space rocket carrier. And then for the film, they built a scale model of one that used a motor from a model Tiger tank. This motor was so powerful they said it could pop a wheelie and zip around the set. But what has to be the most ridiculous is how the sand crawler almost started a real life war. Filming was done near the Tunisian-Libyan border, and for those close-up shots, they built full-scale treads in the base of the sandcrawler. This massive vehicle on their border had Libya worried, and they informed Tunisia that they were aware of this craft and would mobilize their military if it was not moved. But most important of all, remember, no matter the time or the desert, if you take a man's horse or a starship, you might as well have committed murder. And the Force will be with you. Always. If you ever need a getaway vehicle, be sure to hijack an ITT. What's up, Meta Nerds? In today's video, we're going to be talking about the Imperial Troop Transport, or ITT, a vehicle that originates in Legends but has made a big comeback in Canon. The specs and even the design for this vehicle do differ between Legends and Canon, so let's start with the Legends. This vehicle was first known as the Reconnaissance Troop Transport, or RTT, and it was built by Santh Sinar Technologies, the parent company of all the different subsidiaries that made everything from the TIE Fighters, TIE Maulers, and other ground vehicles like the Century Tank. The RTT was 6.4 meters long, 
about two-thirds in AAT, or just over three and a half cents. It had a top speed of 150 km per hour, or 93 miles per hour, making it 100 km per hour slower than the average X-34 land speeder. Its crew was just a single pilot and a gunner, but in some cases a second gunner would be used. For transport, you could carry up to six troops on these outside racks, which also allowed them to fire independently while traveling. Although you do get the extra firepower, these troops would be open to the elements and incoming enemy fire. The rear of the RTT had what was called a prisoner immobilization unit, which could be used to detain both organics and droids. And for armament, the RTT had this turret with two light blaster cannons. Now the design of the cannon version does differ, where the front is now more squared off, and they add these two extra blaster cannons. And all the cannon versions have transparent steel in the viewports, whereas in Legends, sometimes these just appear to be openings. But what does stay the same is that that turret packs a big punch, and we see that it can be used effectively against land and air targets. In canon, the Imperial Troop Transport, or ITT, was built by Ubrickian Industries, the same people who gave us Jabba's sail barge and the Bantha II skiff. It also gets an official model number now, the K79S80, and its length is 8.77 meters, now two whole senates longer than the Legends version, and about a Jawa shorter than the AAT. It had a width of 4.5 meters, almost two Wookiees across, which is a little bit less than half the AAT, while its height of 3.5 meters was about twice that of the TX-225 occupier tank. The top speed remains the same, and we even learn its weight, 20,600 kilograms, or about 22 tons, roughly the weight of 25 dewbacks. But what's really incredible is this thing's shield generator and thick hull plating. It can take down multiple blows from an ATDP, TIE fighters, and even the Ghost, all blasts that could punch a hole through most vehicles. But we often see the ITT taking hits without even breaking stride. In fact, even in this scene where the Ghost finally causes it to wreck, the actual armor is never penetrated. It seems like either the steering or the repulsors are damaged can also plow through the legs of an ATDP, or even push aside another ITT, though again without compromising the armor of either. As for its history, in Legends, the earliest we see the RTT used was in Zero ABY, where Agent Marborez is unsuccessful in capturing some rebel rookies. Then we learn that after the escape pod was found on Tatooine by a Dubak squadron, the ITT squad was brought in to hunt down the droids containing the Death Star plans. They found the Jawas that sold these droids to the Lars farm, before opening fire on the Sandcrawler and ordering the Jawas to exit. As they did, the Stormtroopers slaughtered them, and then staged it to look like an attack by Tusken Raiders. The RTT would once again be used on Tatooine sometime after the events of A New Hope. Several of them would be present for the testing of the Omega Frost superweapon. During this encounter, the RTTs chase Han and Luke across the Junlin Waste, before they end up hitching a ride on something all too familiar to the RTT, a Jawa Sandcrawler. As they traveled along, Luke and Han would spot another sandcrawler directly in the blast of the Omega Frost weapon. This caused everything in the surrounding area, the sandcrawler included, to be flash frozen. If this weapon could work on the scorching hot deserts of Tatooine, then it could work anywhere. And remember that these massive vehicles are like mobile fortresses containing almost an entire Jawa clan. The two Tag Brothers would have a close-up view of the devastating effects of this weapon, but as soon as it was discovered that our heroes were close by, Ormond sprung into action and would board an RTT to give chase. The Sandcrawler containing Luke and Han made a direct course towards Moss Eisley. To lose the pursuing RTTs, Luke had an idea. While Han and the Jawas would drop containers of Skyhopper fuel, he would sit atop this massive vehicle and snipe the barrels, causing a massive chain reaction and wall of fire, and even exploding one of the barrels directly under an RTT. That was enough to break through the armor, and the Jawa were happy to get some revenge for those fallen sandcrawlers. During the Galactic Civil War, we'd see the RTT one more time during the Battle of Trask. These RTTs were actually a variant of the standard version, this kind removed the side racks and had all the troops inside, while also having this extra glass on the side for more visibility. And the last time we see its use in Legends was during the Imperial Civil War in 10 ABY. We'd see the transport being used on Coruscant during the hectic battles between Imperials still loyal to Palpatine and the other Coruscanti that no longer were. The RTTs here would be used to quickly transport supplies and troops across the dense cityscape of Coruscant. Now the earliest that we see the ITT in canon was a year after the Galactic Empire was formed, in 18 BBY during the Battle of Dak City on Mon Calamari. Here we see something very interesting, but makes absolute sense given the time period. The ITT was transported to the Mon Calamari capital by LAATVs. Another interesting thing is seeing the ATATs and ATDPs being used in this battle as well, which means they were already transitioning out of the Republic walkers just one year after the Clone Wars. 14 years before the Battle of Yavin, we see several ITTs used by an Imperial outpost on the planet Kashyyyk, 
A handful of these came under attack by Saul Guerrero's partisans, the Kashyyyk Resistance, and an AT-AT commandeered by Cal Kestis. A few of them stationed at this base would be destroyed by this hijacked AT-AT. In 11 BBY, ITTs were deployed on the planet Gorse to hunt down the wanted fugitives Harris and Dula and Kanan Jarrus. They were wanted for an assassination attempt on Count Vidian, and they were actually spotted by an Imperial transport, but Hera was able to set off an explosive, allowing them to escape. The most we would see the ITT would be between the years 5 BBY and 1 BBY on the planet Lothal. Given the ITT wasn't used for direct combat, the ITT would take on a number of roles instead, ranging from standard troop transport duty, prisoner transport, and even carrying cargo and food, such as Nelu runs. And when the Imperials wanted to show off their might, you could also find them in parades. We saw them being used to carry prisoners after an attack on the Samar family farm, which after the war was over was actually used by the family to transport their workers. But the Spectres would hijack many of them over the years. One such occasion was during the Empire Day celebration in 4BBY, where both ITTs and ATDPs participated in the parade. The celebration was cut short, as the Spectres sabotaged the newly displayed TIE Advance model, which was the centerpiece of the celebration. Now on the run, they would commandeer an ITT to make a quick getaway. And that's where we really see how resilient this vehicle is, plowing through other vehicles with ease and really taking on a lot of damage. In the year 1 BBY, the ITTs on Lothal would be joined by the TX-225, yet another repulsor craft, but even more heavily armed and armored. During this battle, Harris and Dula would commandeer an ITT after being shot down, and use this vehicle to rescue other downed rebel pilots. This transport would continue to be used by the Imperial-controlled worlds until the end of the Galactic Civil War, and so the last time that the Imps used them was during the Battle of Jakku in 5 ABY. But even though the Empire was finally defeated, Remnant forces would go into hiding across the galaxy, and continue to operate with these Imperial vehicles. The ITT was no exception, and we see one under the service of Moss Gideon's forces on the planet Navarro. Here the ITT would be used to transport a squad of stormtroopers to Gideon's target, the Mysterious Child. This ITT has some minor details changed from the ones we saw earlier, and actually more closely resembles the Legends version, with that more rounded front, and the sunken, forward-facing guns instead of those ball mounts. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind-the-scenes stuff. The ITT was the very first toy made by Kenner, of something that wasn't featured in the movies. This isn't the only Kenner toy to make a comeback in Star Wars, as the INT-4, MLC-3, and MTV-7 have all made comebacks not only in Legends, but are now a part of canon. The toy of the ITT came with this little informational booklet that gave some behind-the-scenes info on the ITT and some information regarding the Sandcrawler. The variant on Trask was first seen in the comic Boba Fett Overkill, and before making its debut in Star Wars Rebels and canon, its first appearance was in the junior novel Ezra's Gamble, set shortly before the events of the Rebel series. What's really cool is that this toy actually had a prototype that differed from how it looked in the final version. The entire front of the ITT was more ramp-like, ending in two pointed edges. The top-mounted round blaster turret is missing, instead replaced by a turbine engine, and it's said that the ride vehicle at Star Tours was based on this early design. But most important of all, remember, ships and vehicles always outlast their faction, and the Force will be with you, always. Sometimes stormtroopers and walkers aren't enough. Sometimes you have to send in a vehicle so powerful, immobilizing it doesn't make it any less deadly. What's up, meta nerds? In today's video, we'll be talking about the Imperial Patrol Speeder from Legends, a very cool vehicle that only appeared once in a Star Wars newspaper comic. The Imperial Patrol Speeder was a vehicle seen on the planet Aridus in the year 0 ABY. Luke and an imposter Ben Kenobi fought against this repulsor tank on their journey to destroy an Imperial fortress located on this planet, and save a local species known as the Chubits. Unfortunately, there are no sources that give the exact measurements of this vehicle, so we'll have to dive into a little bit of speculation regarding its stats. We don't know the manufacturer, but this repulsor tank shares many design characteristics with products of Rathana Heavy Engineering, like the TX-130, 2M, and TX-225. And in comparison with the 2M and TX-130 in particular, the patrol speeder shares these main two viewports on each side of the vehicle. Now for its size, we'll use this photo of Luke looking down at it, and we can get a little bit of scale on this vehicle. And we can also do some deduction with the fact that each of these pods contains a single gun mount with two vision ports which most likely means that one or two guys crewed each of these guns. To get some rough measurements, we'll compare it to the aforementioned pick with Luke. And by using this 3D model, we can get a much more accurate sense of the height. By using this human model as a reference, the patrol speeder is almost exactly three persons tall. Luke has a height of 5 foot 9 inches, so that times 3 is about 17 feet 3 inches. So we'll go with a little more than 17 feet. To compare its height with another ground vehicle, the AT-AT, which was 74 feet, 
so it's about a quarter of that height, or about a Jawa taller than an A80. For width, the patrol speeder is 6 persons wide with about an extra foot, or about 34.5 feet, about a Wookiee less than an A80. For its length, the patrol speeder is about the same, about a foot less than 6 Lukes, or 33.5 feet, almost equal to the A80. All these attributes together give us a vehicle that might be 4 times smaller than the AT-AT, but may pack even more firepower. This repulsor tank was heavily armed on each side, having two forward-facing blaster cannons, two side-mounted blaster cannons, and then an additional four side-mounted blaster cannons mounted on a turret. These smaller laser cannons were all mounted in spherical barbettes that provided better aiming and a larger firing cone for the guns. The main turret was armed with one large gun, and although we don't know the power output, it is shown in the comic as firing a beam-like weapon. So perhaps instead of a normal blaster cannon, the main gun was instead a laser cannon or even a turbo laser. Something similar to what we see in the CIS's AAT. What's interesting to know is that compared to other Imperial vehicles, the patrol speeder's main gun is very long, extending outwards from the body a considerable amount. Which makes me wonder if this thing was designed for some long-range accuracy. The bottom of this repulsor tank has several circular objects, which although we don't really get a good visual of, this is most likely the repulsor system that gets it off the ground. And there appear to be these two hatches on top of the vehicle for entering and exiting. In comparison to other vehicles of the Empire, its use as a patrol vehicle with so much firepower and perhaps an incredible accuracy and range with that main gun, it could be both more deadly than the AT-AT while also being a lot harder to take down. As for its history, the Imperial Patrol Speeder would be used by the Galactic Empire as early as 0 ABY, only a few months after the destruction of the first Death Star. They would mostly play a defensive role and be spread across the galaxy protecting various bases crucial to the Empire. One such example would be on the planet Aridus, where many of this type were used to patrol the perimeter of the Imperial Fortress known as the Iron Tower. The Iron Tower was a massive base used by the Imperials on Aridus to control the local population called the Chubits. This structure would act as a long-range transmission tower and had to be built large enough to overcome the dense ionized atmosphere. One of the side effects of this incredibly powerful transmitter signal was that its frequencies actually damaged the nervous system of the Chubit people. This outcome had a good side effect for the Imperials, as it prevented the Chubits from attempting any sort of rebellion. The tower would also serve as a base for Darth Vader, where he would create a very interesting plan to lure Luke to the planet. Using an actor that resembled Obi-Wan, Vader sent this actor to inspire the Chubits to attempt a rebellion. On one occasion, the actor would rescue a rebel agent, who returned to Yavin 4 to tell news that Ben Kenobi had returned. Upon hearing this, Luke immediately departed to Aridus to meet his master who mysteriously disappeared. Upon arriving, Luke would encounter the imposter, but actually believe that it was the real Obi-Wan, and this actor was even able to make it look like he had force powers, all thanks to some clever tech. The actor was instructed to lure Luke to the Iron Tower, where together with Vader, they would kill the young Jedi, but on their way they would encounter an Imperial patrol speeder blocking their path. The vehicle would force them to the high ground to avoid the multitude of weapons this machine used. They were almost killed by the main gun, and as it approached it continued firing on the two, and as it was distracted with the Jedi, a handful of Chubits had set up on a cliffside directly behind the large repulsor tank. Despite its powerful weapon, the patrol speeder unfortunately had an Achilles heel. A direct hit to the main thruster would render the craft immobile, but despite losing its repulsors, the speeder was all but defenseless. Thanks to the large amount of smaller guns placed around the body, the speeder was still able to fire these weapons even while incapacitated. An impressive feat, and something some Star Destroyers could learn from. The Chubits continued to fight the down speeder as the imposter Obi-Wan headed towards the Iron Tower. Luke asked Ben to help him take out the speeder once and for all, and save several of the Chubit Resistance fighters. Although he had a strict mission to complete, the actor indulged Luke's request, and the two went to destroy the vehicle. The fakey one Kenobi used his lightsaber to slash the speeder's power cells, causing a massive explosion which completely destroyed the tank, and almost killed both Luke and this actor. The two would eventually make it to the Iron Tower, but seeing Luke's kind actions would convince him to sacrifice himself in order to disable the Iron Tower and attempt to kill Vader. The tower was heavily damaged, but Vader would survive, only being trapped momentarily. And unfortunately, this would be the only time we see the Imperial Patrol Speeder in action, but we can assume this heavy repulsor tank could be used across the galaxy whenever there was a large fortress in need of patrolling. So that's it for its history, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind the scenes stuff first appeared in the Star Wars newspaper comic, The Return of Ben Kenobi, and would end up being its only appearance. And there are actually two vehicles with the name of Imperial Patrol Speeder. The planet the IPS was used on, Aridus, was planned to make an appearance in the campaign of the game Empire at War, where a ground invasion by rebels was made to free the local population. 
it is directly stated that Shubits would be supplied with T2B and T4B tanks, which now that we see what they were up against, makes complete sense. I know I'd like to see a tank fight between these three. Well, what's funny is that the manufacturer of these rebel ground vehicles, U-Train Tracata, was actually based on Aridus. They were also responsible for the T3B series and the MZ-8 pulse cannon. Other than this, Aridus appears numerous times throughout Legends, even being a holdout for the Yuuzhan Vong after their invasion. But the planet has even made its way back into canon, where it is mentioned in the Star Wars Force Awakens beginner game. So that's it for this incredibly obscure heavy repulsor tank. But most important of all, remember, sometimes Vader hits the spice when he comes up with these schemes to capture Luke. And the Force will be with you. Always. Nothing worse than watching your loved one get ripped through the wall and squished like a grape in your town square. What's up, Mena Nerds? This video is all about the UATT Walker, aka the Urban Assault Triped Transport. It has some really cool new features, and the First Order used these in a truly terrifying way. And unlike the ATST, this one may have actually been a transport. This new walker was manufactured by Kuat and Trala, the same people that made the M6 and Capital ships for the First Order, which was a merger of the centuries-old company Kuat Drive Yards that made all the Republic and Imperial walkers. Its cost is unknown, but with a height of 6.52 meters or 21 feet, it was about two-thirds the height of an ATST, and nearly twice the height of the ATRT. As for its top speed, it was tied with the ATST at 90 km per hour, or 56 miles per hour, making it about 1.5 times the ATT. Due to automation advancements, the crew is now down to just one, removing the co-pilot slash gunner that we see in the predecessor, all while increasing the amounts of blaster cannons. There was this chin-mounted double laser cannon, with targeting sensor array right underneath, and this weapons cluster on the side of the cockpit containing a heavy blaster cannon and two light repeater cannons. On the other side of the cockpit was the spotlight, but of course the main event here is the CAP-5 activator arm. It can tuck up underneath the walker when not being used, but whenever the path was blocked by debris or dissidents, the UATT could handle it. The First Order went towards more specialization with their walkers, increasing the size of the ATAT -AT with the ATM-6, but making the UATT smaller than the ATST. When the First Order wanted to take control of a city without leveling it, they couldn't send in the huge Gorilla Walker. But in dense urban areas, this triped walker would be able to stomp around without leveling the whole block. If civilians try to set up a blockade, the arm could easily pull it apart while still laying down fire, which was strong enough to be deadly to personnel, especially with that heavy laser cannon that could punch through any armor and overwhelm a personal energy shield, without having the missiles or grenades of the ATST that might just blow down the whole building. You also see that it's an armored passenger cabin with this entry hatch for FO stormtroopers to deploy from. It seems like you could probably fit around six troopers in this area. And this is a bit of speculation, but I think a lot of these design features point to an interesting way that these troops would enter and exit. See how it has these digitigrade legs that bend backwards, and we know that this top part can rotate 360 degrees. Seeing how this armored hood of the passenger section slopes down, when this walker were to sit down as low as it can, and then rotate the top completely around, the hood would come down to meet the claw arm. Perhaps the troops could climb up the hand and arm, over the hood, and into the hatch, while the walker could still be facing the enemy laying down covering fire. Objectively, maybe not a brilliant way to do it, but surprisingly more reasonable than a lot of other vehicles in this galaxy. This armored hood also acts as a great way to protect the vulnerable power cells from any top-down attacks that you might expect in a dense urban environment, or from an incoming fighter or gunship. When occupying a hostile city, the trooper squadron would often escort on foot alongside this walker. The armored top would protect the walker, while these extra pieces of riot armor on the limbs would protect the troops. Escorted by these troops on the ground meant that you had protection from the rear and the sides, and could provide quick eliminations to any resistance that might run up with an explosive as running out of an alley and lobbing a sticky detonator onto the underside is the biggest threat to this walker. But it also has a psychological trick up its sleeve. Few things would be as terrifying as having this arm smash through your residence and rip you into the grip of the First Order. But to terrify all of your neighbors into submission, they would bring dissidents out into public places, parade them through the streets held high up in this claw, and either read off your crimes before hauling you away, or, more often, they would simply execute you on the spot, crushing you in the UATT's grip juicing you into the public square as an example for your entire community. That's actually the dark extra part to that street-level escort. The FO Stormtrooper Blaster, the F-11D, has a stun mode like most rifles, and so they could easily paralyze a whole crowd if they were deemed to be inciting a riot, at which point the UATT got to play the galaxy's darkest version of the claw game. All of these tactics were used to subjugate the previously lawless Kajimi City. So that's it for the UATT, but you definitely want to hear these cool facts and behind-the-scenes stuff. 
The FO was inspired to make this vehicle from the design of the ATAP, but instead of a long-range cannon, they wanted something that could work more like a SWAT van. Comparisons to those other walkers come from the encyclopedia of starfighters and other vehicles, while the UATT details come from the Rise of Skywalker Visual Dictionary. So that's it for the Urban Assault Tripod Transport. But most important of all, remember, you can support the Resistance, but try not to get you and your neighbors juiced. And the Force will be with you. Always.